Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to, uh, <clears throat> to the second day of the first international conference on the reality of the linguistic policy in the world between perspectives and challenges, reinvestigating the reality of English language. <clears throat> Uh, this is Dr. Siddiqui Yusra. I will be sharing uh, the first session of the second day of this conference, which is entitled the Language Education Policy. Yes, we have on this panel uh, our dear participants, uh, Mr. Nudwimana Arkad, uh, Nujla Lilia Jabala, and Abdul Basadou. Uh, Fatma Athmania, Dr. Farida Lubal, and Zohair Abdeslam, Dr. Faisal Saudi, and Dr. Harun Milgani. Uh, I would like, uh, please, the participants to join us virtually so that we can follow the presentation, please. <clears throat> So 
So we start with uh, Mr. Nedwimana Arkad to present his paper entitled, uh, sorry, from ENS de Burundi. Uh, his paper is entitled English in Multilingual Burundi, a reflection on what linguistic policy says and what the reality shows. We start, please. Good morning, everybody. My name is Arkad Nduimana. I'm from Burundi and uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Burundi and an assistant lecturer at Ecole Normale Supérieure. I'm very pleased uh, to present in the first international conference on the reality of the linguistic policy in the world. Uh, my presentation is entitled English in a multilingual Burundi, a reflection on what the linguistic policy says and what the reality shows. Uh, let me start with the general background about Burundi for those who don't know about it. Yes, uh, it is uh, a small and locked country located in East African region and it has a surface area uh, of 27,834 uh, square kilometers. Uh, its population is around 12 million. It uses four main languages, uh, namely Kirundi, French, Kiswahili and English and Burundi is a member country of the International Organization of French-speaking countries known as La Francophonie. Now what about yes the historical overview of languages in Burundi? Uh, Kirundi is an indigenous language of the country and it is spoken and understood all over the country. Uh, French uh, is the second most spoken language and is a colonial legacy. It was introduced in Burundi uh, since 1916 under the Belgium colonization. Uh, Kiswahili, the third language, has a long tradition in Burundi. It had been prevailing along the coasts of Lake Tanganyika uh, since the second half of the 19th century. Uh, the English language was introduced in Burundi around the 1930s by Protestant missionaries. Uh, let me go to the status of languages in Burundi uh, before 2014. I will explain why I mentioned 2014. Uh, until 2014, Burundi did not have any explicit language policy. The four languages that I mentioned above coexisted for decades without any explicit redefined language policy to regulate their uses. Yet, uh, the status of Kirundi as, as a national language and uh, an official language was already recognized in the constitution. But the status of other languages was not clearly defined in any other official document. Now, what happened in 2014, uh, in 2014, yes, the government of Burundi adopted a law on the status of languages. And according to the law, uh, the national language is Kirundi, 
the official languages are Kirundi, French and English, and the Kiswahili became the language of regional communication. Uh, let us have a look at the situation of English in the independent Burundi. Uh, English was adopted for strategic purposes of diplomacy and uh, international affairs after Burundi gained its independence. It was in 1962. And English was taught in secondary school since 1970 and it was introduced in primary school in 2007. Today, uh, English is taught in at all higher education institutions, even in non-linguistic departments and some universities are now using English as a medium of instruction. Despite all of these efforts, English is still spoken by less than 5% of the population. Now, uh, you can see that more than 50 years of presence of the English language, but it is still spoken by less than 5%. And this is an ironic situation for the English language in Burundi. Uh, outside education settings, it is rarely used, even by people who know it. But why English is still spoken by a handful of Burundians? This is a key question of my presentation. Now, Three reasons probably explain this ironic situation. The first reason is related to the French domination in the official life of the country. Even before the 2014 law, linguistic law, French has been a de facto official language. It had been and still is the main language used in uh, public administration, in education, in legislation, in law, in army. And it is argued that more than 80% of Burundi heritage is written in French. And the second reason why English is rarely used in Burundi can be attributed to the presence of a national language spoken by all Burundians. And this linguistic specificity of having one local language shared by all the population is rare in Africa and probably in the world. The result is that people from different provinces or wilayas as it is said in Algeria, do not have to resort to any other languages to understand each other. Um, the third reason is the status of Kiswahili as a regional lingua franca. Uh, Kiswahili is the third most spoken language in Burundi. Uh, this African language has attain the status of a lingua franca of the East African region and as of 2010 uh, it was spoken by 80 million in East Africa region. So uh, Burundians speaking Kiswahili manage communication in East Africa in East African region without having to resort to yes English. Uh, conclusion, English has more than 50 years of presence in Burundi. In 2014, it was declared as the third official language of the country. But the reality is that the language is still remote to, to the rights of many Burundians. And this limited use of 
English is attributed to number one the dominant position of the French language in the official life of the country number two the presence of a national language spoken by all Burundians and number three the status of a lingua franca the Kiswahili language has in East Africa finally by using Kirundi French and Kiswahili Burundians can manage local and regional communication without having to resort to any other language. Thank you very much for attention. This is Akkad and Wimana from Burundi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Arkad Nodwimana. Uh, it was uh, a very interesting uh, topic or subject uh, because uh, here in Algeria, I think we have the same uh, multilingualism. Uh, I mean, using uh, more than uh, one language, French, English, and uh, Swahili or uh, other dialects. So later on, inshallah, we will uh, have a debate concerning this uh, subject. Uh, immediately, we listen to our uh, second participant, uh, Mrs. Nijla or Ms. Nijla Lilia Jabulla from the University of Limerick, Ireland and Abdul Basad Do from Stoganem University under the title of English as a medium of instruction in the Algerian University, a policy or a mere vision. We start, please. <clears throat> to a researcher at Mustaganim University, Algeria, and uh, Najla Lilia Jabala, a researcher at Limerick University, Ireland. We are pleased to contribute through this presentation entitled English as a medium of instruction in the Algerian University, a policy or a mere vision. This is how the intervention will proceed. Uh, we start by introducing the topic and giving a background and uh, some historical facts. Then we will move to the background on the English as a medium of instruction and the attitudes towards the enhancement of using English in the Algerian University that we um, presumably are calling the AMI. And uh, we will finish by giving some major challenges and some um, relevant recommendations and we will conclude this uh, <clears throat> intervention. Without much details about a background uh, or details about the Arabization policy, uh, now the shift is in enhancing the educational system in congruence with the internalization requirements. So uh, through this shift, we have a new vision, so a new uh, plan and a new policy perhaps. Uh, although recent studies focus on the pedagogy of English as a lingua franca, the dominance of EMI or English as a medium of instruction has attracted uh, the attention of researchers and increased the interests of policymakers in Englishization. So this can be related to uh, uh, recent shift plans in, in, in the language of instruction so considering this conspicuous gap, uh, this presentation descriptively uh, attempts to reveal the intricacies of the contemporary educational system and linguistic policy in Algeria. Uh, besides, it highlights the, the, the EMI implementation along uh, the most relevant recommendations pertaining to a variety of sociolinguistic and educational uh, factors in the Algerian context. Now, as a historical background, uh, to understand how an English medium policy program works or might uh, work in the Algerian context, it is imperative to reflect upon the historical events influencing um, a language policy uh, and language use in the Algerian uh, context. So historically, the, the, the post-colonial era is mainly divided into three main stages. 
So starting from the period of, of the, uh, the, the, the independence or the uh, 1960s when Arabic became the official um, language of instruction and the process or policy was totally completed in uh, 1992 during the uh, ruling of Shadli Bujdi. Uh, more recent policies came to light in the 21st century and during Bouteflika's um, presidency where French was clearly a de facto language uh, policy uh, or language or medium of instruction uh, and French was the first foreign language starting at second year of primary school in uh, 2004 for the Amazigh was officially recognized as a national language in 2001 and recently as a second official language uh, so only Arabic language remained the, the, the sole uh, language in primary and secondary education uh, while the use of French is still permitted and uh, maintained. So, uh, this uh, leads us to a uh, background on the EMI or English as a medium of instruction. Um, in fact, English is not newly suggested in the Algerian context or educational uh, setting. It was uh, controversially introduced as the first foreign language in Algerian primary schools um, in the 90s um, and introduced as a second foreign language in middle schools uh, also in the 80s. So uh, attempts to um, improve the status of English in Algeria and make, uh, make English language as a medium of instruction uh, for teaching and learning purposes have not stopped since that time. So till reaching one of the major attempts in 2017, uh, 2018, uh, when Tayyip the, the former uh, Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research, uh, sought to improve the status of English, um, in which he was like the first to make uh, such an attempt and uh, give hope to many Algerians, especially researchers, uh, as seen in the timeline, he initiated and displayed an online uh, poll uh, on uh, the 5th of July, I guess, and starting from the 5th of July till uh, the 5th of um, August uh, 2019, uh, where more than 90% of Algerians agreed with proceeding to enhance the status of English in Algerian universities, uh, order to all Algerian universities to use both English and Arabic in the headings of official papers by uh, that period. So from the 1st to the 18th of August, uh, as a result of the National Forum, uh, universities were asked to send six experts in linguistics and English language to propose a blueprint for action and later on um, in October he posted an online survey asking for uh, further uh, suggestions. Um, then on the 17th of uh, December 2019 uh, publication of the final report which included plans to start enhancing English in Algerian universities through different short, medium and long term uh, measures. So uh, at the international level, there was already uh, Algerian agreements with British and recently the Irish universities um, in 2014 and recently in 2020 or 2019 to train the Algerian uh, students or to ensure that these PhD researchers will um, help them to ensure the shift from French to English um, as, as a vision for the future or as the official language for teaching and learning uh, tertiary levels. Of course, such, uh, such an announcement and such a poll um, had their um, attitudes or had their reactions from the, the public or from uh, the research community and from media. So starting from newspapers, like for instance, the Sherlock newspaper defended the minister's decision um, and the minister's attempts resulted in many other reactions or different reactions. Uh, the positive attitudes, as we mentioned, mostly reflected students and teachers 
attitudes at different universities. Uh, while those uh, the 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 cons or the those who are against were mostly French language media and French language newspapers like uh, L'Expression and uh, Al Watan. Uh, of course, we know that the 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 increased demand and the importance of academic research or research visibility and the rate of academic publications, uh, the value or the promotion of internalization in universities, the exchange programs, all these are, let's say, promoted through uh, such a step of enhancing the use of English at the university. But of course, in, in, um, in a context like the Algerian one, uh, it's normal and it's natural to have such uh, attitudes at the social and the socio-political level or the socio-cultural level as well. So in some uh, recent studies like Medfuri and uh, Bilmihu, they reported these um, all these kinds of attitudes towards the enhancement of uh, using English at the uh, educational uh, sectors. Uh, ministerial initiatives, of course, were criticized for uh, their ideological divisions among different language speakers uh, in Algeria. Despite uh, the previous attempts, positive attitudes, the implementation of EMI or the enhancement of using English in the university in reality may collide with a variety of issues. So uh, the issue or the whole system in Algeria, as we know, is French dominated. So the historical factor of colonialism is resulting um, in the linguistic imperialism. So noticed from the French news or French media uh, that even in our announcement displays, diplomas, administrative papers, we still notice in French. So um, another issue is the lack of technical financial funding um, and researchers or studying abroad or journals publishing in English are not really encouraged to do that. So um, some challenges are related to teachers, some others related to the students or research studies. Um, so the lack of qualified teachers also is a challenge. Um, professors' linguistic skills uh, may result in the lack of quality or quantity of content. Uh, another challenging factor is the lack of students' understanding and their interests and their uh, cultural opposition to to uh, to such an initiative. Um, According to these challenges, we have some of the relevant recommendations. So at, at the micro level, let's say, the process is or should be implemented gradually, and that's um, logical. So in order to shift from French to English, for instance, there should be an initiative or plans, let's say, publishing announcements in English. Uh, uh, the ministry should encourage also all uh, researchers and students in scientific branches and in social sciences to publish in their researches in English, uh, providing financial support to train researchers through uh, workshops to enhance their digital literacies also, and to be um, acquainted with uh, international databases uh, in English, ensuring uh, cooperation between uh, journals, universities, uh, providing postdoctoral trainings in English-speaking countries, uh, encouraging foreign researchers also, and most importantly, opening doors to private universities like the American universities in Algeria, as it is the case in some of the other Arab uh, countries. So we just conclude with these two uh, questions. So the, the widespread application of the English language that will not take place in Algeria tomorrow. Of course, the debate is far from over and the ideological cleavages are deep. But it goes without saying that any plan needs to be well thought out and starting with the training of teachers to supervise the country's nine million students or, or, or more. Uh, this is not an easy task, of course. Still, we keep asking what would make the implementation of EMI a well-studied policy and Will this policy affect the Algerian social linguistic landscape, even though the implementation is limited to universities? 
And uh, these are the list of references. And from the perspective of the research community, we are still forecasting something happening uh, in Algeria. Uh, finally, thank you for your attention and your questions are welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Abdul Basit Do from Mr. Ghanem University for this very informative presentation. Uh, just uh, one comment, it is, uh, I don't know if it is a policy or a, or a reality between using English as a, as a language but uh, uh, it is a, I think that language, it is a tool. Uh, it is used in different, uh, nowadays, especially I mean, the new generation, they are using what well, they like to use English uh, more than French, I think. They are trying to, um, they are trying to learn it, to practice it. We see them nowadays, especially in universities, even if they are uh, old, they are trying to uh, learn English. They really like it. Inshallah, later on, during the debate, we will discuss it more. Immediately, we move to our third presentation by uh, Ms. Fatma Athmaniya from Lahwat University. Under the title of Globalization and the Impact of the English Language on Indigenous Languages in Africa. <clears throat> student from Lagwat University specialized in British Commonwealth Studies. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about globalization and the impact of English language on indigenous languages in Africa. Before we start, let's first take a look on the content of my presentation. First, I'm going to start with an introduction, then explain globalization, the linguistic situation in Africa, why English is being used increasingly in the continent, and the impact on indigenous languages in Africa. Finally, I conclude. As a start, today globalization has and is a still impact in many aspects of society, including language. One area globalization has impacted Africa's social development the most has to do with African languages. This presentation explores this issue and analyzes how globalization through the medium of English has impacted African languages, arguing that the spread of English in Africa represents a threat to the use and survival of indigenous languages. This leads to the second point, which is globalization. It can be defined as the interconnections of global economic, political, cultural, and environmental processes that continually transform present conditions. As a term, it is used to describe the changes in societies and world economy that result from dramatically increased international trade and cultural exchange. Now let's move to the linguistic situation in Africa. In fact, Today, at least 26 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa use English either as an official language exclusively, such as the case of Nigeria and Ghana, or as an official language alongside another African language, like in Kenya and South Africa. Several of these countries are traditionally Francophone nations, like the Cameroon or, uh, and Rwanda, which is a former Belgian colony and so is French-speaking, who replaced French with English as the country's official language while in the Mozambique, for example, uh, that is a formal uh, or former Portuguese colony, the registers of business in the formal marketplace have been captured by English. Now, coming to uh, why the use of English is increasing in Africa. In fact, English is assumed to be the most widely used language for international and intercultural communication. This is basically due to the economic status uh, and the technological importance of English speaking countries and their political supremacy, which make people and societies uh, and countries adopt the English language. Its hegemony is reflected in the dominant role it plays over the other languages and its global na nature stems from its being at the center of international activity. Now let's move to discussing the impact on indigenous uh, languages in Africa. I have chosen three main areas uh, of impact. The first one is the impact on the process of vernacularization in Africa. The impact on this process is not only in Anglophone states, but also in non-English speaking countries in Africa. This process entails the use of an indigenous language as the medium of instruction in the educational system, which with the advent of globalization 
has been put on the back burner. One cannot help but observe that First, the spread of English in Africa constitutes a major challenge to policies which aim at promoting the use of indigenous languages in the continent. Second, since English is not equally accessible to all Anglophone Africa, the language should not be expected to become accessible to all in the new territories either, that is non-English speaking countries where it is currently spreading. Third, language consumers in the new territories find English economically more appealing for its usefulness in achieving specific utilitarian goals, such as access to economic development or social mobility. Fourth and finally, the spread of English in Africa casts other Western languages, including French, Portuguese, and Spanish. It must be said, however, that these languages have victimized indigenous languages in Africa and elsewhere, and elsewhere since the colonial era to the present. The second impact is on publishing in Africa. It is important to note that publishing industry is the backbone of language development. In Africa, although literacy rates are low and European language speakers are few, it is still the foreign languages that are given the honor of national or official language status. Rather than developing their own languages, most of them argue for the use of English as the easier and the more economical of the options available to them. For a country like Tanzania, for example, where Swahili is spoken by all the population and is the language of instruction in primary schools, there can be no reason to justify the continued dependence on English. The problem starts with the fact uh, or with the false notions that African languages are not developed sufficiently to be media of instruction and that African languages are not capable of handling scientific terms and scientific concepts. The situation in South Africa, where the publishing industry is the most developed in Sub-Saharan Africa, exposes the problem clearly. According to the South African National Bibliography, for 1994, out of a total of 4,149 titles published, only 436 were in African languages. For 1995, the total number of titles published was 4,963, and only 713 were in African languages. This picture doesn't uh, even reflect the real situation because the 1,145 titles published in African languages in, languages in the two years cover many languages. The situation in most African countries is not different from this, and in a number of countries, it is much worse. The final area of impact is on language death in Africa. A language is culture. It contains a history of a people and all the knowledge they have passed down from generation to generation. As globalization continues to accelerate language deaths in Africa, the continent continues to lose a substantial part of its culture and indigenous uh, knowledge. There are all these severe consequences for language loss. The issue is vital because, as put by Lynette Manalang, the death of a language is the burning of a library. Where there is little or no literacy in the community, all knowledge of its culture lies within the language. Until recently, it was feasible for a small speech community to survive in reasonable isolation to preserve its own language, but the growing centralization of life has made and continues to make this kind of situation increasingly rare. A majority of the African countries, 65%, have experienced language extinctions or deaths of 54 of the approximately uh, 2,000 languages and or have endangered languages, 322 of the estimated 2,000 languages. Having in mind everything mentioned in the presentation, it can be said that globalization through the medium of English language represents a handicap for African social and cultural development and is a threat to the historical, cultural, and social heritage of African, langu African languages carry as it endangers the survival and use of these languages. Hence, unless native languages are recognized as a commodity rather than a token for cultural preservation, the prospects of the indigenous languages will continue to be bleak, especially in the era of globalization. It is hence crucial to establish a balance between the use of English language to meet the challenges imposed by globalization and the maintaining of uh, linguistic diversity by preserving indigenous languages spoken in Africa. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Fatma Atmania from Laghwat University for this very uh, informative presentation. Uh, directly, please, uh, I would like to, uh, to move to the fourth presentation by Dr. Farida Libal from Betna 2 University and Zohair Abdeslam from uh, Betna 1 University under the title of Academia and the policy of intellectual citizenship reinvestigating the mission of the humanities in higher education. <clears throat> Students, um, first of all, I would like to thank the Department of English University of Wirgila and more particularly the organizing uh, committee of this conference for giving me the chance to participate. Thank you so much. The talk I am presenting today is entitled Academia and the Policy of Intellectual Citizenship, Revisiting the Mission of Humanities in Higher Education. And it particularly sheds light on one of the most overstepped missions of higher institutions, education, and which is creating critical intellectual citizens. I would like to start by inviting the honorable audience to ponder and to consider the set of following key constitutive, sorry, yet intriguing realities about the change of paradigm in higher education missions. First of all, recently there have been many accounts raised about the reasons why the university as such has resigned on its primary role or project of liberal education. Liberal education, so to recall, is a type of education which was originally designed during the medieval times, which were the times when the first universities in the modern sense of the world, of course, were erected, and which primarily relied on the seven liberal arts, including the trivium and the quadrivium. Well, Within the seven liberal arts pedagogy, the individual was educated in what was referred to as the great book tradition, and which aimed initially to equip the individual student with the necessary knowledge so that he becomes an active member of the community. I repeat here, educating the individual in the service of the communal. That was the original mission for which universities were initially created. Equally intriguing about the university and its role in society is how teaching gradually became underrated, undervalued in favor of research, which it should be noted is less and less in touch with the requirements and the demands of the real world and more and more about um, you know, things which are within the reach of the comprehension of the common reader. So these reflecting realities, um, they have pushed many scholars to reconsider the role of the university as a place to provide the citizen subject with a type of culture which would benefit not just the individual himself, but also the nation state and its whole. It is this synergetic relationship between the individual and the communal, which is roughly referred to as a intellectual citizenship. So we owe uh, the concept of uh, intellectual citizenship sorry, to, uh, or, more, or more precisely, the critical intellectual citizenship to American historian Dominic Capra, who initially built on um, British scholar Bill Redding's categorization of what he called the roles of the life at the university, and which are namely research, teaching, and service. So Le Capra suggested critical intellectual citizenship as an additional category for the life at the university or the college, which is largely underestimated. Le Capra claims that it is because of the absence of intellectual citizenship as a central mission of the university, that this latter, which means the university, um, is no longer governed by the principle of reason, or of culture, but rather by the empty nihilistic principle of excellence. So this is in terms or in the words of Le Capra. 
So what is exactly critical intellectual citizenship and why does it matter in the shaping of university policy? Um, critical intellectual citizenship refers to one's participation in the limited public sphere that exists in the academy and that is both found and generated in such events such as conferences and public lectures um, active involvement in such events, especially events which are outside of one's own specialty, they obviously take time, yes, but um, they may also help to reinvigorate and to provide a forum for exploring ways or connecting works, both within the academy and the uh, activities uh, in the broader society. Well, such involvement is very important for both faculty and students. And usually it takes place in size, which allows somehow or offer different and possibly more uh, thought provoking and mutually challenging inter interchanges that um, or than those ordinary uh, places which are offered by the classroom. Here we can give examples of outdoor debates, uh, uh, reading circles and clubs, uh, scientific meetings, uh, conferences, and so on and so forth. That's uh, speaking once again in terms of the synergetic relationship between the individual and the communal, an intellectual citizen refers to a liberally educated person who is trained to be an intellectual who can raise critical questions for themselves and for the larger society on the one hand, and as someone with the skills to enter or to integrate the job market. Now, why does it matter? I mean, why is it that important that the concept of intellectual citizenship is to be integrated or reintegrated in higher education? So when we make a case for the reintegration of intellectual citizenship as a window of the university to the community in large, well, this is by no means to denigrate the importance of scholarship in one specific area of research or expertise, but it is to reaffirm the idea that the university is a locus of discussion and debate about the different issues that are not confined to one discipline or area of expertise. It means that here we are insisting on the tight relationship between the scholarly and the pedagogical pursuit on the one hand and the broader sociocultural and intellectual concerns that take one beyond one special area of expertise. Another question which also should be addressed is what forms of engagement do universities make possible? In other words, how can the university or universities participate in the creation of the intellectual citizenship? Now, one answer, according to Giroux, <clears throat> and it's in which is sorry, by creating the transformative intellectual. Like John Dewey, Henri Giroux, so to recall, institutional or for him, sorry, institutional education was addressed with a special regard to the concept of democracy. According to these two uh, scholars, critical citizenship is the means whereby political subjects are capable of exercising leadership in a democracy. Giroux argues that sites of education extend far beyond the institution of schooling and consequently notions of critical citizenship needs to address how education shapes democratic public life. For that matter, and within the same tradition, universities can contribute to promoting intellectual citizenship but by sorry, aiming at creating a transformative intellectual, one who can exercise form of intellectual and pedagogical practices which attempt to insert teaching and learning directly into the political sphere by arguing that schooling represents both the struggle for meaning and the struggle over power relations. 
Giro here also refers to the kind of individual whose intellectual practices are necessarily grounded in forms of moral and ethical discourse, which exhibit uh, referential um, or the different concerns for the suffering and the struggle for disadvantages and the oppressed. So to, to summarize it all, we are here extending the traditional view of the intellectual as someone who is who is sorry just able to analyze various interests and contradictions within society to someone who is capable of articulating emancipatory possibilities and working towards their realization so within this standpoint um teachers who assume the role of transformative intellectuals they treat students as critical agents who question how knowledge is produced, how knowledge is distributed, and how it is acquired at the same time. These teachers also utilize dialogue and make knowledge meaningful, critical, and um, ultimately emancipatory for themselves and to their students. Well, of course, this is according to the theory of Henri Giroud. As a conclusion, I'd like to say that the main concern of the policy of intellectual citizenship has always been directed towards the broader question of how educators should view the purpose of higher education. Universities have originally been created as sites dedicated to uh, self and also social empowerment. Well, put in this perspective, higher education institutions can be public places where students learn the knowledge and the skills which are necessary to live in a critical democracy. Contrary to this uh, very narrow view that universities are mere extensions of the workplace, the policy of intellectual citizenship calls for viewing universities uh, in a social sorry in a sociocultural and intellectual and in a democratic way uh, of public spheres institutions which activities center or should center around critical inquiry and meaningful dialogue and in which students are given the opportunity to learn the discourse of public association and civic responsibility that's what we should train ourselves and our students to be Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Farid al for this well-explained uh, uh, study. Uh, again, we are under the same uh, topic of this session of the second day, under the title of Language Education Policy. We call for Dr. Faisal Saoudi from Khamshla University in order to present or uh, to present his uh, topic under the title of The Rising of English and the Language Conflict in Post Hirak, Algeria Attitudes and Stances Among Algerians. <laughs> Saudi from Mbadal University, Hajla, Algeria. I would like first to thank all the organizers and people in charge of the conference for accepting my work. I would also welcome all the colleagues, participants, and guests in this event. Uh, my work is entitled The Rising of English and Language Conflict in Port Iraq, Algeria Attitudes and Stances among Algerians. First, I would like to refer to the sociolinguistic situation in Algeria. Uh, Algeria Algeria's linguistic landscape is diverse. Uh, we have four languages. We have Arabic, Temavit, French, and English, which are all in a direct contact in the country, as stated by some scholars such as the Rep. 2014 and Bermihu 2018. 
usually in linguistics it's common that most of language contacts lead to what we call langu language conflicts, especially when people try to impose and promote a tongue or a code or any language over another in their community. Such kind of confrontation or rivalry between languages is referred to by Beneuve in his work, the 2013 uh, Language War. Now today, the language conflict in Algeria is uh, threefold. It consists of a clash between Arabic and Tamazight, with all its variants. We have also Arabic versus French, which is a classical conflict in Algeria, and we have uh, a modern conflict, uh, which is French versus English. Therefore, this work or this research is related or uh, trying to solve the problem of language conflict in modern day. Now, usually, as stated by the Nerebis 2013 2014, the language conflict in Algeria is shaped by or has always been shaped by major events in Algeria's history. So, we've got the colonial period where the colonizer tried to impose French as the official and the only language in the country, which is known in linguistics as Frenchification. We've got also in the post-colonial period, uh, after 1962, after the independence, we've got a attempts of Arabization by the government as a reflection to the Frenchification policy adopted, uh, had been adopted in the country by France. Later on in 1980s, we've got a interesting movement, something which was uh, changing, which is the Berber movement, which witnessed the call for promotion and officialization of Berber, calling or uh, leading to the emergence of a new conflict between Arabic and uh, Berber in the country. We've got also in late 90s, uh, 80s and early 90s with uh, the economic growth in the country, where English was introduced into the country as a new language required because of the economic orientation of the country. As far as the current conflict in Algeria is concerned, we have to speak about a major event in 2019 known as Al-Hirak protest or a movement which was a history change in that raised crucial ideological issues in the country. And we've got uh, among the ideological issues uh, the linguistic issue, where people protested against French and called for English as its alternative in the country. And it was what's different now uh, than the previous uh, events is that now the people demand. Uh, English. So we see people demand not uh, just words we see on Facebook or posts we see on Facebook. We've got uh, also official institutions trying to promote English at the expense of French and trying to change, the, for instance, their panels in their uh, headquarters to English or add in English. And we've got also something interesting, which is the online questionnaire put by the Ministry of Higher Education on their uh, website, official website, uh, in 2019, July 2019, on implementing English as a second language, or second foreign language, the first foreign language, sorry, the first foreign language at university. 94% uh, were with the proposal and uh, supported the replacement of French with English at uh, university. For this work's nature and objectives, we see a qualitative exploratory study which sheds some light on the current language conflict in post Iraq Algeria through a specific angle. Now, specific angle because we post or try to study this uh, topic through the eyes of a specific group of people. So, we have two major objectives which are attitudes and viewers of a group of people who are professors and second year master students of the English department at the Bessauer University and we've got uh, the focus on the double conflict French versus Arabic and French versus uh, English. Now, the choice to uh, speak only about this
binary conflict and not the Arab, uh, the Arab Islamic conflict is because the French conflict to Arabic is related to the French conflict into English. So it's a kind of two faces of the same coin. Uh, accordingly, we have some questions we touched upon. We have what attitudes do they have, these people, towards the status of French in Algeria vis a vis Arabic? And we've got to, how do they perceive and react towards the implementation and promotion of English as an alternative to French in the The method that has the according or the method we adopted in this research is as follows. So for the population, we have professors and second year master's students at the Department of English at Bachelor University. We've got 19 teachers and 137 students for the academic year in 1920. Uh, the sample was chosen randomly, so we've got 16 teachers and 31 students, making an overall of 47 participants in this study. Uh, we adopted in the data collection procedures a questionnaire, which consists of two sections, Arabic versus French, or which focused on Arabic versus French conflict, plus second section which focused on French versus the English. Uh, we have, or well, the questionnaire included 11 questions divided between these sections and it was administered online due to the COVID lockdown. Now, for the results, the study shows that uh, We are going to work for first on the Arabic versus French conflict. We've got five questions. Question number one is related to the issue of Arabic and the vaccination in comparison to French in the country. We've got here about 70%, 70% said yes, Arabic is being underestimated in front of French in the country. The second issue is related to the use of French in the Algerian administration, including the local administration and the government in all types of documents, in their discourse and such things. 75% of people were against this kind of use. The third issue is related to French at universities and public spheres. Now in here we have that people were divided, 50% were against its use in universities and public spheres, while 50 others said it's okay, it's just a bilingual situation. Concerning the use of French in daily life in Algeria by ordinary people, we said, or we had three kinds of responses. We have some people who said that this is an extension of colonial period and they saw this as a negative side aspect. Others saw it as a normal bilingual situation, a kind of social linguistic healthy situation. Or a few of them saw it as a personal choice. For the use of French over Arabic, and its relation to the Algerian identity, we've got 61% agree that those who use French in Algeria lost their identity, real identity, while 25 were neutral. For the English versus French conflict, for the clash between English and French, we've got number one, the presence and strength of French in the world, and here we try to see how these people who are supposed to be specialized in linguistics see the dominance and strength of the French in the world. 85% saw that French is weak and declining in the world. For the second issue, which is French is an obstacle in Algeria's development. In other words, we continue if we continue using French as the first foreign language in the country, we are not going to develop at all levels. 75% said yes, it is a obstacle. Third issue is about drilling out French as the first foreign language in the country. 80% said yes, we have to get rid of French as the first foreign language in the country. Now, when asked about replacing French with English in the country, making English as the first foreign language in the country in all the main domains, 90%, which is the majority, said yes, we have to change English, change French with English. The fifth issue in the English-French conflict is related to the role English is playing or going to play or would play 
in the development of the academic and scientific research in Algeria. Now, 60% strongly agree and 40% agree. So, in general, they all agree that we have to get English as, or make English as the first foreign language in the country, especially in the academic and scientific research field. The sixth issue is, sixth, sixth issue is implementing English as the first foreign language in the education and higher education systems in Algeria. 90% agree on implementing English in our education system, starting from the, the primary school till the university level, we have to get rid of French and use English. Now, based on the research results we had, we can conclude the following. French is losing its place in English in Algeria, and this is very obvious, obvious from these results where we have the majority are against French. We have English is highly demanded by the people, and this is confirmed by the results. They confirmed what we saw in the social media platforms and we, what we saw during the Iraq. We have also English is no longer exclusively a business and economy is need, as stated earlier by the NERF 2014, where we said that English is introduced to the country because of business, because of the oil boost. Today, it is a necessity in all fields, especially education and science, and this is what has been called during a Iraq. Now, this kind of linguistic orientation towards English in the country is not an individual uh, stances taken by people on social media or things uh, like, but uh, it has become a serious ideological development, developmental issue in the country and therefore the government must uh, direct its attention to such topic, which is a linguistic issue in the country, especially after here, which shows a major call of uh, orientation towards uh, English. Now, concerning the limitations of the study, we've got, uh, as I said earlier, the study was a qualitative exploratory study, but uh, focused on, uh, or was a small scale work, focused on a narrow area among a narrow people. It was not extensive, so the questionnaire might have been uh, deeper, it might have been broader in terms of the number of questions. Sampling was limited because of COVID-19 lockdown, so we could, we could not reach all people, which would have been a add to the uh, strength of the reliability of the study, but because of the COVID lockdown, we could not reach all people. And for further research, we can take this study as a starting point for a broader, a, a major studies in the field of linguistic attitudes in the country, especially in the current time. So, uh, therefore, we have to include all categories of people, not only those who are specialized in linguistics and have a uh, multilingual or a linguistic repertoire. We have to make large scale research, have to include more people, or larger numbers of people in the country, and we have to we have to make studies which are or which are taking a deeper analysis to the issue, not just attitudes. We can use mixed methods to investigate this very serious topic in the country. Now, these are the references, or some of the basic references I used in the study, especially this or this scholar. He worked extensively on the topic of language conflict in Algeria. At the end, I would like to show my warmest thanks to all colleagues and participants and attendees of the conference. So thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions and valuable comments. Welcome back again. Uh, we are so sorry we have faced some difficulties with the presentation of Dr. Faisal Saudi. 
I would like Dr. Faisal Saudi from uh, Khanshla University if you join us virtually in order to uh, shed more light about uh, this uh, very interesting topic, which is uh, one of our concerns, uh, the, 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 uh, the rising of the English language during the post Heraka Algeria. So please, uh, if you are here uh, later on, if you want to add something or to explain something, would you uh, join us? Immediately we move to uh, last but not least uh, during this uh, session uh, for uh, Dr. Harun Milgani uh, from Mbwaki University under the title of uh, Growing Up uh, Multilingual Parents' Attitudes Towards Multilingual Education Policy in uh, Algeria. <clears throat> virtual international conference on the reality of the linguistic policy in the world. My name is Dr. Harun Milgeni. I am a teacher in the Department of English at the University of Mubwaki. And today I will be talking about a debatable topic in multilingual education and development literature. So the title of my presentation is Growing Up Multilingual, Parents' Attitudes Towards Multilingual Education Policy. In our so ladies and gentlemen, let me first walk you through the main points that I will address in this presentation. I will start with a statement of the problem, research aims, questions and hypotheses, and quickly move to talk about the research instruments that I used in this research and then I move to talk about the main results and conclusions, and I will end up talking about pedagogical implications and directions for future research. And finally, I will talk about the general conclusion of this research. So what is the issue under investigation? In the last two decades, new governmental policies were embarked on to integrate the use of English language in many formal and public avenues, ranging from administration, politics and social media. So this radical change of focus was also burgeoned by the integration of English in all the public and private schools nationwide. These new multilingual policies have reshaped not only the linguistic profile of the nation, but also Algerians' perceptions and views about monolingualism and multilingualism ideology more generally. Yet, while there has been, and still, a growing debate among researchers over the bilingualism, multilingualism policies in the educational and academic community, Algerian parents' beliefs and views on the importance of English teaching as a third language in primary, secondary, and high school gained little attention in the multilingual education and development literature. In addition to that, the role of parents as policymakers in raising their children multilingually and also bilingually has gained little attention. It has been under research, under test, and also and theorized. This present research tackles three main objectives. Number one, examine which literacy tasks children practice at home to learn multiple languages. Number two, examine parents' views about the importance of multilingual education policy and its implementation in the educational context, and by extension, the cultural and socioeconomic sectors. Investigate the strategies planned by parents, the policymakers, to promote the multilingual development of their kids at home and in the educational. This present research addresses the following questions. Number one. What are parents' attitudes towards the promotion of linguistic pluralism in the educational spheres and, by and large, the socioeconomic sectors? Number two, to what extent do parental ideologies play a role in the promotion of multilingual development of children at home? And number three, which additive approaches and supplemental strategies parents plan to do in order to raise bilingual and multilingual children? The hypothesis around which my study is framed states that parents have positive attitudes towards the integration of multilingual education policy in the educational context in Algeria. Now let's talk about the fieldwork methodology I adopted. In order to collect the data, I use the questionnaire as a tool of measurement. The questionnaire is organized in the following way. 
Section number one seeks to solicit information about each participant in the sample. Section number two addresses the language and literacy practices performed by kids at home. Section number three foregrounds parental ideologies about the linguistic plurality and early child education. And finally, section number four tackles language planning and multilingualism. Because the main objective of this research is to examine multilingualism in early child education, we decided to recruit adults whose parental status is parents who have children. The categories which are not accounted for are single adults and non-Algerian parents. And now let's talk about the sample size and composition. It should be noted that the administration of the questionnaires to the accessible population lasted for around one month. Because of the strict measurements of the pandemic, we set the task to administer the questionnaires electronically. That is, by sending each participant an electronic version of the questionnaire designed by Google Drive. We administered 85 questionnaires and we received the exact number of questionnaires. The table that you see now in front of you displays the distribution of participants by education. It appears that all participants belong to different educational levels. Most of them are teachers and administration staff. It is worth noting that participants vary on many regional grounds. That is, they live in many regions and cities in Algeria. So here are the main results that pertain to code choice in different social situations. As reported by the 85 Algerian parents, home literacy environment of the Algerian children seems to be linguistically diverse, with children using different languages in different linguistic and literacy tasks at home. As evidenced in these two charts, it seems that they are more prone to use different languages, national and foreign, when watching documentary movies, entertainment shows on YouTube, watching TV programs and cartoon movies. However, it seems that of all the choices, Arabic and Derija, Arabic and English, seem to be the dominant choices adopted by children. Parallel results can also be displayed and elucidated in these two charts. It appears that children are more likely to use English, Derija, and Arabic on texting messages, surfing the internet, and reading books. So English gains a currency as the second most favored linguistic choice in all the situations that we discussed before, except for playing video games and using phone applications, in which English seems to be the most dominant favorite choice for all children, as displayed in this pie chart. Now let's move to discuss the main results that pertain to parental ideologies. The main research findings demonstrated that, in stark contrast with monolingual education, multilingual education is highly favored as a medium of instruction across all levels of education, be they elementary, middle, or high. In addition, parents agree that multiple education should be more supported at school, whereby pupils can be exposed to more English, along with other local heritage languages in the classroom. Comparatively, most parents agree that integrated English teaching programs in the elementary school should or would yield positive outcomes on the child's academic and professional success. On a more negative note, however, parents seem to be highly dissatisfied with the number of duty hours issued by the Ministry of Education to teach English as a subject at In addition to that, there is a general agreement about the importance of learning multiple languages and also local varieties at home from an early age. However, the results revealed mixing opinions about the impact of learning multiple including national and foreign languages, is of high significance to the cultural richness and economic growth of the nation. The descriptive statistics of the second table reveal that parents agree that linguistic plurality acquisition does not have negative consequences on the child's cultural and identity formation. Interestingly enough, 
Most parents perceive that learning multiple languages is highly associated with high IQ and better cognitive competence. As evidenced from this bar chart, it seems that the majority of research participants believe that English should be taught at schools as a compulsory subject in the primary school. 42.4% favored the last three years of primary school as an option for English language education, whereas 28.2 opted for the first three years of primary school, a strong indication that parents prefer to have their children learn English from an early now have a look at the following by chart. Interesting results came out. It seems that options which contain only one single language like Tamazight and Arabic were categorically and completely disfavored by parents. Conversely, bilingual education and multilingual education were the most favored educational policy, whereby two or three languages are adopted as the medium of instruction at school. The results of language planning reflect parents' high awareness of the benefits of multilingual education. The results indicate that parents plan to send their children to private schools in order to have them enhance their multilingual development. In addition, Algerian parents reported that they would consider availing themselves of social media platforms and educational phone applications, which represent widely used additive strategies to enhance kids' multilingual acquisition. 37% of parents reported that they plan to consider ways and strategies to help their children improve their proficiency of the national languages such as Temazight and Arabic at home and school. As for the pedagogical implications, I would like to talk about the awareness raising tasks of linguistic diversity. I believe that teachers should always encourage learners to make use of their developing languages in the classroom environment. Students could work in small groups to create class surveys and explore the words, grammar, greeting expressions used by other peers and people who speak other languages. Teachers can make use of their audiovisual materials to show pupils examples from different languages. Last but not least, I believe that the aforementioned multilingual activities would help teachers show their pupils that all languages are equal in terms of their expressive ability and cultural and moral values. That is, it's fine to speak any world language without any embarrassment. These are some of the ideas I suggest for future research. Ingenious researchers will be well served to work on the integration of multilingual education policy in the syllabi of primary education. In addition to that, light is to be shed on the interplay between family language policy, identity, and multilingual education policy. And finally, research on raising bilingual belligerent children in predominantly monolingual communities and the role of home literacy environment in raising children bilingually and multilingually cry out for future research. On a final note, we can conclude that while monolingual education is categorically disfavored by parents, multilingual education is highly favored as a medium of instruction across all the educational levels, be they primary, middle, or high. In addition, there is a general agreement about the importance of learning multiple languages and also local varieties at home and school from an early age. Finally, parents' positive attitudes towards multilingual education policy was coerced and influenced in large measures by the changing multilingual education policy on the one hand and also the marked values ascribed to English and linguistic plurality on the other. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Dr. Harun. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Harun Milgani from Ombudsman University for this uh, presentation. Uh, well, I would like uh, now to thank all uh, the presenters for this uh, innovative idea that they have uh, presented today for this session. And the title of uh, 
language education policy. Uh, now I invite my colleagues who are on this panel to contribute uh, to the debate. Uh, I have received some questions. Yes, Mr. Arkad, are you here? By the way, nice to see you. Yes. Nice to see you too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first question to uh, Dr. Haron, if you are here. Uh, before Dr. Haron, so, so sorry. Yeah. I want to address the question to Dr. Farida Lebal, since she is here. Dr. Farida. <coughs> Yes, I'm here. I'm listening. Yes, thank you. So the question is: uh, schooling represent represents sorry a struggle for meaning and a struggle over uh, power relations. How, please? Would you explain how can uh, schooling represents a struggle for meaning and a struggle over uh, power relations? Yes. Well, the topic that I have presented, it dealt mainly with uh, the intellectual citizenship. What has been noticed recently is that there is a kind of divorce between institutional education and society at large. So if we embrace this policy of intellectual citizenship, we can make out of our school a place of the struggle of power relation. What do we mean here? It means simply that we are going to engage the learners in the overall sphere, political sphere that is uh, uh, governing the society that we are living in. So in the terms of Foucault, what we mean by power relationship, it means a distribution of power, who is the most powerful in a society, and how people themselves, of course, through their discourse, I'm not talking about fist power, I'm just talking about intellectual power, can make a change within the society. What I have posited in my presentation is that there are, let's call them soft ways, to embrace this and to engage in the political sphere of the society. When, for example, a learner is aware of what's going on, when a learner is not just confining his knowledge to things that are within the, let's say, the boundaries of his field of expertise, this is what intellectual citizenship is about. It's not that, for example, you are teaching or learning literature. The only things that you are aware of are literary studies, or if it is the case of linguistics or any other kind of, um, let's say, investigation. It is about enlarging the scope of your knowledge and trying to train our students to and prepare them to take part in the society. I am a student, but not only this, I am also an active member in my society. So if I engage in those activities, I will know at least what's going on around me. And of course, I will be trained to take an active part in that, uh, let's say, political, sociocultural, and intellectual life that is around the university. Okay. Also, to uh, so what, I, what I have understood that we need uh, to uh, make uh, the university as a, a place not only for uh, uh, academic learning and but only uh, as a place uh, or a critical, like you have said, a place for uh, citizenship in order to develop their intellectual level to share ideas together like that. Yes? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. yes. Yes, I have said at the beginning that this whole concept of intellectual citizenship, I mean, it's not something new. It's just that we have gone astray of it. The original concept of the university was designed entirely for that. Back in the Middle Ages, when the first universities was suggested or were suggested as a place of education, it was what we call the liberal education. And it was, um, uh, as historically recorded, uh, there had been suggested two 
two kinds of education. We have, first of all, the trivium and we have the quadrivium. Trivium, this means the three main arts and they have to do with, uh, you know, the, the linguistic skills. I mean, how to train our learners to, you know, be able to express themselves and to be able to convey their, their ideas and so on and so forth. Well, in addition to those three major and basic skills, there had been what we call the quadrivium and these are four different and separate independent fields of inquiry which include mathematics for example architecture and all those things so at the end of the day we have a student a graduate who not only is specialized in one single thing but at a month that's what we call you know, back in the day the encyclopedic knowledge okay but then with i don't know what for, for what reasons we have gone astray of it of this sorry and we ended up having for example one graduate who is only specialized and god knows what kind of specialty we are speaking about in only one field of inquiry. This is what we have missed. So even if we if that graduate, I mean, I'm talking about the modern university graduate, wanted to contribute to the development and the overall, you know, good of his society, they cannot or they are not in a position to do so because they lack the proper training to do that. Okay, so if we bring back this tradition, because I've been talking about reintegrating, not entirely creating it, but reintegrating it, so maybe we can do something for our society. Thank you, Dr. Farida, for your uh, explanation. Thank you so much. Do stay with us in order, if you want to contribute uh, more in our debate. Of course, of course, that would be my pleasure. Thank you again. Uh, I want to uh, address Mr. Arkad. Yes, please, if you are here. Yes, I'm here. Yes, he is here. Uh, concerning uh, the multilingual uh, Burundi uh, uh, policy, you have said that uh, you said that you, uh, you prefer, uh, I, what I have found that uh, the majority of Burundians people use uh, uh, Kirundi language, like that? Yes, Kirundi is a, a native language and it is used all over the country. It is understood all over the country. Yes, and uh, you, you, uh, the majority of your people use the, they, uh, they are francophones like that. Yes, they use uh, uh, French more than English. Not the majority, only the, the educated one. Yes, but so, uh, well, well, you educated. Said that, uh, Swahli, uh, or you have said the Swahili or Kiswahili language. It is used only in uh, religious uh, or in mosque uh, places. Yes. 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 Would you yes. please explain where it is used or how please, how can people please, um, uh, especially in the academic domain, uh, what do you prefer or uh, what do you use? Uh, do you uh, please speak uh, English or uh, French? So it is, uh, you have that. Um... Yeah. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, in the academic domain or in education in general, it is French which is dominant. Uh, with regard to Kiswahili, as I said, it is the third language of the country and it is spoken in urban areas and in uh, uh, provinces, uh, bordering provinces. Uh, and it is used by a Muslim in prayers. Yes. So it is a, a religious uh, language. Yes, for Muslim. For Muslims, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Arkada. Would you please stay with us? I have yes. another question, please, uh, uh, from you to uh, Dr. Haron Milgani, if you are here. Yes. From uh, Ombuaki University. Yes. I can, I can see the question was to, to what extent do linguistic ideologies and the attitudes play a role in the limited use of English in Burundi? This was the question. Can I answer? Yes. Ah, yes, thank you. Uh, as I said, um, English made its way to Burundi many years ago, but as French is, a colonial legacy, it has been um, maintaining a privileged position in education, in administration, in law, and in many key domains or in the 
the official life of the country. And this uh, made many Burundians still remote to the English language and um, they uh, had um, a poor awareness of the dominance of the English language worldwide. Uh, there was uh, even a, a largely held view that, uh, uh, for example, sciences, science students dislike languages, especially English. Uh, this was due to poor awareness of uh, the dominance of the English language worldwide. But things uh, are changing uh, exactly with uh, the integration of Burundi in the East African community, which is a community uh, including uh, countries like uh, Burundi, Tanzania, Tanzania Kenya, yes, yes uh, Uganda, uh, South yes. Sudan. Uh, so in this community, the English language is the official language. And this has made Burundi to, yes, to try to promote the English language for a full integration. Uh, and also uh, with uh, the increasing globalization, scientists are now getting aware of the need to publish in English. And all these uh, factors are, yes, uh, making many Burundians, yes, getting aware and having good attitude towards the English language. But there is still a long way to go because uh, some decisions at the government level are taken and may demotivate uh, learners. For example, uh, in the secondary schools, uh, learners who are in language slims um, cannot go in boarding schools. So this can be a demotivating uh, yes, factor for learning English. Thank you very much. I hope. Thank you, Mr. Arkat, for your explanation. Uh, since uh, Dr. Haron is here, uh, oh. I have a question, please, for you. Do you think that linguistic diversity is important in all levels of education? Education, yes. Is it for me the question? No, for Dr. Haron. Thank you, Mr. Arkad. Ah, thank you. Stay with us, please. Hello. Yeah, I'm listening. Yes, I will repeat the question for you. Do you think yeah. that linguistic diversity is important in all levels of education? Sure. Um, I, I think that uh, ling linguistic diversity is so important um, because uh, not only for the education level, but also for the economic status of the community, right? I think that uh, uh, what is lacking in the Algerian context is that the English language is not supported much more in the uh, technological and also in the academic and the, 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 the scientific disciplines. And but the, the, the point of my, my, my topic is that uh, uh, much of the research on family, um, on language policy focused on more institutional, more, I would say formal context. But the point is that what is really lacking here is that the role of the family, right? I mean, what is the, the, uh, uh, the point of view of parents about multilingual education. Do they think that uh, uh, multilingual education is so important or not, right? So this is one of the most lacking, I would say, uh, 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 points and research gaps in the, in, the I mean, in the language policy, right? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Haron. Yeah, you. Uh, please, if uh, Ms. Fatma Athmania, uh, are you here, please? Or Dr. Faisal? Also, Dr. Faisal, uh, since uh, we have faced the sound problem, we need to clarify, please. 
we need some clarification concerning your uh, topic. Ms. Fatima? Would you please raise your hand in order to uh, give you the floor, please? You are with the notary. Mr. Abdul Basit, go. From Mr. Gan University, Mr. Abdul Basit. Are you here, please? Do you want to say something, please? Please concerning this, uh, concerning this, uh, I mean, concerning language education policy, I want to say just uh, because of time, that language is a critical tool that is used for uh, a purpose of communication, of course. And through it, we uh, probably uh, uh, explain our uh, various situation that we come across in our daily interaction and uh, varied level. So, uh, especially the English language, it is uh, a need nowadays. Yes, please, if you want to say something before we close our uh, debate. Can I say something, please? Yes, Dr. Farida, Ms. Farida, please, yes. Uh, well, uh, it's just a, a remark. I think that there is something that needs to be addressed as far as language policy is concerned. Well, this is probably something that my, my colleagues, Dr. Uh, Milgeni and Dr. Diumana, sorry if I have pronounced your name uh, in a wrong way. But I think that, uh, well, especially for the presentation of Dr. Milgeni, when we talk about uh, you know language policy, we are talking about a kind of um, coordination between the needs or the attitudes of the population and the policy that is adopted by the country. And I think that this is the real problem that especially us in Algeria we are facing. How do we have talked about uh, a generation of you know, young learners who are you know, pivoting towards uh, uh, embracing the, the English language as their maybe second language instead of the French one. But the problem is that there is a kind of problem when they reach the institutional level. Why is that? Because the institution is not governed by the will of their parents. If their parents, for example, chose for them the English language, they're going to face problems once they go into institutions. And well, as a teacher in the National Higher School of Renewable Energy, Energy, which is a, uh, let's say, a scientific and, and um, yes, economically, even if it's, it's economically oriented, uh, let's say, higher institution, I, I, I face that problem. Uh, our students uh, who are, you know, of a younger generation who have been raised, let's say, watching, as you have said, um, cartoons in English and watching YouTube channels in English, they have a very fluent and they have a very, uh, I could say that it's a perfect level of English, but when it comes to the needs of the institution itself, they have to shift again back to French. Why? Because that generation of teachers who are teaching them are still using the French language, the language that they have been taught in. Okay, so I think that this is the main problem to be addressed in uh, language policies. There has to be a kind of coordination between parents, let's say, attitudes and the choice they opt for to their children and the greater or the, the high level policy makers. Okay, okay, I think yeah. that that's just um, this is just a remark that I had in mind. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ferida Lebel. Thank you. Uh, Please, uh, I call other uh, colleagues, please, if you want to contribute to contribute more to this uh, debate, please. If not, uh, yes, would you please raise your hand in order to detect you, please? Yeah, so please, uh, yes, Mr. Haron, you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to explain one point. Uh, when he said that, um, in the conclusion that parents' ideologies uh, were coerced or influenced by the recent, the recent ch change in policy. What I meant by that is, um, is the fact that in the last few, I would say, years, the recognition of Tamazight and also the partial 
uh, recognition of English as an important language in the economic and, and, and also the social uh, avenues. I think these changes to some extent affected uh, how parents think about multilingualism, uh, the instrumentality of English in, in the socioeconomic I mean, sectors, right? But as Dr. Uh, Libal uh, um, pointed out, that should be a coordination, right? And I capitalize this, this, this word, every letter in this word, the coordination. And this is what lacking is that the, the, the governmental policies should take into account uh, parents' ideologies, what people, what parents think about. I mean, the, the, uh, the importance of languages, the importance of multilingualism or monolingualism, right? So I think this is called bottom bottom up model of language policy. Is that the starting from the bottom? It means that the, 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 there should be many research projects, many um, uh, uh, many uh, uh, large scale research projects on the socio linguistic reality of Algeria, right? And on the basis of that, we can uh, uh, plan. Uh, I would say. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, multilingual policy that reflects to a great extent parents, I mean, point of view parents, I mean, uh, visions of multilingual I mean, policy and et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, totally agree. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harun, uh, Ms. Farida, also for your uh, contribution, Mr. Arkad, and uh, Abdul Basit, though, please. Uh, Yes. Yes. Mr. Halimi wants to say something. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good morning. Hey. I'm doing great. Hi. Nice to see I'm you. I'm fine. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for participating. Thank, Thank you for your uh, debate. I'm very happy. I'm very Arkad. pleased to be with you. Yes. It's good to see you, you Arkad. Yes. Thank and you. Mr. Aaron. <laughs> Sorry? Yes. Thank, Thank you so much. They're all the most welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. So please, I declare uh, the end of uh, this uh, session. Please uh, see you in other opportunities, face to face, inshallah. Thank you, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. You so are much. most welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Dr. Arim Rosnelbel Shelby, an associate professor from the University of uh, Wergla. I am extremely pleased to be part of this uh, international conference and extremely pleased to chair this session uh, that is entitled Promoting Innovative Teaching in EFL Classes. We're going first to start with listening uh, to the presentations of uh, our participants. Uh, then we're going to close uh, the session with uh, uh, the University of uh, uh, First of all, uh, we're going to listen to Madame Soror Umdur from uh, Khanshla University. Her presentation is entitled The 21st Century Innovative, uh, Innovative Teachers Training. <laughs> Ready? Uh, my presentation will be about 21st century innovative teachers training. <coughs> the outline of the presentation is as follows. Introduction, defining teachers training, teachers professional development, the innovative framework, then conclusion. So uh, you can say that education provides the individual with the opportunity to take a broad view of life with all its aspects. The image of an efficient teacher in the 21st century classroom has been changed. It is widely agreed that the efficient teacher's role is to prepare learners for their future lives and not for standardized tests. Indeed, the purpose of the 21st century education is to enhance meaningful lifelong learning for all learners. Correspondingly, the impact of good teaching is increasingly considered as a major determinant of the social and the economic well-being of a given society. Therefore, the quality of teachers' training determines the quality of education and linked with the nation's development. At a more sophisticated level, teacher educators them themselves engaged in an ongoing debate about the relative importance of knowledge, skills, understanding, and application in the 21st century teachers' innovative training programs. According to Brin 2014, the term of teachers' training generally used to describe the courses and qualifications that teachers undertake and receive at the outset of their careers, or one of courses that are largely designed with a short term or immediate purpose in mind. It includes providing instruction to teachers or instructors on different strategies, methods, and techniques designed to help teachers improve their teaching practices in order to teach their students appropriately. Moving now to teachers' professional development and growth. As a matter of fact, teachers need to master a variety of professional development skills to back up their professional years of experience. For enhancing the effectiveness of their teaching, teachers are expected to provide their learners with quality education. Actually, successful teachers perceive themselves as being lifelong learners. Correspondingly, teachers' professional development is an ongoing process throughout teachers' careers. It provides them with the opportunity to improve their teaching skills. Furthermore, it involves organizing workshops and seminars for teachers where they are given the time and the resources to work on innovative projects of their own creations. This will enable them to achieve high standards of quality education or at least to be knowledgeable about the last trends in education. Moreover, seminars for teachers' professional development are considered to be the ground for collective inquiry, shared expertises, and 
inspired conversations among professionals. Therefore, teachers' attendance to such seminars is recommended since it helps them to enhance efficiency of the educational situations. Moreover, it is helpful for the teachers to be updated on modern instructional devices that inspire them to become better teachers in the modern world. Moving now to the framework of the innovative teacher train. So, um, the following activities will let will let sorry the foundation for effective in service program. Here mainly about tra training teachers who are in service. So, activities are moving from once per teacher training to continuous de development program, shifting from uh, one theoretical teaching, building learning partnership, developing communities of practice, interconnectedness, then the e-witness. So, building understanding. The most important aspect of continuing professional development is to continue the process of developing understanding about it. We all need to engage ourselves in an ongoing process of reading, thinking and talking about all those ideas necessary to educate the young learners. So teacher train, train history need to be formed mainly about how to deal with young learners starting with understanding their learners how can they understand their learners then we have interconnectedness so we have these activities that need to be interconnected by the teacher so that he could be successful in his profession. So we have the content, the pedagogy, the skill, the technology and the attitude. So successful teacher should be formed on how to deal with these issues together so that he could improve the process of teaching. Then we have developing new communities of practice. We have teaching, practicum, peer-to-peer -peer learning, co-teaching and shadowing. So in innovative teaching, uh, teacher training program, sorry, we need to form the teacher trainees on how to develop new types of practices. Mm -hmm. Then we have the eeriness. So as we are in 21st century and technology became something uh, necessary in our lives so we need to form teacher trainees to be uh, technologically capable and to know about technologies that support teaching and how to use these technologies also teacher trainee n needs to be knowledgeable of how we teach or about pedagogy also the content teacher trainees need to be formed on how to deal with the content and how to, and to, to know what to teach and how to teach it keeping online form alive so in innovative teacher program training we have we, we, we have this issue of online uh, meetings 
that should be developed. Teachers can be encouraged to use such forums to engage in healthy discussions and training of best practices. At least on working Saturdays, for instance, teachers should be encouraged to go on to forum and share their thoughts. Blogs to share best practice globally. So since we are in the area of technology, so why not to use this international um, blogs to, to in which teacher in through which teachers can discuss new trend uh, trends in the field of teaching. We have other innovative features uh, in the field of teacher training, such as reflective practice in form of journaling. Teachers conducting mini researches, such as action research, sharing of best practices through publications, subject-based meetings, and content discussions, tutorials on professional schools day, for instance. Moving now to conclusion. So we can say that teachers are believed to have given training courses and to master a variety of professional development skills to back, to back up their professional years of experience. To foster the effectiveness of their teaching, teachers are expected to provide their learners with quality education. Correspondingly, like good teachers perceive themselves as being lifelong learners. They never stop learning. Efficient teachers strongly believe that teachers' professional development is an ongoing process throughout their careers as it provides them with the opportunity to improve their teaching skills. So, as a part of innovative teachers' training programs, we need to form teachers who are creative and who really work and uh, try to always be active and conduct kinds of action research and then to publish their researches. We need to form uh, technologically capable teachers who manage and master technological, the, 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 the needed technological skills to teach uh, their learners. And to and to also we need to form teachers who are able to build new paradigms in the field of teaching. A teachers who know how effectively teach the skills that are set for the twenty first century, and is the teacher who really create and maintain a. Uh, Sorry, teacher who creates and maintains a positive learning environment for learners and to try always to motivate them to, to learn more and to be, um, to be, <coughs> sorry, to achieve their, their learning uh, goals. This is the end of the presentation. And any questions are welcome. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Soror Ongur, for your presentation. And now we're going to listen to my presentation entitled The Correlation Between Motivational Teaching Strategies and Self Efficacy Among Foreign Language Learners. I am extremely pleased to participate in this international conference. My presentation is entitled The Correlation Between Motivational Teaching Strategies and Self-Efficacy Among Foreign Language Learners, the case of second-year students of English at the University of Qasim Erbah, Wargla. 
Before I start, I would like to thank everybody who contributed to the success of this event, namely the scientific committee and the organizing committee for their efforts and time, and all the participants for their valuable contributions. As a matter of fact, the published works related to the field of education during the last decade of the 19th century and on highlighted the importance of affective factors in language learning and put a lot of weight on motivation. They also emphasize on the fact that the learners' efforts and desires along with their attitudes towards language learning are of a salient influence. In the current research, we put under scrutiny motivational teaching strategies as a way that may help in enhancing foreign language learners' self-efficacy, facilitating the foreign language learning and making it more interesting and enjoyable. Before discussing the main aims of this uh, research, I believe it is important to define the keywords. According to Giotto and Dornay, motivational teaching strategies are instructional inventions applied by the teacher to elicit and stimulate students' motivation. In simpler terms, motivational teaching strategies represent the strategies that teachers use to enhance motivation within the learners. And according to Bandura, Self-efficacy refers to the belief in one's capabilities to organize and execute the courses of action required to produce given attainments. In other words, self-efficacy is the individual's belief in his or her capacities to succeed in a specific task. Accordingly, several teaching motivational strategies were suggested, yet only two frameworks are tackled here because of their relation to the educational field. A target's mnemonic framework and Dorney's framework. To start with, a target's mnemonic framework for motivational strategies. By targets uh, is an acronym that refers to tasks, autonomy, recognition, grouping, evaluation, time, and social support. Targets, in fact, are variables that teachers may use to motivate their students. The first letter in targets mnemonic stands for tasks. Tasks actually denote the manner uh, that tasks and activities are presented. The second letter refers to autonomy. Autonomy represents the various alternatives that students have in relation to the task to be performed. The third letter corresponds to recognition. Recognition refers to the acknowledgement and rewards the students get when succeeding in accomplishing the task at hand. The fourth letter symbolizes grouping. As its name indicates, grouping refers to the way learners are grouped to perform a given task. The fifth letter stands for evaluation. In brief, evaluation refers to assessment. The sixth letter represents time. Time refers to the period that learners take in mastering a specific task. Armrard suggested another dimension that is social support which refers to the supportive and caring atmosphere generated in the classroom when performing the task at hand. The second framework is Dornay's framework of motivational strategies. Dornay and Caesar carried out a study in Hungary where they evaluated a list of 51 motivational strategies indicating how important they considered the techniques to be and how frequently they actually implemented them. Consistent with the obtained results, the researchers put forward a list of the 10 most salient macro strategies that they named 10 commandments for motivating language learners. And they are summarized here.
Set a personal example with your own behavior, create a pleasant, relaxed atmosphere in the classroom, present the tasks properly, develop a good relationship with the learners, increase the learner's linguistic self-confidence, make the language classes interesting, promote learner's autonomy, personalize the learning process, increase the learner's goal-orientedness, familiarize the learners with the target language culture. In 2001, Dornay proposed a theory-based framework that he summarized in terms of four major dimensions to accommodate the aforementioned macro-strategies. 1. Creating the basic motivational conditions through setting up a fine teacher-learner relationship, creating an agreeable and supportive atmosphere in the classroom, and establishing a cohesive learner group with appropriate group norms. 2. Generating initial motivation through using relevant strategies that increase the learner's expectancy of success and enhance their goal-orientedness. 3. Maintaining the pro and protecting motivation through using stimulating and pleasant tasks that create the learner's autonomy and protecting the learner's self-esteem and maintaining their self-image. 4. Encouraging positive retrospective self-evaluation by promoting motivational attributions, providing motivational feedback, increasing learner self-satisfaction, and offering rewards. After having explained the keywords, we move now to the aim of, the, of this research. The present research aims at exploring the relationship between motivational teaching strategies and their role in promoting self-efficacy among foreign language learners. It is hypothesized that the more practically motivational teaching strategies are implemented in foreign language classes, the more learners' self-efficacy is fostered. With the intention of meeting up with the researcher's aims, a descriptive correlational design is adopted. It intends to describe and identify the correlation between the two variables, the motivational teaching strategies as the independent variable, and self-efficacy is the dependent variable. Data was gathered by means of the observational design and a formal questionnaire. Uh, in an oral expression class, motivational teaching strategies were implemented and student self-efficacy was observed. Then, the questionnaire was administered to a sample of 82nd year students of English at the Department of Letters and English Language at the University of Qasim Erbah, Warkla. The results of the present research show a positive significant correlation between the two variables, that is, the motivational teaching strategies do foster foreign language learners' self-efficacy a fact that the sample of students who contributed in answering the questionnaire highlighted. On the basis of the obtained results, it is confirmed that motivational teaching strategies promote foreign language learner self-efficacy. The obtained results are also are in the direction of many studies that highlighted the significant role uh, that motivational teaching strategies have on foreign language learners' self-efficacy. Here is the list of references that I used to do this work. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Uh, well, after having listened to my presentation, we're moving uh, immediately to listen to Ms. Hanan uh, Sayhib's uh, presentation.
um, entitled uh, Professional Development of English Language Teachers, Present Situation of Biscara University. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Halimi and uh, the University of uh, Qasdi Mabah uh, Wergla for giving us this opportunity to participate in this uh, uh, conference, this virtual international conference. My presentation is uh, under the title Professional Development of English Language Teachers, Present Situation of Biskra University. The contents. So, this slide is divided into uh, three main points. The introduction, the literature review, and the research questions, methods, results, and the uh, discussion. Introduction. Professional development is very important since education is an ever-growing and ever-changing field. In other words, uh, introduction. Professional development is very important since education is an ever-growing and ever-changing field. In other words, teachers must be lifelong learners in order to teach each new group of students and professional development is then a requirement for all teachers. So professional development, so it, is, it does not stop uh, by the end of getting a certificate. So getting a certifi certificate, it does not mean that uh, we are professional. So professional are uh, to be professional it's not a case of certificates uh, to be professional it means uh, to not to stop not stopping to uh, to develop to learn so learning does not stop with the certificates uh, professional development it is a lifelong learning and all teachers must be a long or lifelong learners so uh, Professional development, uh, it means that uh, we are able to uh, manipulate, we are able to uh, be up to date, we are able to be uh, to cope with the, the, the changes, to cope with the, the, the recent changes, the recent uh, developments and advances in the use of technology, the use of different sources, teaching sources to uh, present to deliver the lesson so for a language teacher professional development is not uh, just like this so it is based on three main points language which is related to the teacher the classroom management ability also to the teacher and the ways of teaching and this depends on the knowledge of the teacher so language in terms of language the teacher shouldn't stop uh, learning the English language especially when talking about English language. So we don't stop with just learning uh, during, uh, of course, the preparation for the, certificate, uh, for the certificate, but we don't stop. So learning the foreign language, it is not uh, just restricted to four years or three years or five years, but it is uh, for a long time, for our lifetime. So language, uh, a teacher, foreign language teacher, should be a good, uh, if you can say, uh, he is a, a representative of the English language that he is a teacher. So he is a representative of native speakers. So he must be up to date. He must be a good language user because he is a model for his students. Also, classroom manage, uh, management abilities. Nowadays, when I talk about classroom, we have the virtual classroom and we have the face-to-face -face classroom. So the teacher here must uh, know how to use the classroom uh, equipment, the classroom uh, materials, and how to organize his students and how to, uh, of course, to cope with, to, uh, to deal with large classes, small classes, and how to... Uh, use uh, of course how to present a lecture and how to present uh, uh, a lesson with a, sm uh, a small number of uh, students i mean 
with a, a small size uh, class and so on and so forth so classroom management abilities it is part of the teaching uh, quality or the teacher's quality so if the teacher uh, is able to uh, to use to, to to manipulate the classroom in order to uh, provide a comfortable uh, environment for learning this is a, this means that he is really professional uh, the ways of teaching the ways of teaching normally the teacher here uh, must master all the techniques of, of teaching uh, all the methods of teaching uh, to uh, to know how to teach uh, writing how to teach speaking how to teach uh, vocabulary grammar and so on so he must master all the techniques and methods of teaching in order to manipulate uh, different types of uh, students I mean with learning the different learning styles uh, of course uh, uh, which method to use in order to teach a certain lesson and another lesson and so on and so forth so the teacher must be able to use different techniques of teaching to manipulate the classroom and to manage the classroom and to use uh, the English language uh, fluently and accurately so planning teachers professional develop normally um, the teachers uh, professional development can be planned by him, by the teacher, or by the policy makers. Uh, all teachers should have a professional development plan uh, and actively work on achieving the goals that they have identified. So the teacher mustn't stop with the certificate, but he must develop his own, uh, his own qualities, his own skills. So uh, how? We have uh, plenty of uh, ways to uh, to develop our professional skills by peer observation for example peer observation it is a uh, of course it is a planning it is a it's a way to develop our uh, professional skills uh, peer observation i can attend with my uh, colleagues during the class so uh, and i see uh, the different techniques that my colleagues are using especially who are more experienced than me uh, also ongoing training programs that can be online and that can be face to face uh, presented by the government or you pay to uh, to do them also specify uh, specify career goals so for me i have to specify my career goals especially when talking about uh, my course design when i design the course i'm going to uh, to design also the goals these goals are parts of my career and i'm going to uh, arrive at them uh, of course based on what I'm going to teach uh, via that uh, modules sharing discussion and knowledge here can be informed of uh, if you can say a forum or a kind of uh, a study days conferences so these kinds of meetings can help us develop our professional skills social media is also another way for example the use of uh, YouTube the use of uh, Facebook uh, etc so we can exchange uh, experience and we can develop also experience and nowadays uh, this social media can be a source for uh, learning a foreign language also assess uh, their present ability and their needs so the teacher must know what he needs uh, and what he is able to do what you need and what you are able to do so the teacher must evaluate himself by himself or from his uh, students measuring the progress so this is a, a part of it so we measure our progress if i am good i need more uh, training and so on and so forth producing producing is very important this is, this is a way to evaluate to measure our progress so producing by reading more and by writing so these two main skills are very important to develop professional skills gathering information so the teacher mustn't stop uh, learning from here and there and not restricted only to foreign english uh, foreign language but also he can uh, of course enrich his own knowledge from 
uh, different sources in from other disciplines okay and of course this training can be as I said before can be face-to-face -face, uh, plans or online uh, of course uh, uh, training programs literature review here uh, we have plenty of uh, works uh, talking about uh, professional development literature review what was written about it we have many uh, things written about it so I have selected this uh, uh, this uh, of course um, uh, which is very restricted it is a program for teaching or for developing professional uh, skills uh, no matter how good pre-service training for teachers is it cannot be expected to prepare teachers for all the challenges they will face throughout their careers education systems therefore seek to provide teachers with opportunities for in-service professional developments in order to maintain a high standard of teaching and to retain a high quality teacher workforce so if you train a teacher to be professional you are going to provide for the students uh, a high quality teaching workforce a high uh, quality classroom okay and high quality graduated students because it is very important so uh, the professional development is very important and it is urgently necessary so another uh, another uh, quote uh, related to uh, professional developments it says that uh, here there is a comparative review on teachers uh, noted in uh, OECD uh, in 2005 this is a program for teachers uh, for teachers professional development uh, it says that effective professional development is an ongoing includes is ongoing it is non-stop okay uh, includes training practice and feedback so professional development it is not restricted to training programs but also on practicing in the classroom and also to give feedback about the practice if it is workable or not and provides adequate time and follow-up support adequate time so not in one week or two weeks but for a long period of time and at the same time we uh, uh, provided by a follow-up follow support successful programs involve teachers in learning activities that are similar to ones they will use with their students and encourage the development of teachers learning uh, communities teachers learning communities so his students and uh, his uh, colleagues uh, uh, there is growing interest in developing schools as learning organizations and in ways for teachers to share their expertise and experience more systematically and this is what we hope that uh, we are going to find here in the, Alger in the Algerian situation now we move to the present situation of Biscoe University. Exploring the situation of the English language teachers of Biscoe University, research questions. We have how is the situation of professional development for English language teachers of Biscoe University? This is normally the main question of this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, what are the challenges facing them? And the sample was a non probability convenience sample of in service teachers of Biscoe University, and the method is, uh, of course, exploratory method research. Uh, and normally the tool we use is the closer open questionnaire so the results and discussion in service teachers in Biscay University face increasing difficulties in their career and shortage in the chance the chance of uh, or to develop their profession so uh, here in this case we, when we talk about um, the case of, of Biscay which is also the case of uh, the Algerian universities in service teachers in Biscay University, they face increasing difficulties in their career, especially in terms of the larger, larger classes. This is the first point. Uh, the, the level of students, the multi-leveled, okay? uh, also the shortage to, to have a chance. They don't have a chance to, uh, to develop their profession due to this, uh, if you can say, uh, this 
large amount of tasks to be done uh, during the class okay so uh, and due to the larger classes uh, we are facing a problem concerning the uh, developments of our profession okay and this is the case for all the other universities as as you know the amount of professional development programs that the teachers receive differs from the recently recruited teachers and the ancient ones here uh, as you know the recently recruited teachers they have an opportunity to be trained for a longer for for one year for one year and then to be an in-service teacher okay so there is uh, so uh, this recently recruited they have a chance to to develop especially the web skills yes the ancient ones they don't have this chance uh, so uh, there is no balance between the two uh, the two if you can say generations uh, the early recruited teachers received no professional development programs so they get the certificate and they start directly working and this is not the case for the, the recently recruited the teachers yes they get the job and they start working but under control okay so this made uh, it a bit uh, difficult for the teachers who uh, uh, have the experience but they don't have the the professional uh, skills okay uh, the present situation opposes completely the new demands which are imposed uh, on English language teachers due to the rapid change of students population so we have a large number of students uh, coming each year and each year and the continuing educational reforms okay uh, we are imposed to uh, to to work uh, using uh, the Moodle platform uh, to uh, uh, to present um, certain um, programs okay so this ed new ed continuing educational reforms needs also uh, professional development programs and the change in national centers of teaching and learning specifically are uh, especially uh, by the integration of electronic platforms uh, like uh, Moodle so these results or these answers so this the, the, the teachers they've shown uh, based on this questionnaire they have shown that they want or they need teaching, uh, teaching uh, or training programs, professional development uh, programs, to plan professional development programs. So uh, this is normally based on the responses of uh, the teachers of this universe. So the responses in conclusion, uh, responses of English language, uh, uh, teachers of this universe suggest that or suggest their need not just for better support for teachers to participate in professional development but for policy makers to ensure the development opportunities that are available and effective and which meet their careers needs the present work recommends the following professional development in Biskra as well as all the major universities needs further investigation and procedures before doing procedures there should be a certain investigation to know the situation then to know what we need and what are the targeted uh, if you can say uh, what is the target of this uh, uh, program second the situation urges effective professional development program urges effective professional development program to promote especially online teaching skills so these days uh, for for from uh, for uh, training as they are uh, proposed uh, are not sufficient we need more more time uh, we need more uh, procedures more programs to train the, the, the teachers to use online teaching skills and face-to-face uh, -face teaching skills too, in order to cope with the global changes uh, and especially during this global pandemic uh, we found ourselves in a dilemma especially those who don't know how to use these platforms 
they found plenty of difficulties to present or to deliver or to upload their courses just uploading PDF or Word documents equal opportunities should be given to all in-service teachers whether recently or early recruited ones thank you very much for watching and for your patience Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we're going to listen to Dr. Asma Nisba from uh, the University of Lwet uh, with a presentation entitled Promoting the Continuous Professional Development in the Algerian EFL Context. Hospitality in the world, which we perspective and challenges, reinvestigating the reality of English language. My presentation is entitled uh, Promoting the Can. What trends? A methodology, the results and discussion, okay, recommendations, and finally a conclusion. A professional development refers to many types of educational experiences related to an individual's work. University teachers participate in professional development to learn and apply new knowledge and skills that will improve their performance on the job. The current study aims at investigating the different continuous professional development modes utilized by the Algerian University EFL teachers so as to update their teaching methods and professional knowledge to fit the novelties in their subject specialties. The study seeks to answer the following research questions. First, why do university teachers need professional development? Second, is the university teachers ongoing learning compulsory or voluntary? Third, what are the different continuous professional development modes utilized by the university teachers? Unlike EFL teachers in the sector of education, like the middle and the high schools, who are subject to regular different forms of in-service compulsory training supervised by inspectors, the higher education EFL teachers receive little or no official continuous professional development training. Accordingly, Algerian EFL university teachers assume the responsibility of promoting their continuous professional development. For the methodology, the study used a questionnaire as a data gathering tool. It was administered to 20 participants who are EFL university teachers exercising in those al -Wed and Biskra universities. The results reveal that teachers resort to continuous professional development in a self-directed choice uh, resulted from their uh, consciousness about the significant changes related to EFL in a digitalized world, uh, where in English language becomes an indispensable tool for academic and professional achievement of its learners. The majority of them did not receive any official pre-service teacher training. Thus, they engaged in both formal and informal modes of continuous professional development so as to gain expertise that enable them to master new competencies in the pedagogy and the content of their specialties. As for the formal modes of continuous professional development, all teachers confirm that attending and participating in conferences, seminars, and workshops is of great benefit to them. 
informally develop and renew their knowledge. According to them, the informal mode of uh, continuous professional development is also very supportive. It is utilized by consulting colleagues with advanced teaching experiences or seeking support by joining, uh, okay, by joining forums and uh, online groups. Finally, the study ends up with recommendations for decision makers to schedule regular compulsory training courses, especially to novice less experienced teachers. Suggestions were also made to support teachers to engage in all modes of continuous professional development because the continuous uh, professional development does not only enhance their performance but it also raises the student's uh, achievement. To conclude with, we can say that raising teachers' awareness about the importance of having regular continuous professional development programs will facilitate their educational purposes as well as providing clear ideas about its functioning. The professional continuous development is not only restricted to novice teachers, it is also of great importance to experienced teachers, since they confront new challenges each year, including, uh, uh, including changes in subject content, new instructional methods, advances in technology, uh, changes laws, procedures, and student learning needs. This was my presentation. Thank you so much for your kind uh, attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Esman Nisba. As you noticed, everybody, uh, the voice was barely heard. We apologize for uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Nisba. I hope you could uh, read the uh, the presentation um, on your screens. Well, now we're moving to Mr. Hisham Abdelwafi from Universitat Internacional de, de Cul Catalunya and Ms. Atika Dhimesh from uh, Université de Jean Jaurès, Toulouse, de, with the presentation entitled The Role of Songs in Improving University Learners' Vocabulary and Pronunciation in French and English. Oh, yeah. I think we can see a PowerPoint, but Okay. Mr. Hisham, if you are here, please, uh, we would like you to present 
uh, live if you want, because there is a technical problem with your presentation. We could not hear anything. Uh, or uh, Miss Atika Bhimish, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, thank you. We're going to uh, show the presentation and then you may uh, explain, please. Okay, okay. Or you may, or you may share your screen with us. Okay, uh, just give me a second to share my screen. Yes, please. Okay. Just give me a second, sorry for being. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Is it okay now? Hello? It's clear, I think it's clear. Okay. Yes, so, yes. Okay, so um, the title uh, or our presentation is about the role of songs in improving university learners' vocabulary and pronunciation in French and English languages. So to start, let's talk about um, the 21st century where the teaching and the learning is becoming more and more creatively developed. So um, if we talk about the generation, uh, which, uh, which is witnessing a new era in different domains, thanks to technology, we include the teaching and the learning process, which keeps updated and developed through time. Many methodologies came and keep coming to the foreign language classrooms life, such as using games, movies, pictures, and even songs. So these methodologies are emerged to enhance the learner's foreign language, motivate the learner, facilitate tasks for both teacher and the learner, and to make the target language last forever. Okay, why we use song? We are all touched by uh, songs in a way or another. Uh, in different way, our ears receive songs daily everywhere we go, like we find it on a radio, uh, cars, buses, supermarkets, and everywhere. They are even used as a therapy and uh, surgeries to help doctors relaxing and even to help uh, patients. Like Timothy said, in our time, it is hard to escape music and songs as it occupies even more of the words around us in operating theaters, restaurants and cafes, shopping malls, at sports events, in our cars and literally it's everywhere. It would seem that the only place music and songs is slow to catch on is in schools. Songs and the brains. Scientifically uh, speaking, uh, every human's brain is divided into two parts. Okay, let's talk first about uh, an experiment about um, uh, a few years ago, an 11 years old girl who suddenly got a brain stroke and lost her ability to speak completely. One of her therapists used to uh, use the method which called the melodic intonation therapy. So where this uh, therapist asked the little girl, which is named L'Oreal, uh, he asked her to, um, excuse me for the noise, I'm working. So he asked her to uh, sing her words instead of speaking, how that works. Scientifically speaking, as I said, human's brain is made of two hemispheres. The left hemisphere, which is related to logical things like language and math, etc., And we have the right one, which includes... Uh, creativity like music, emotion, and so on. So what the doctor did was moving the language from the left to the right hemisphere. 
so uh, he moved the language, as I said, from the left to the right hemisphere, and he asked the girl to sing her words instead of speaking. In other words, he asked her to compose her speech in melodies in, instead of just speaking like I'm doing right now. Okay, and by time and hard work, this little girl is able to speak again. So this theory or this experiment has proved that um, language can help, sorry, can be helped, sorry, um, by music to be learned and to be able to speak and so on. Adults and learning. There are always some debates on whether adults' second language acquisition is easy or not. So some researchers believe that adults' second language acquisition is easy. However, some other researchers have proposed the opposite view. They said that adult second language acquisition is not easy as children's native language acquisition. This is what Fei and Kuizu said in their theory and practice in language studies. Some uh, songs to improve adults' foreign language pronunciation and vocabulary. We all cross in adults, at least, with headphone and mobile or uh, any smartphone using songs expression in their conversation. So this generation is really infected by songs and singers. You, we, we see them speak, dress, walk, and behave just like their favorite ones, singers. Okay, so recent research studies point that motivation is needed to get students' attention. And since this letter is motivated by songs, so why not to make it a way to teach and learn foreign languages? How it works. By using songs, uh, we are bringing songs to the foreign language classes to help both teacher and the learners. Uh, playing songs helps to get students' attention at the same time to motivate them learning or to learn and practice uh, participate in the classes when we are talking about their favorite songs or about their favorite singers. So we find them um, trying to express themselves and to talk and to have a debate. No, he's talking about that, not that message, etc. And so here we are creating a good atmosphere and we are creating a debate between the learners and even the teacher. Why not? So it helps to improve the student's pronunciation by imitating the singer's native uh, speaker. So we are learning from the source. That's the point. Develops the student's listening and speaking skills, even reading and writing. By listening to the songs, they are working their ears to distinguish and understand speech with different accents. Uh, because we know that American uh, accent, it's not the same as British. It's not the same as the French accent. French people do not speak English the same as uh, British, American, Algerian, etc. So this is um, how to work. Learning and memorizing new vocabularies at ease and they last forever. And it also motivates students to use their dictionaries or even translate into their mother tongue language, etc. So they do researches. Okay, learning to uh, learning the spoken English or French, using vocabulary in different contexts. Here I gave an example of the word heads, which uh, may have different uh, meanings. If we use it, uh, for example, if uh, we use it in the song of Hit the Road Jack, the singer here want to say leave and get away. Hit means to leave and get away. When the same word means difference, Thing, different thing, sorry, in a different song where the singer said, never hit so hard in love. Here, she means that never fall in love like this before. So we see the same word has different meaning with different contexts. Okay, uh, our study, in our study, we uh, made uh, some questionnaires or two questionnaires. One of them concerns the French students and learning English. The second one concerns the Algerian students and learning the French language. Some responses of uh, or obtained from these questionnaires. We see here listening to songs uh, where uh, was 100% uh, positive when 19% uh, react positively to songs. When they are listening to songs, they find themselves, for example, singing or uh, attracted to uh, the song when 100% uh, said yes. When we asked them about uh, whether the songs help their pronunciation to to enhance or to be um, or to to be corrected, 90% said yes. 
and songs using songs in their conversation 170 percent said that uh, yes we do use expressions or words from uh, songs in their or in our uh, daily conversation and when we ask them about um, using songs in the classroom 100 percent said yes and for the french language learners 18 percent said yes we need songs in our foreign language classrooms and um, for choosing which one uh, to listen to songs or teachers 18 to or 70 to 80 percent said yes we prefer to learn from a song rather to listen uh, to our teachers and when we ask them about what they want to learn more street language or dialect language uh, or academic one 70 percent we prefer to uh, learn um, the dialect language because uh, they need it in their daily life when they can communicate with foreigners okay the results obtained from the survey of students conclude that learners support the idea of using songs in foreign languages classes. They, they find, sorry, they find that this method helps to better pronunciation and to learn more uh, vocabulary with the, the culture from its context in a short time and a motivating way, and it lasts forever. So songs have to deal with teaching, learning foreign languages in all sorts. They help to enrich and develop all the learners' skills like listening, speaking, reading, writing, and even the cultural sides of the, uh, the, um, the learner, sorry. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we're glad that you were uh, able to uh, present it now. Uh, we gave the opportunity to uh, our dear audience to listen to your interesting presentation. Thank you again. Thank you, and I'm sorry uh, for disturbing you, okay? It's okay, it's very okay, thank you. Uh, we're moving now to Mohammed, uh, to Dr. Mohamed Rafiq Fadel from the University of Constantine One. Uh, we're going to listen to his presentation that is entitled Promoting Soft Skills Within a Competency-Based Teacher Education Framework. Think it up and innovate. Thank you. University of Constantine. My presentation is about promoting soft skills within a competency-based teacher education framework. Think it up and uh, innovate. The statement of the problem in our study concerns the role of the teacher in the 21st century, which uh, consists uh, of being uh, no more a source of knowledge, but a uh, teacher who develops cooperation, collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking and creativity. This role has developed to be more challenging, requiring teachers to demonstrate not only academic and hard skills, but soft skills uh, as well. We aim through uh, this study uh, to promote the notion of soft skills in EFL teacher training and to provide teachers with a practical procedure to enhance problem solving and creative teaching in future teachers of English, enabling them to resist stress and uh, collaboration. Our review of literature concerns mostly the concept of soft skills. So what are these soft skills? They are character traits, uh, attitudes and behaviors rather than technical aptitude or knowledge. Uh, the definition we can give about soft skills is that uh, they are non-technical skills that relate to the field work. These non-academic skills include uh, how you interact with colleagues, uh, how you solve problems and innovate, how you manage your work and uh, resist stress, and how you collaborate in a teamwork. Uh, there are three categories of uh, soft skills. Uh, the first category concerns uh, the personal skills. How do you function as an independent person? Uh, the second category, social skills. How do you function as a social being? And the third category, methodical skills, uh, about how do you deal with uh, colleagues? Uh, 
different uh, soft skills uh, can be integrated within uh, these uh, three uh, categories uh, among them responsibility motivation uh, uh, being a team player uh, knowledge of human nature stress resistance problem solving and presentation skills uh, soft skills in education are important for teachers uh, because they help them make their classes more interesting uh, they make them serve as an example for the students they interact with students at their own level, they enable them to be good leaders, and they make them much more approachable. They allow them as well to be sensitive to the needs uh, of uh, the learners, because there is a complaint nowadays about university graduates and uh, teachers who are very often not ready for employment because Regardless uh, of their level of expertise, they lack the soft uh, basic skills, the forces of the 21st century, namely communication, collaboration, critical thinking and uh, creativity, which students uh, need uh, to improve and mostly by observing their uh, teachers. Soft skills in the field of EFL uh, teacher training. <coughs> Uh, concerned the demands of the 21st century in the FL classroom where uh, more uh, challenging tasks for language teachers and uh, performing these tasks requires developing many new uh, skills and uh, the teacher is mostly uh, asked to be like a Mr. Gadget uh, who has uh, all the necessary tools and means and who is always ready to solve any problematic situation Creating a better environment for developing uh, these soft skills requires shifting training to be student-centered. The activities uh, we can include uh, in the classroom to develop uh, soft skills and for an effective implementation in the FL context are task-based and problem-solving activities, group work involving discussions and debates, delivering oral and poster presentations, role plays and dialogues, and mostly jobs related tasks so uh, learning through teaching uh, this is what we have to do getting students to learn through teaching uh, has been found as an effective approach for developing soft skills because using learning by teaching techniques uh, the teacher trainer can help the students develop the three types of soft skills the personal the social and the methodical in uh, our research, uh, we designed uh, a lesson where the aim uh, was to promote problem solving and creativity as soft skills in students. This uh, action research was within a competency-based education framework in a teaching methodology classroom. The activities the students uh, engaged in were to make them prepared for any eventual school environment and to boost their innovative thinking once they become teachers. The population uh, we uh, had under exploration in our action research were pre-service middle school teachers at the teacher training school of Constantine. There were 25 trainees who attended the lesson, which uh, included the procedure adopted to help the students uh, develop soft skills through a problematic uh, teaching situation. The different steps of the lesson uh, are spotlighted embracing a contrastive approach to teacher training. So the challenge was the preparation of a lesson B where students uh, must confront an unexpected problematic situation showing adaptability, critical thinking, resilience and problem solving. The problem to solve uh, is uh, once at school you are advised that uh, there will be a power cut during the whole session. Think of a plan B to remedy for this uh, situation. And uh, all this was adopting a competency-based uh, methodology where the students had to reconsider their scenarios of their lessons. They had to uh, go through problem-based learning procedures, uh, learn through self-structural -il situations, work in collaborations, engage in self-directed learning, and uh, reflect on the effectiveness of their strategies. Uh, they developed problem-solving, self-directed learning, and effective collaboration. So they had to think it up and innovate. We uh, put uh, an evaluation sheet at the end uh, of uh, the lesson where uh, we had to check the validity of our lesson by collecting uh, the pre-service teachers' attitudes. We uh, set uh, five uh, statements uh, to uh, evaluate uh, the lesson and uh, check its uh, validity. The first uh, 
statement, uh, the lesson was satisfactory to uh, your needs as future teachers. The majority of teachers, 89%, uh, uh, agreed that, that uh, their needs were satisfied. The second statement, the lesson had a positive impact on your uh, skills. The same thing, 88% uh, of the students uh, agreed about uh, this uh, fact. Only 11 uh, neutral uh, responses and one student to disagreed. We can understand that uh, this student was uh, really unwilling to participate in the lesson. The skills you developed uh, best uh, were leadership, creativity, problem solving, critical thinking, stress resistance. Of course, uh, problem solving had the highest uh, Rate and they came after critical thinking and creative teaching. These uh, soft skills were uh, very obvious uh, in the study, while uh, leadership resistance, resistance and analytical skills did not uh, have very high uh, rates, uh, though uh, they were developed by the students. Uh, the fourth statement, uh, you know uh, what soft skills are about. The majority of the students uh, agreed about uh, that uh, fact. And the fifth statement, soft skills are very important uh, in uh, teacher education. We notice uh, that only 8% eight, uh, eight percent of the students uh, were neutral. We can understand uh, that uh, these uh, students did not really get uh, the uh, idea about uh, soft skills and their implementation. Where we maybe these uh, did not uh, develop yet and they require more training. While uh, the majority, uh, the vast majority of the learners uh, expressed uh, their agreement uh, with the fact that soft skills are important in teacher training. The role of uh, training is so important so for students' skills, mainly soft skills through uh, reflection, designing lessons that match up with their preoccupations and uh, with uh, real situations. The sample lesson was in accordance with competency-based education and the aim was not to teach about these skills but to stimulate critical thinking and creative teaching in uh, students. Uh, we can conclude uh, our presentation by saying that promoting soft skills in teacher education within a competency-based framework uh, became a necessity to promote uh, teacher training and teacher trainers uh, should consider it in their practices. Integrating soft skills does not mean that we have to add a new topic, uh, but we can teach them just embedded in the existing tasks and assignments uh, to develop both the academic and the professional knowledge necessary for the development of the competent uh, teacher. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Fadel, for your presentation. Uh, we're glad that we're that you are part of this uh, international conference. Dr. Zori uh, Adrid is passing, is sending her regards to you. Well, we move to uh, we close our session with the presentation of Dr. Amina Omrani from the University of Wargla. Uh, her presentation is entitled The Challenges of Implementing Cooperative Learning Instruction in the EFL University Classroom. Title: The Challenges of Implementing Cooperative Learning Instruction in the EFL University Classroom. In spite of the various teaching theories, methods and techniques that appeared within the last decade, university teaching seems to be locked in the traditional lecturing mode. Lately, many of the modern teaching methods such as collaborative, active and cooperative learning have proved their efficacy at both theoretical and academic levels. However, researchers assert that EFL University teachers still show resistance and reluctance to abandon the traditional lecture mode and shift to cooperative learning. In fact, teachers' reluctance towards using cooperative and active learning activities in their courses is due to the numerous challenges that they face when trying to implement these activities in their teaching. 
Therefore, the present paper is an attempt to, anal to analyze the existing challenges that hamper the effective implementation of cooperative learning instruction in the EFL University classroom. It also aims at providing EFL teachers with practical teaching strategies for an effective implementation of cooperative learning in the EFL classroom. We first start by defining cooperative learning. Cooperative learning is an instruction that involves students working in small carefully structured groups to achieve a common goal with the aim of maximizing their own and each other's learning. And in order to term a teaching instruction as cooperative, it should meet the five pillars of cooperative learning which are positive interdependence, individual accountability, face-to-face -face promotive interaction, interpersonal and small group skills, and finally group processing. Now we move to the challenges that EFL teachers face when trying to implement cooperative learning in their courses. First, lack of motivation and interest. In fact, most of the problems in implementing cooperative learning in the EFL university class spring out from the unwillingness of teachers to switch from the classical lecture mode to cooperative learning environment, believing that cooperative learning is an instruction suitable only for primary or secondary school classes. Second, classroom management issues. The second reason that leads to the marginalization of cooperative learning in the university classroom is the instructor's fear that when implementing cooperative learning, they will lose control of the class, of the class by giving a margin of freedom to their students. Moreover, individual student resistance and dysfunctional teams may worsen the situation and lead the teachers to abandon using CL instruction and any other type of active learning activities in their classes. Furthermore, when using group work, the classroom is far from being quiet. Thus, some teachers prefer the classic lecture mode where they have a complete control of the class and the classroom environment is generally calm. Third, time management issues. Another factor that makes instructors hesitate to use cooperative learning is the coverage problem. As many instructors avoid using cooperative learning or any other active learning techniques, which they consider time consuming and their adoption risks the coverage of the, the content in the syllabus and depend mainly on classical lectures, which they find time saving and helpful for finishing the program. Lessons preparation. Lessons preparation is another reason why university instructors avoid implementing cooperative learning in their classes, since the time devoted for lessons preparation will automatically increase with the adoption of new teaching techniques. And this can be tiring and time consuming for instructors who already have many university related tasks to fulfill. Moreover, the rejection of using cooperative learning instruction increases when the, the instructor is familiar with the module and he or she already has all the lectures prepared and has already dealt with all the lessons. In addition, some teachers have other issues that are related to students' assessment and evaluation as these two operations become more difficult when students work in groups. Another issue is the lack of teachers and students training on using CL. 
training teachers and students on CL instruction before its integration in the EFN university classroom is of paramount importance because teachers who are not acquainted with using CL instruction may face difficulties when implementing it for the first time in their classes. And the same applies to students who are not trained to work cooperatively. All in all, it is evident that asking students to work in groups and providing some cooperative learning structures and activities will not ensure the success of the learning process, as the effective functioning of CL lies on a clear program of teaching where both the, the teacher and the students play crucial roles. Hence, the researcher suggests the following strategies to facilitate the effective implementation of cooperative learning in the EFL University classroom. First, training. Training students to work together is a fundamental factor for the success of cooperative group work. This view is validated by the empirical studies that investigated the importance of group training for the effective functioning of groups. Also, training teachers on the procedures needed to implement cooperative small group learning in their classroom is also crucial for the success of CL process. Moreover, the way teachers form cooperative learning groups has a great impact on the functioning of the groups and the teacher's control of the classroom. Hence, there are two important factors that should be taken into consideration when forming CL groups. First, the size of the group, which plays an important role in the process of cooperative learning and determines the extent to which group work will be effective. Hence, the teacher is required to select the optimal size of the group that preferably should not exceed four students since crowded groups can cause many problems. Second, group composition is another important factor that affects the process and the product of a cooperative learning groups. Thus, in CR classroom, students have to be involved in heterogeneous groups that are diverse in terms of students' academic ability, social skills, attitudes, personality, gender, and race. assigning students with different roles. Generally, when students are asked to work together in cooperative learning groups, they may feel confused as they do not know what they should do exactly. And sometimes they argue about who should be doing a particular task. Therefore, giving them specific tasks or functions to do within the group will make the group work more organized and will help students assume responsibility for their own actions. Hence, there are many rules that could be given to students working in the same group. For instance, a student can be a leader, an expert, source manager, a reporter, a noise monitor, or a timekeeper. In the CL class, the type of task that teachers give to their students determines the type and quality of interaction. Therefore, when they opt for cooperative learning instruction, teachers should choose activities that are applicable within the, this instruction, such as role plays, debates, panel, discussions, cooperative writing, games, work at the board, and etc. Finally, cooperative incentive structure. Cooperative incentive structure, also known as reward structure, is a significant tool for promoting students' motivation and increasing their engagement in the learning content. Thus, it should be clearly fixed before forming the groups. The reward structure is an effective method to motivate students and teachers can choose from a variety of incentives such as marks, gifts, symbolic rewards that are distributed equally among members of the group depending on the entire group's output. In conclusion, inviting EFL university teachers 
to implement cooperative learning in their classes is not a call to abandon lecturing, yet it is an initiative to try a new teaching instruction that was approved by many scholars as effective and suitable for different disciplines, and to apply it in their classes to maximize learning, create a peaceful cooperative learning environment, and enhance students' academic achievement. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Emina, for your uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your uh, presentations. They were really interesting. I would like to thank you for your efforts and time. Uh, and I am extremely pleased for having chaired the, uh, this session that is uh, entitled Promoting Innovative Teaching in EFL Classes. I would like to invite you, um, if you have any questions to the participants, please do not hesitate to send us your uh, questions or comments. You are, you are welcome. If you have questions, please do raise your hands. Um, yes, uh, Arkad. Yeah. Yes, please. Welcome. I have a question. Yes, please. The, the, the fifth presentation by Miss Atika Dehimesh. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. Yes. Uh, it is true that songs can uh, help improve uh, vocabulary and pronunciation. And I personally uh, use this strategy. But I have an issue uh, that I would like to, to raise. In some songs, singers or artists use very informal language or slang. Uh, I am wondering if this cannot be any impediment to the progress of uh, students writing and uh, uh, listening or speaking in academic settings. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. Miss um, Dr. Atika, please. Are you here? Yes. Um, we're waiting for you to uh, answer the question of uh, our colleague Arkat. Are you here? Mm. No. Well, she's not here. Uh, we hope that she's going to join us and uh, provide you with the uh, with the answer. Never mind. Yes, thank you very much. Dr. Fadel, how are you? Uh, we could not hear you. Hello, Reem, how are you? How are Good you evening. doing? Nice to see you. My greetings nice to Toria. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, he's sending you his regards back. Yes, she's uh, she's, coming. she's coming to say hi. Yes. Hello, everybody. Dr. Yassine, Col Madame Colway. Hi, thank you so much and good morning. Hello. I also had a question. Hello. Hello. Oh, she's hi there. there. I also have a question. Nice to see you. Me too, thank you. Regarding the songs, I was fascinated 
by the fact that you're using songs like Hit the Road Jack. And I wonder what songs produce the best results for student learning? Well, uh, if I talk about my experience, I had the opportunity to use songs with my students um, for several years. And the songs that, uh, that students like are the songs that uh, generate positive energy in the classroom. Uh, students work cooperatively sometimes, they work individually sometimes, and in the end of the, uh, of the session, everybody uh, sings and goes home with, uh, with very uh, high, uh, yes, uh, with very positive energy. Yes, I used the, the song of... Uh, Hi, how are you? Fine. Welcome. Welcome in August. Thank you for having interrupted me. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, yes, of course. Uh, the song that I used was uh, the, the one that students like most was uh, I'm Feeling Good. It's one of the classics of Nina Simone and they uh, very much enjoyed it. That was the one that really made me feel that students were really motivated when uh, having uh, listened to it and, uh, you know. And I have one more question, if I may. And yes. I, I want to know to what extent did the philosophy or the cultural aspects of the songs leak into the discussion? For example, Hit the Road, Jack. Did that occasion an opportunity for students to talk about African-American culture? And if so, in what way? Well, uh, luckily, uh, I had the same, I taught students the uh, African-American uh, culture. Well, in the American Corner, Constantine, we ha I had the session, I was a moderator of a session that was called uh, the American culture. And uh, I, taught students uh, about the, uh, all the cultures in the, in the United States. And we mentioned the, uh, the, the American, we had the opportunity to speak about the American songs and uh, we, uh, r &B and uh, soul, pop, you know, all of them. And we used Hit the, Ro Hit the Road Jack and they liked it so much too. And uh, I don't know, uh, they were, you cannot really, you can, well, songs are always uh, a good way, uh, I think, I believe. Uh, it's a personal, uh, it's a personal point of view, but uh, students usually like, uh, like singing. <laughs> That's a lovely song. One of my favorite songs, by the way. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> Lucky. thank you so much. Very good. You are most welcome. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, may I speak, please? Atika, hello. We are waiting for you. Mr. Uh, Afkad asked you a question. Um, can you please repeat the question so that she can answer you? We're sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm working right now, so I can't be with you all the time. Just repeat. Understand. Thank you uh, again for the flow. I was asking uh, because some some artists or singers uh, in their songs they use very informal language or slang. Someone else is speaking, please turn off your mic. Yes, I'm asking if uh, because uh, singers or artists use uh, Slang or very informal language. I'm wondering if it can handicap to students' progress in the academic writing or speaking or listening. 
روح روح انت روح روح سكتي سكتي ما بتعيش في روحك مش مش هاتي turn off your mic please okay so um uh, for the songs uh, you can choose your song we can have uh, some formal songs like uh, the songs of um, the beatles for example they use the rp language in their songs uh, and sometimes we can find like rap music or rmb music hip hop etc so the singers speak this or sing with the, their um, spoken uh, language and my purpose in my um, research is to help for the spoken the pronunciation and the vocabulary what is needed here it's not the formal language because when we speak with foreigners uh, in daily conversation we do not need uh, rp language like uh, for example if we speak in arabic we are not going to speak classical arabic for french we are not going to use the uh, school uh, language so what is needed is the street let's say or let's call it street language uh, in french for example if we talk to french people um, they would uh, use more uh, what is called verlan where they invert the uh, the words for example instead of saying star they say rasta you see that so if you are not familiar to this language you are not going to communicate or let's not say to communicate but we are not going to be in well understand or um, and to avoid being misunderstanding but if you need to uh, teach or to learn a formal language you can choose singers who sing with a formal english or a formal french for example i said uh, the beatles they use uh, if we take the song of submarine we can use submarine uh, as a lesson for grammar for vocabulary for uh, tenses everything you see i hope that i answered your question thank you so much you're welcome some other questions Yes, please. If you have other questions, uh, if anybody else has a question, please. Um, uh, do you hear me? T yes. M one six one. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, I have a question for you. Since you are, you um, mentioned um, something about songs. I'm sorry, I didn't follow your uh, your presentation. Um, what are your objective or objectives? What are your objectives from including songs in cl the classroom? Uh, okay. And I have another question so, uh, that I give you room to, to, uh, to answer. Um, the uh, presenter who uh, um, gave a talk about the uh, uh, cooperative work or learning, uh, would you please ask her, or if she's uh, listening to me, What's the difference? My question is, what's the difference between cooperative learning and collaborative learning? I'm always, I have tried to understand the difference, but I couldn't. Would she be, please be kind enough to explain that to me? And thank you. Okay. Um, I start with the, the first question, which concerns the, the songs. Um, actually, my objective is to make the learner able to speak um, fluently and to understand native or even other uh, foreigners. So what is main here is uh, to motivate them to learn. As we know that adults are not very motivated to learn, especially um, foreign languages. They find themselves out of um, um, the, um, the process. So they they said, okay, I'm not good in French or I'm not good in English. So I'm not going to follow the teacher when he is giving the lessons. It's boring, uh, it's uh, a routine things. You see that? So how to motivate them? We check what they prefer, what they love, the teenagers or the adults. What they love, they are uh, interested uh, by songs especially English, even for French lately, they, uh, their preferable singer is Soul King, for example, they all know about his songs. So why not to include this, a funny, uh, or this fan to use it uh, uh, or transform it to be a, a tool 
and the material for learning or teaching the, uh, the spoken English or the spoken target language, French, English, Spanish, whatever the language is. This is it, the uh, target to make them able to speak the pronunciation, the vocabulary, and to motivate them at the same time. I hope I, may, um, I answered your question. Uh, yeah, but the, the problem with the uh, with the songs, if you if I may comment on your uh, your uh, presentation, the problem with the songs, they do not really represent um, everyday speech. Um, I, I mean, you can teach pronunciation to your EFL students uh, thanks to the songs, because uh, uh, the songs could be very good when it comes to idiomatic expressions, or it could be, uh, they could be good or okay with the, uh, the themes they, they deal with. Um, but when it comes to pronunciation and grammar, I don't think they could be of great use to the students. What do you think of that? Um, well, um, good point, but I think that it depends on your choice. I mean, the, the song that you pick, is it or it's going to fit the lesson of today or not? Which means that the song you are going to choose, is it a formal song like uh, using submarine example uh, that I gave before? The, um, uh, if we talk about um, British song especially, so we are here learning the British accent, the, Brit the British pronunciation. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to play the song and let them listen to the song only and they learn. No, this is not the point. Of course, the teacher is going to help from time to time. But uh, what is, um, what is how to say, what is, uh, the key here is that the motivation first, when you are motivate them, so they, you get or you, you, you have their attention. When you have their attention, now you can play your role uh, as a guide and you know how to use this song or transform this, this song to be uh, a lesson of pronunciation, of uh, vocabulary, uh, phonetic, um, grammar, whatever you want. So you are going to create your lesson up to this song and the example here we are going to give is the song and they are going to love the song, of course, when they are going to love it, they are going to learn it by heart. They are going to sing it again and again. And here, unconsciously, they are learning to speak. When we sing, we are learning to speak, of course. For the daily uh, language or the daily conversation, I'm not, go I'm not telling that it's like uh, everyday conversation, but the way of speaking outside, it's not the same way of speaking inside the school the same thing for uh, Arabic, for French, for every language, okay? So when they are at school, they learn the basics. Of course, I'm not neglecting the school. When they are learning the basics, but they are not going uh, or they are not having time to practice it. It's something classical. They hate activities. They hate grammar, like giving rules, examples, etc. So why not giving the rules then transform them uh, in examples with the songs? And when they are learning the song, so singing again and again, they are, um, um, how to say, they are practicing more and more. And then they are learning the, the new vocabulary they are learning uh, the same, or one vocabulary may have different meaning, just like I said, uh, the word hit, or in French language, uh, verla, le, le verlan. Uh, so they would know that the spoken language, it's not the same as school. And what is needed is outside school. Mm. Is it okay with you? Uh, that's fair enough. But uh, if, you may, if I may ask another question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, what about the culture? The, the, uh, our culture as Arabs and Muslims um, and the Anglo-Saxon culture, don't you think sometimes some songs could be offending to our culture? What, yes, I know. what would you do about that? Yeah, I know. That's why I said you have to pick the right song for the right mm -hmm. lesson. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, when we are learning a foreign language, we are learning their cultures. 
without neglecting ours, of course. So it shouldn't be offensive here. So we are teaching the language at the same time with its culture through the song. And you have to pick the, or to choose the right song, the proper song. Why not uh, the video clip, but it should be proper also. Yes? Thank you. Um, I mean, I have other questions, but uh, maybe I'm taking up most of your time. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm free, but you ask if they have time for other presentation. For me, it's okay. Uh, okay. Another, for example, haven't you tried uh, Hotel California, for example? Yeah, beautiful it, it's song. It's a very good song, isn't it? Yeah, I love it. Okay. I it speaks about drugs. How, yes. would you, how would you introduce this kind of songs to Muslims? who think that drugs are forbidden. I mean, yes. religiously speaking, they are, they are forbidden. But this is the reality. Even in uh, our community as Muslims, we do have drugs here. We do yeah. have uh, kidnapping, we have uh, violence, we have everything here. As yeah. Muslims, of course, yeah. we are not away from uh, other cultures. So the point here is to introduce the drugs or the song which is talking about the drugs, then we give the, uh, or we ask them to write or to speak about the uh, negative points of the drug. And then uh, of course the conclusion, yeah. be, we should avoid this thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank thank you, you very much for your contribution. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I would like to say something to uh, the person who was asking the questions. Would you please let us know your name? Yeah, that's uh, because Ahmed on the Bashar. screen it's written TM161. That's Ahmed Bashar. Ah, very nice. Yes. From the University of? Uh, Muhammad Khidr Biskra. Hey, you are, you're welcome to... Uh... Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yes, you're very welcome. I would like to uh, tell you a little thing. Is that uh, when we use songs, we need to pay attention to uh, the songs that have an academic context. Uh, depending on the objectives that you, the, the teachers should uh, should trace before the uh, before the uh, the present before giving the students the songs, you see. So uh, depending on your objectives, the very first thing that you are that one has to do is to uh, select the song with the. Uh, Words uh, the grammatical point that they need to focus on, like, I don't know if you would like to teach vocabulary, if you would like to focus on grammar or pronunciation and so on and so forth. And then uh, you are supposed to, uh, to discuss the title, the theme of the song and so on and so forth. So uh, this is how, uh, and then in the end, everybody goes home happy uh, after having spent uh, a very uh, funny uh, hour Amazing. with the uh, singing. Uh, do you do you agree, uh, Atika? Yes, of course, I totally agree. It's the same thing. Like we, when we are uh, teaching, we need to prepare our lesson before. So and the same course, thing. Prepare the and song. And of course, before. we need to pay attention to the positive, uh, the positive sides of every culture. Yeah, of yes. course. Yes. Yeah. It can be. It very can be. Good. A great debate. Uh, you can have a great debate, uh, giving them uh, different cultures and let your uh, your sorry learners to discuss the the positive, the negative points, what they would prefer, etc. Thank you, uh, thank you, sir, for uh, your question. Uh, Amrani, I think you have asked another question to uh, Dr. Amrani Amina. Yes. That was about uh, cooperative learning and Concerning, uh, the difference between cooperative and collaborative learning. Yeah, yeah yes, thank you. Amina, yeah, yeah. please. Amina, hi. Hello. How are you? Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, concerning uh, the question about the difference between uh, collaborative and cooperative learning. So concerning collaborative learning, it's uh, any kind of uh, group work where the teacher asks students to work together. And uh, the selection of uh, students uh, is usually random. It means uh, maybe he asks them to choose which group to join, or he just ask the, asks them to join groups. Uh, however, for uh, cooperative learning, 
there are five pillars that should be uh, there to, to call uh, an instruction uh, cooperative. These uh, pillars were uh, suggested by Johnson, Johnson and Smith in uh, 1991. The first one is positive interdependence, where the members of the group have to depend on one another to accomplish the goal. And in case one of the group members fail to do his or her part of the work, all the group members suffer from the results of that failure. It means we swim together or we sink together. Uh, the second uh, element or uh, pillar is individual accountability, where each member of the group is required to do his or her part of the work towards the achievement of the common goal and is accountable for the mastery of all the content to be uh, learned. It means uh, uh, although we are working together, but you are responsible for your own learning. You cannot depend mainly on your uh, group mates. The third element is face-to-face -face promotive uh, interaction, where all the members of the group help and encourage one another to learn. And although so, some of the work can be performed individually, the members of the group should sit together and interact with one another clarify, provide feedback, teach, and even support one another. The fourth uh, pillar, which is in uh, interpersonal and small group skills, here the students are urged and encouraged to develop social skills needed to achieve an effective communication among group members and efficient conflict resolution and problem solving. The last element, which is group processing, here at the end of each session, uh, after finishing the group work, the group members are given some time to sit and reflect on their goal and discuss what has been performed by the old group members and how it was done and make necessary changes to achieve a more effective functioning in the future. So if you have these five elements in your classroom, you can call this instruction cooperative. Uh, however, if you uh, just uh, uh, form the groups randomly and you do not prepare well and you do not uh, make heterogeneous groups. Here we cannot say that you are working in a cooperative learning instruction. It's just cooperative, uh, collaborative learning. This is uh, concerning the difference between co cooperative and collaborative learning. Thank you. Um, I have another question, M may I? Yes. Okay. Uh, what you say is fair, but it's ideal. You know, in mm -hmm. our classes, we are we have overcrowded classes, overcrowded. Yeah. They are noisy, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, most of the time, when you give you 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 leave them to their own devices when they are alone, trying to mm -hmm. work, most of the time they resort to their L one instead of English. Yeah. Instead of working, speaking English, they tend to speak Arabic. Mm -hmm. Do you think this could be helpful to learn the, the, um, uh, the second language or the foreign language? What could you do as an English teacher to um, minimize the use of L1 and maximize the use of L2? And thank you. Uh, yeah, interesting question. Uh, first of all, uh, the paper that I presented here was how to uh, overcome the challenges that uh, face that the teachers, EFL teachers face when they uh, want to implement uh, cooperative learning uh, instruction in their classes. Of course, we face many problems. Uh, one, uh, you mentioned a problem that I did not mention in my paper, but uh, yes, it, re it, it, does, it does exist in our classes. So the, te the teacher here is supposed to monitor. It means if I ask the students to work cooperatively, it doesn't mean that I will be absent. Of course, I will be there monitoring, supporting. And uh, among the other uh, solutions that I suggested in the presentation was uh, giving rules to students. So uh, as we have a role of the expert of the group, the leader of the group, the timekeeper, we can suggest a uh, uh, another role, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, a talk monitor, 
who monitors how students speak and guides them and uh, tries to limit the use to limit the use of L1 and encourages the use of uh, the foreign language. This is one uh, of the solutions. Uh, concerning the noise and the other problems, I've uh, suggested in my presentation, you can go back for the presentation, I've suggested many solutions. Uh, the, the type of activities suggested, um, how to manage time, uh, the, 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 the worksheets that the, the teacher can give to his students. And of course, it depends on the skill you are teaching. Teaching writing cooperatively is not like teaching reading or teaching uh, listening or other skills. So this is the uh, answer for your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amina. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, you are welcome. I would like to add one more thing, if you do not mind. Um, we as teachers were taught to, uh, to apply the smart thing uh, specific, measurable, attainable, or achievable, mm, uh, reliable, and time management before doing any activity or before before doing any strategy in our classrooms. So if the uh, the activity matches with this SMART, uh, it's very uh, teachers may uh, may implement them in their uh, classes. If not, well, we move and look for another activity that that fits uh, our students' needs and the uh, uh, our objectives. Thank you, everybody. Yes. If someone else is, uh, if someone else has a question, yeah. we're listening. We're all ears. Monsieur Fadel, do you have something to add about the uh, the cooperative learning? Doctor uh, Yassin, do you have any question? Yes, Monsieur Fadel. What I can say about collaborative and cooperative uh, learning, I prefer yes. the word learning rather than teaching since we are in a learner-centered approach and all of us promote uh, learner-centered teaching. The, the idea is that uh, when we collaborate, it's uh, the teacher is the more knowledgeable other or a leader in the group, like uh, Dr. Amalani presented it, having a leader in the group. That leader must be the most knowledgeable other. And the others collaborate with him. Now, when you talk about cooperation, cooperation deals with the students who have the same level. So here, the role of the teacher in the learner-centered approach is to prepare his lesson while knowing about his pupils, his students, his learners. And this can be through uh, needs analysis, through questionnaires. And once we know about our group, we decide whether we deal with collaboration or cooperation, and we organize our lesson according to our learners' needs. Thank you very, very much. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Yassine, do you have any question? Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm oh. uh, Mr. Mule Hassan from University of Tier. This is my colleague. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Berhamou from University of Mustaghana. I just want to Welcome. have two remarks concerning uh, concerning uh, uh, Miss uh, Diamish concerning the songs and so. I, I didn't have uh, have the chance to to add uh, to, to say something about it. Just I, I would like to to say that I mean when we use songs. Yes. Some extent, I mean, uh, if we, if we use always the songs, okay, it will be a bit a bit logical, okay. It's not a bit logical to use songs every time, because I mean, songs, uh, songs. I believe that I mean, when we use songs, when we when we tend to, for instance, to teaching about the culture of a given country or or, or given a nation, but not when we deal, for instance, with the pronunciation. If we want to teach our students pronunciation, a correct pronunciation, I would prefer or recommend a language labs with authentic materials, okay, with native native speakers, with native language, not with. I mean, we are. I mean, uh, we are. Uh, we are. I mean, users of language of English language, but we will never be natives, okay. I do. Uh, uh, I do understand. I think that uh, students uh, have the right to listen to all sorts of uh, accents. Do you agree? 
Yeah, yeah, I agree yes. with that. But and then when it comes laugh. to this election, hey, when it comes to this election, sometimes we listen to this, sometimes we listen to that. And songs should not be uh, implemented constantly, once in a while, so that students won't get bored uh, of songs, of course. And uh, when it's once, uh, once a month or once a fortnight, it would uh, make them feel good. Yeah, no? I, know. I know. But it's not about, I mean, make them feel good. We are here to teach them in an academic way. For of instance, course. Of, of course. course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Well, yeah. they are going to learn and feel good. They are going to learn. Yeah, I know. I know that songs. The, I told you, depending on the, uh, on the, the grammar point that you would like to teach, if if you would like to teach vocabulary or uh, grammar, uh, for example, tenses, or if you would like to teach s silent syllables, and you know, you see, you see what I mean. Yeah, I know, I know. I, so I have you... on again, smart, specific, yeah. measurable, uh, attainable, uh, reliable, and time management. Yes. But not always. Not always the songs are. Not the songs. always, of course. Too much this is too what bad. I mean. Yeah. Too but much I mean, is too bad. Yeah, but what I what I, I mean uh, recommend that I mean we can use them. I mean, when it comes to when it comes to culture and self. For instance, I, I agree with the Dr. Arkad when he said that I mean sometimes the songs are not I mean that educative, especially when uh, when students when students they have a problem with listening. But the, the teacher here, the teacher the, should uh, should. Uh, should have objectives. The teacher should select the topic. Uh, the teacher should select the song that goes with his her objective. Like uh, if if you do songs just like that, it has no sense. You see, yes. and but with is, an objective, it makes sense. And there is another problem. For instance, we are we are, sometimes we have uh, in the classroom there are some uh, students who are some uh, religious students, conservative students who have a problem with listening to songs. Okay, and you may have you may have a, a problem of a contradiction between students. Some of them will say, "Sir, we, we do not prefer this kind of uh, method of teaching, which is yes. uh, contradict with their beliefs and self." Okay, for instance, yes. I give you an example. Because why? Because some. What did you do in this case? In this case, in, in this case, before I mean, for in, in this problem, I would I would uh, I need to I mean assess I mean the cultural side, the religious side, and the social side of my students. Okay, this is one part. The second part, I mean, I mean, students, I mean, and sometimes I may, I mean, suggest, we say, I mean, what do you think if we do this or we, we teach, uh, we, we have a lecture using songs and we may agree on the songs in which does not, or the songs that do not, I mean, touch any, I mean, kind of a principle religions of, I mean, we need, I mean, we are after all, we are dealing with the human beings. And well, thank you, you have answered your own question. Exactly. That's why <laughs> I, I, I said, sometimes I said that when it comes to cultural parts, yes. And for us, uh, there is another teacher who said, uh, participant here who said that a uh, problem of drugs and self. The bottom line is that, I mean, students can listen to music on their own. Okay. We are, as teachers, we, are, we teach them. I prefer to teach them, I mean, in a more academic way when it comes to writing, for instance. Okay. A pronunciation, I believe that as as long as they speak a correct English, pronunciation is not that problem, okay? But what do they need? They need, I mean, the writing for. They need the, the, how to listen, I mean, carefully. How to, I mean, there are more important stuff in teaching, more than it, uh, making them happy, and they're going to go happy. Very good. Then you know your students' needs. It's a very good thing. If, you're, if you, your students do not, be, do not need these things, then you are you are supposed to move and then look for exactly. something that your students need. That's very interesting. May I interfere um, Mr. In? Hisham, thank you for your cooperation. May I interfere? Uh, yes, Monsieur Fadel, do you want to add something? Yes, thank you. It's about songs. I can tell a colleague, uh, Dr. Yassine Moulay from the University of Tiers, that uh, I have taught songs with all levels. I taught songs uh, to children aged 8, uh, 11, to pupils aged 11, 15 to students at the university, master students. It depends on your choice of the song, the topic of the song, the lesson in which you choose to teach that song in, your objective, what skill are you emphasizing, 
whether you are emphasizing vocabulary or grammar. And uh, even uh, the lyrics of the song, you mentioned some students being uh, religious. We have religious songs in English now. So you can teach these. <laughs> and uh, here I am focusing on the affective filter. What uh, Dr. Shelby was talking about is dealing with the learner's feelings. This is very important even at the academic level. As teachers, we are always focusing on what is academical, and we are always forgetting that we are in front of human beings. These human beings have feelings, and their feelings count more than what we are teaching them in terms of knowledge. So once these students feel at ease, and we are always working with those who are slow learners, because the good learners, those who are good at pronunciation, they will uh, succeed without our uh, interference. They don't need us. But believe me, when someone is introvert, when someone has never had that uh, uh, feeling of easiness in order to participate in a course in a group, <laughs> he will do it once uh, he is singing. And I witnessed this with children. I witnessed it with adults. It works. Now you are right. Mm -hmm. We have to choose the right topic. We have to you choose the right song to teach culture, to teach pronunciation, to teach even writing, because uh, this can be at the level of the post uh, writing where the students uh, can write about their feelings, can uh, develop uh, new uh, lines versus for uh, the song. So it is a very good material. It depends on how we use it. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for uh, all the information you provided. Uh, Mr. Hisham uh, Abdel, uh, I'm sorry, the, the name is not uh, on the uh, screen. Abdel, uh, please, uh, you asked yeah, the question. Hello. What is it, please? <clears throat> No, 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 I'm not asking a question. I'm just, uh, first of all, apologies for not being able to attend because uh, they, I, I suppose, to present with Ms. Atika. So she is the co author. And I'm happy that she uh, could take over. Uh, I, I've been absent because I had another conference. And, you know, in the middle of everything, we could not attend again okay, the right, right place. Yeah. So, um, what matters things, okay? Uh... We understand. Uh, and I, I could not catch up with things, but I'm saying that um, we are to music in English, using music in educational context, which means that in the presence of the teacher. So he has the... Uh, he is going to be selective, selecting the music according to our culture, according to our beliefs. And we have like music, we have proper music, not all are bad or not what makes, okay, brings academic uh, or what makes a possibility of using music in educational context is the how to be selective how good you are in selecting good songs Very and presenting good. it in the classroom. So Very also, uh, uh, according to the needs of the learners. So we are not speaking about the general English. We are speaking about, we are not speaking, uh, apologies, we are not speaking about the ESP, okay? English for specific purposes. This is another, okay, uh, topic. So if we are, we are not going to teach them just writing or speaking or whatever. So we are supposed to teach them everything. And also I disagree with the, that pronunciation is not important. It is important. They have to speak in appropriate manner to be understood. It's not just you, you know how to write, how to read, and you just speak, but it can't be clear. I'm not saying to be native, even near native, but just to be clear, okay? Pronouncing words, okay, in appropriate manner. So thank you so much also. Uh, thank you so much all of you. And apologies once again, and thanks for Ms. Atika taking over. And uh, it was a pleasure to be with you today. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hicham. Thank you, everybody. It was an amazing uh, debate, and I am very glad to for having chaired this session.
Thank you so much, everybody. Goodbye. Welcome. See you Bye. in another uh, academic uh, event. Inshallah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shreen. See you Thank back you. in the signs.
Uh, hello, Dr. Yassine Moulay, are you here online? Yes, I'm here. Uh, so please, can you join us on uh, Google Meet because the session in which you are programmed, uh, programmed will start in a few minutes and you will have to present online. Sure, no problem, no problem at all. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first international conference on the reality of the linguistic policy in the world that is held by the Department of Letters and English Language at the University of Gardea, Algeria. Sorry, at the University of Burgla, Algeria. I am Dr. Melika Kuti, um, Dr. Melika Kuti, um, a teacher at the University of Burgla, uh, specifically at the Department of English uh, Language and Literature. Um, the, uh, I, I am sharing, sharing this session. Uh, whose focus is on the language skills and in the main from a discourse perspective. Normally, there are, uh, we have four speakers in this, uh, on this panel, uh, namely Dr. Medico Kouti, Dr. Sabrina Sairi, uh, Dr. Mouda Fakhiza Tijani and uh, Dr. Uh, Yusra Sadiri and uh, Dr. Hajar uh, Zubushi. Um, since all the, the participants are here, so let's get started. Uh, Presentation number one, entitled Comprehending Written Discourse in FL Classroom by Dr. Melika Kuti. Good morning. I'm Dr. Melika Kuti from the Department of Letters and English Language at Qasdi Marbah University of Hurigla, Algeria. I am very happy to participate in the first international conference on the reality of the linguistic policy in the world that is organized by our department. I should thank Dr. Halimi for giving me this opportunity to share knowledge and exchange information with my colleagues and mates from all over the world. Actually, my topic revolves around comprehending written discourse in FL classroom. For many scholars in the 20th century, the competent users of language were the ones who performed well-formed sentences. Grammar was given priority over many other aspects of language. However, this orientation did not last for a long time, for second and foreign language learners did not produce connected contextualized sentences, although they acquired linguistic competence. Researchers began to concentrate on other elements that assist in using language appropriately. To this reason, the communicative approach drew attention to the focus on discourse as the basic unit of analysis rather than the sentence. This new orientation took into consideration the context in which pieces of discourse take place and the communicative functions that were added in the teaching program. The contribution of discourse analysis to writing. Applied linguists in the second half of the 20th century shifted their attention towards discourse as the basic unit of analysis rather than the sentence. This new trend required the production of meaningful pieces of discourse. Cook, 2003, considered discourse analysis as crucial to applied linguistic analysis in areas involving the development or assessment of language proficiency and successful communication. The communicative approach, in fact, has implemented discourse as an important framework. A discourse perspective to language teaching takes into consideration the notion of shared knowledge. Shared knowledge refers to one's general knowledge of the world. It includes the general knowledge of the world and the socio-cultural knowledge that is connected to the target speech community whose language the learner is aiming to acquire. Shared knowledge between readers and writers consists of writing conventions, familiarity with types of genre, and rhetorical traditions. Since students may come from different backgrounds, Language curricular planning should consider the cross-cultural differences and the factor of age. Researchers agree that readers should understand written discourse both propositionally and elocutionary, that is, they should combine both form and function in an interactive way. More explicitly, readers should be aware of the formal and functional aspect of a piece of written discourse. In his lectures entitled How to do things with words, Austin stated that words are produced to do things, that is to say, to fulfill some functions. According to the literature, at the beginning, the focus was on form, then it shifted to function. Later, there has been another shift towards the interpretation of grammatical forms relying on linguistic or situational factors. Since the focus of this paper is on writing, then it is advisable to have a look at the factors that facilitate the comprehension of written discourse. Comprehending written discourse. Comprehension is the goal behind reading in academic settings in the middle education system. 
which lets the reader go through the process of interpreting the written language. Since the text is the mediator between the author and the reader, the reader is going to utilize his or her discourse knowledge to comprehend and interpret the written discourse and get the implied message. Halliday argues that written language is different from spoken language. While spoken text includes utterances which may be incomplete, written text includes complete, well-formed sentences. This reflects the amount of time spent in the written text production. Duke and Carlis claim that written text marks sentences and paragraphs, use paralinguistic cues such as italicization, and provide other forms of visual representation of ideas and information, example pictures, graphs, etc. This process does not allow immediate interaction with the author, which delays the interpretation and comprehension of written text on the part of the reader. As opposed to speak spoken discourse, writers and readers of written discourse interact in, in a different way, and writers design their discourse for their intended readers. So, in writing, as Hinkle claims, discourse analysis provides explanation of text global features and ideas organization. For processing a written text, readers should do some tasks. The latter are decoding the text, the text by identifying the written signs, interpreting the text through the combination of the meaning of groups of words, and finally detecting the intended message of the author. There are at least three participants in the interactive reading approach, the author, the text, and the reader. And during reading, the reader utilizes the, the knowledge that he or she brings to the text besides the textual information. In some, negotiation of meaning requires both schematic knowledge and systemic knowledge. The building blocks of written discourse comprehension. Number one, cohesion. Cohesion is a number of surface level signals that help reader in connecting ideas in a text. It shows how discourse is organized in a text and the writer's intention. Widowson defines cohesion as the overt linguistically signaled relationship between propositions. This overt feature ensures surface evidence for the unity and connectedness of a text. Cohesion is reflected in the grammatical and lexical devices that make part of language. Readers not acquiring these devices will encounter difficulties in comprehending text. Number two, coherence. Sels Mershi and Olstein explain that coherence contributes to the unity of a piece of discourse such that the individual sentences or utterances hang together and relate to each other. This unity and relatedness is partially a result of a recognizable organizational pattern for the propositions and ideas in the passage, but it also depends on linguistic devices that strengthen global unity and create local connectedness. Readers may not comprehend the text if they lack the schematic frame of reference of a text. When this frame is provided, they can make mental representation of a text easily. In other words, coherent written discourse involves both types of processes, that is, bottom-up and top-down. 3. Context. In written communication, context is what is assumed to be relevant through situational factors that may not be relevant at all. This is because the place and the time of reading the text differs from the place and the time of its production. Despite this fact, there should be a common context of shared knowledge for communication to take place. Text does not in itself establish context, but serves to activate it in the reader's mind. And once activated, it can be extended by inference. When context is not available in a piece of, dis of written discourse, readers make use of the text itself and rely on their prior knowledge. Prior knowledge or background knowledge is an important factor in language interaction and so in written discourse comprehension. In actuality, many attempts have provided conventional or stereotypic representations of knowledge of the world as a basis for the interpretation of discourse. These representations form a basis for explaining the predictable information that readers are assumed to have in a particular situation. To explain, the writer is not to inform his or her readership that in a text about a restaurant, for example, there are chairs and tables, for this knowledge is generally conceived of by the reader. Conventional aspects of a situation are considered to be default elements. They are assumed without being mentioned. This type of knowledge is considered as stored in memory as a single easily accessible unit. 5. Pragmatics 
Pragmatics is a very important component in the comprehension of written discourse. It is considered with meaning, that is, with what is communicated rather, rather than what is said or written. Sels Mercier and Olstein argue that pragmatics is defined as the interpretation of the written message. Thus, pragmatics is about what is infer inferred from any message. In the case of written discourse, the reader and the author communicate via the text. In other words, there is a kind of meaning negotiation between the two parties. The author uses textual and contextual clues that enable the reader to detect his or her intended meaning. In his return, the reader uses his or her cohesive devices, knowledge, background knowledge, content vocabulary, and context to comprehend the message and infer the author's intended meaning. In this way, the reader can even recognize the intended readership. To conclude, we can say that in comprehending written discourse, many elements come into play. The aforementioned elements, which are cohesion, coherence, context, prior knowledge, and pragmatics can fulfill this objective. Moreover, and more importantly, the reader should have linguistic competence that assists him or her in the comprehension process. Thank you so much. Hello once again. Um, let me remind you please that you can write your questions in the chat box and that there will be a debate of about 15 minutes after the uh, presentations have been uh, finished. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Sabrina Seri with a presentation entitled Developing the Reading Skill, a Discourse-Based Approach. Developing the Reading Skill, a Discourse-Based Approach, presented by Dr. Sabrina Seri, University of Wurgla. The outline of this presentation is the following. Abstracts, introduction, discourse, discourse analysis, the reading skill, developing the reading through discourse analysis, conclusion. Abstracts. The reading skill has an important role in second language teaching and learning. It is one of the effective ways for the acquisition of target language. Reading is one of the macro skills of the English language. It is important for SL learners as they need it either for academic purposes or for professional ones. Recently, many applied linguistics have suggested a discourse-based approach to reading, since students need to understand text in their context of use in order to help them to communicate effectively. The present study aims at developing English language learners' reading skills within a discourse analysis perspective. This work will provide some theoretical background on this issue. In addition, some suggestions will be provided in order to uh, develop the reading skill. The keywords, discourse, discourse analysis, reading skill, inferencing, and interpreting are two skills of reading. First of all, with the introduction. Formally, the sentence was used as the basic unit of analysis in language teaching. Therefore, the contextualized sentences were the focus of all rules, examples, exercises, and activities used at that time. This approach emphasized the use of individual sentences to practice language, and learners were passive in terms of connecting sentences into meaningful sentences. However, there has been a shift of interest recently to describe language in its context of use, linguistic and non-linguistic context. Language teaching shifts to concentrate on able, enabling learning to communicate effectively in the target language. Many linguistics have suggested a discourse-based approach as a reaction to the formal approach to language teaching. Therefore, we have suggested a discourse-based approach to developing. What is a discourse? A discourse can be approached from three perspectives the formal, the functional, and the social approach. We start first of all with the formalists, such as Stubbs 1983 and Shafi 1992, who define discourse as a unit of analysis after the level of sentence or the clause. These applied linguistics usually try to understand the, the intrasentential relationship, the suprasentential relationships, and the rules that govern the production to make text. 
However, this point of view looks deficient, especially if we take a word such as stop in the context of driving. We will find that this word is understandable. So, according to Widdowson, a text is not by, ling by its linguistic extent, by but by its social intent. It means that a text it not necessary. It is not necessary a sentence. It could be a letter. It could be a sound. It could be a word. It could be a sentence. It could be a combination of a sentence. Those who go for the second path, I mean the functionalists, such as Holiday 1976, Brown and Yule 1983, Cook 1989, defined discourse as language in use. This description emphasized the fact that a linguistic form may fulfill many functions, and these functions cannot be separated from the context in which they are embedded, to be understood by the participants. The third approach is uh, the social approach, such as Fairclough 1992, who see discourse as a holding ideology. This means that a discourse is quite related to one's identity and social relationship. It is linked to who has a power over whom and to one's belief and to one's belief of what is wrong and right. These, uh, the, these all definitions provide a view of what a discourse is and what is not. The three perspectives can be seen as interrelated aspects of discourse. It is, uh, as it is stated by Schifrin, Tannen and Hamilton, 19, uh, 2001, many linguistics fall into three categories when defining discourse. Anything beyond the sentence, second, language use, Third, a broad range of social practice that includes non-linguistic and non-specific instances of language. What do you mean by reading? Reading plays an important role in second language teaching and learning. It is an effective way to the acquisition of the target language. Reading is an interactive process whereby readers endeavor to understand the writer's intended meaning. This process requires the reader to perform simultaneous tasks. First, to decode the message by recognizing the written signs. Second, to interpret the message by assigning meaning to the strings of words. And finally, to understand what the author's intention is. How to develop reading using discourse analysis? Of course, these are some suggestions to be, take, to be taken into consideration by teachers. We start, first of all, the suggestions in terms of teachers. The, the role of teachers in the classroom is very important in developing students' reading skill. Teachers should be aware of their other roles as researchers, evaluators, course designers, and material providers. They should be always up to date. They should decide when to evaluate their learners, is it during the course or after it finishes. Finally, they should know that the materials are not always ready-made, but they have to adapt them according to the students' need them. In terms of classroom interaction, teachers should allow students to interact and participate in the process of designing the lessons. They should engage students in pairs, in pair group, work activity to construct meaning from the con from the text. They should create an interactive atmosphere with their learners. They should take into consideration that learners have different ages, different background knowledge, and different learning styles. They should consider the knowledge of subject matter that students have. They should involve learners to take decisions concerning the course. This should make learners more interested in attending the class. In terms of the activities, it is recommended that teachers use activities that are learner-centered. In addition, they should design various activities that develop different reading skills. Moreover, it is recommended that teachers use text diagrams because they help students to know the relationship between parts of the text and how each part contributes to the whole. 
They also help. They also should help students identify various organizing patterns. Of, for example, cause effect, exposition, sequence, narration. Furthermore, it is recommended that teachers ask students to complete text organizers, charts, outlines, diagrams, or to create their own semantic map. It is preferable in terms of materials to use authentic materials that interest learners. Teachers should use audio and other different materials such as reports, memos to reinforce their teaching. Topics should be interesting, up to date and meet and meet students' needs. Teachers should include different genre of texts in order to allow students to know different texts organize different text organize conclusion in the end the reading skill is crucial for second language learning and teaching we have tried to look at reading from a discourse based approach and we have tried to give some suggestions to help teachers to develop their students reading skill thank you for your attention thank you so much dr sabrina sairi uh, and um the reading scale, uh, especially from a discourse perspective, is my cup of tea. And um, I'd like all people who watch this video to have a look at my PhD thesis that is online. Okay, our I'm next <laughs> uh, our next speaker is um, ah, Dr. Muna Fakiza Tijani and Yusra Siddiqui with their present uh, with presentation is titled Discourse Analysis in FL Context, the case of writing scale. The floor is yours. My presentation is entitled Discourse Analysis in EFA Context, The Case of Writing Scale, presented by Dr. Munaf Tihizat Jani, University of Shahid Hamal Akhtar Wed. Well, to start with, the presentation will be structured as follows. Introduction, objectives, statement of the problem, rationale behind the work, the literary view, methodology, the discussion, in the discussion section, the main conceptual framework of integrating discourse analysis in EFR classroom will be presented together with the results, and finally, the conclusion. Discourse analysis in this study is not only considered as a new method for teaching writing, Rather, it's a fundamental different way of looking at language compared with sentence-dominated models. We should make it clear that the first, the first analysis of discourse was purely based on the description of the recurrent patterns or recurrent linguistic elements in long texts. Later on, a more reconcilable view on discourse analysis is provided by Brown and Jewell. When they draw the line of discourse analysis as the study of discourse is necessarily the study of language uses. As such, it cannot be restricted to the description of linguistic forms independent of the purposes or functions, which these forms are designed to serve human affairs. The objectives of this study are first, to provide teachers with a pedagogical framework to the analysis of written discourse, whereby the teacher can shed the light on the language aspect of the discourse type he aims to teach. Second, to design a teaching model that uses bottom-up and top-down processing to enable in written linguistic and extra-linguistic knowledge to ultimately bridge the gaps between teaching theories and teaching practices, that mainly one of the key issues have been addressed recently. A statement of the problem. This inquiry is based on real-life observations in that writing teachers focus more on language knowledge, neglecting other parts or other dimensions of the written discourse. As a result, 
when students are asked to go beyond the sentence to produce a piece of text within a particular or a given context, the written production lacks many features of the communicative situation. The rationale behind this work is derived from the researchers' review of discourse analysis and review of research in discourse analysis. Since discourse analysis is an area from the 70s and the 60s that implemented in different or in wide ranging and heterogeneous disciplines, it has various approaches and its finding implemented in many disciplines. We presume that it's a basic framework whereby language is taught. Why? Because it involves different types of linguistic, cultural, contextual knowledge. Also, the uh, researcher has a strong motivation to bring micro-level analysis and macro-level analysis into symbiotic relation, rather than teaching parts of the whole in isolation from each other. The letter is reviewed in terms of different discourse analysis findings needed in teaching writing. The first type of knowledge is schematic knowledge. Schematic knowledge involves external and contextual realities in particular sociocultural worlds. The second type, textual knowledge, the leader of uh, texture, our holiday and hazan. They provide a thorough research into what makes a text text. And texture, according to them, involves how elements of the text hang together based on long linguistic relations. One aspect of texture is cohesion, according to them, of course. Uh, cohesion is text internal feature that realizes through manipulating certain devices namely reference substitution, ellipsis, conjunction, and lexical ties. The third type of knowledge is macro-organizational knowledge. There are two perspectives that examine how information is distributed in discourse, namely thematic analysis and the propositional relation. Thematic analysis involves the relationship between theme and dream and how uh, theme and dream are selected within the text. Propositional relation involves approaching the text from a semantic relation point of view that help recognizing the discourse pattern. The semantic ties would realize a discourse pattern of certain type, for example, cause and effect uh, cause, consequence, comparison, contrast, and the like. Another important area or approach to text analysis or to discourse analysis at this level is general analysis. It involves mainly typification of rhetorical action. In other words, it provides regularities of a staged goal-oriented social processes. The analysis of gender deal with definable features of text production in terms of actions we want to accomplish. Methodology. The quasi-experimental method is adopted that involves mainly three main steps. Pretesting the students, teaching one term semester according to the conceptual framework will be explained or presented later on. And finally, post-testing the students to assess the amount of discourse awareness developed along that teaching period. The following figure presents the pedagogical framework of discourse analysis insights. It contains all the knowledge types discussed in the literature review and integrates two main skills, two main interrelated skills which are reading and writing, together with two types of discourse processing, top-down and bottom-up processing. As to classroom practices in top-down processing, the teacher asks questions related to the readers of discourse and their needs, 
the purpose content, for example, what is the reader likely to know about the subject, what will the reader want to know about the subject, how the information would be organized so that it's easily understood by the reader, what makes the text more appealing to the reader, and many other similar questions related to understanding and interpretation of the survey. The third level of discourse analysis is bottom-up analysis. At this level, classroom interaction is shifted to specific features, that is to say linguistic features or text internal features, such as luxus, lexical choice, relationship between searching vocabularies, and appropriate use of cohesive devices such as reference, ellipsis, conjunctions, and the like. The third level of discourse analysis is bottom-up analysis. At this level, classroom interaction is shifted to specific features, that is to say linguistic features or text internal features, such as luxus, lexical choice, relationship between searching vocabularies, and appropriate use of cohesive devices such as reference, ellipsis, conjunctions, and the like. Table 1 presents the difference between pre-test mean and post-test mean. Of the three levels discussed earlier, as you see the result shows a certain improvement in aspects of written discourse production at these three levels, that is to say schematic consideration, micro-organizational level, and cohesive level. Conclusion the study explores how findings from discourse analysis are exploited as awareness raising approach and a framework of interactive presentation of language. The suggested model helps in enhancing the uses of language considerably at different levels of written discourse, the contextual level, organizational and cohesive one. The pedagogical framework supports to draw attention to regularities of written language uses. Then, Teacher writing skill from discourse analyst perspective fosters the student's writing proficiency. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Patriza and Dr. Sadiqi. It seems that we have agreed on working on the same topic, you know, the, the writing skill from this course perspective. Thank you so much. Uh, now we give, we'll give the floor to Dr. Hader Zabushi from the University of Biskara uh, with her uh, presentation entitled Cognitive Skills Involved in Comprehension Monitoring During Reading Digital Text. The floor is yours. organized by Qasim al University of Rugla. With this presentation entitled Metacognitive Meta Skills Involved in Comprehension Monitoring During Reading Digital Texts. It was basically motivated by the fact that most of the learning and research conducted by EFL students at the Algerian universities in this digital era which is marked by an abundance of content-based information and speed in processing occurs on screen. And owing to the plethora of electronic sources of all types made available for students online, they need not only be attentive and eclectic about what they read, but must develop conscious awareness of their reading performance and outcomes, and what they make from their readings, and to control the way they respond to texts, to make their readings effective. So this kind of reflexive thinking during reading requires particular metacognitive skills to help students make the most of their readings and compensate for their comprehension breakdowns. For this reason, this presentation sheds light on effective higher order thinking skills, strategies and tools for, sorry, for monitoring comprehension during reading digital texts. In addition to stressing, of course, the reading teacher's responsibility to accomplish this goal. 
To start with, students need to demonstrate knowledge of their own reading and the processes embedded in it to value what they already might be doing by means of un understanding the lower level processes and high level processes that work simultaneously in harmony to, to make meaning from the text and that any problem at any level would reduce the, the, the quality of comprehension and to know how to regulate their own learning and to monitor their own, their own comprehension. So, in order to encourage them to start thinking about reading as, as a complex process and as a productive skill, in the first reading class, the teacher can ask students to respond to a questionnaire with false statements, like this example here, taken from Advanced Reading Power, by Michaela Cantor Fries. So let's let's read a few a few a few of them. It's always necessary to read every word on the passage. It's a good idea to vocalize as we read. Reading more slowly improves comprehension. Knowing every word is necessary for comprehension. So teachers teachers need to, to show students that why all these statements are not true and this step is instrumental to to raise their awareness and correct their misconceptions on reading as both a practice and a concept so whenever they approach a text they read it with attentiveness and with a predetermined purpose in mind understanding features of digital texts is also important to teach them and read them because of their multimodality they include hyperlinks, embedded images, videos, interactive elements, and no pagination, which add more cognitive load on the reader's working memory. So, applying effective skills and strategies would assist students' comprehension and, and reading practice like scanning and skimming screen for important information only without reading the whole, the, the whole reading material, text or material, to decide to watch a video, to listen to an audio, to question and evaluate the credibility of sources and adequacy of content without relying on every information existing on the internet, to self-question and to check comprehension, to comment and interact with social elements, to follow and make sense of links, to decide on the number of open tabs to reduce the cognitive load on the working memory responsible for processing new information, to paraphrase, summarize and synthesize information from, from different sources which are in more complex cognitive processes. Using effective e-reading tools would help students with their, with their reading online or for example PDF, PDF books, article, journal articles, etc. to highlight important segments of texts. They allow students to highlight these segments and to insert annotations which would enrich and upgrade their reading experiences. As we can see here, Kami is a PDF annotation tool that allows multicolored annot annotations, audio annotations, and even embedded video annotations. And this allows readers to fully share their thinking as well as to fully express their established meaning from text using a variety of tools. And to highlight, to insert, to insert comments and to draw. The teacher's, teacher's responsibility is, is critical through scaffolding students' comprehension during adopting a model of gradual release of responsibility. So through modeling their thinking, teachers show students how skilled readers think as they read by means of thinking aloud and providing limited front loadings to help them become independent readers. 
I teach them autonomy and motivation, of course. So as a conclusion, we stress that EFL students need to be prepared for the, for the highly demanding cognitive tasks they are required to achieve in their academic levels and career afterward. And this goal cannot be accomplished without teaching students effective reading and comprehension monitoring skills, because reading is indispensable for students to uh, success in all their levels. To become proficient independent readers who are mentally active, especially in our fast moving digital world. In other words, BFL students need to, to be instructed to constantly reflect on their strengths and weaknesses in applying these strategies to regulate their thinking whenever their comprehension falters, especially when handling a plethora of different uh, text genres they are most likely to find electronically. In the end, thank you. For Thank you so much, Dr. Hadra Razabushi from the University of Biskra. So uh, now we have um, to move to the, the last part, which is the debate. Um, I don't know whether there are questions. So, can we have them? Any questions? Go ahead and chat again. So, If you, have if you have any questions, please, if you uh, can hear me. Okay. So there's a question to, uh, to Dr. Uh, Sabrina. To Dr. Sabrina Sairi. So, are the three viewpoints of this course, uh, namely formalist, functional, and social, mutually exclusive or complementary? To, um, to move to the last presentation uh, entitled Revisiting the Effect of Semantically Non Transparent Phrasal Verbs on Writing by the, the doctor, uh, doctor student Rehana Farrar. Okay, the floor is yours. I'm a PhD student at the University of Qazi Marba, Urgila. Today, I'm going to participate in this international conference by a presentation that it is titled Revisiting the Effects of Semantically Non Transparent Phrasal Verbs on Writing. So, let's begin. In this presentation, we are going to deal with the following the problem, research questions, research aim, the research methodology for this study. The main obtained results, finally, will end up by the implications in addition to the final conclusion. As a point of departure for this study, the related literature review to phrasal verbs has been read, and it was found that the good command of phrasal verbs as one category of formulaic sequences can work as a criterion against which writer can be recognized as good, creative, and proficient at the same time. And this claim can justify the continuous revival of interest in this area of study, along with the difficulties that it may create. In the same vein, phrasal verbs as fixed multi-word combinations or semantic units, such as bring up, look after, and many others, can have different categories of meaning, often idiomatic, 
literature or both in literature and idiomatic. And this distinguishing characteristic on the semantic level may affect or lead to a certain undesired effect on the writing performance of their users. On this basis, the present study evolved around the assumption of pairing the characteristic of semantic non transparency of phrasal verbs to writing in order to reveal or, in more precise terms, to evaluate its effect on the writing performance of the users. The questions that we are looking for their answers are Are EFL learners able to appropriately use phrasal verbs that are semantically non-transparent in their writings? To what extent can semantically non-transparent phrasal verbs affect EFL learners' writing productions? At the beginning of each study conduction, we usually ask the following question why do we intend to pursue such study? With regard to the aim of the present study, we attempted to scrutinize the sort of effect that semantic opaqueness of phrasal verbs may create on the writing performance of EFL learners. To ensure the systematic flow of any undertaking practical study, it should be well framed in terms of the following methodological steps. And, as a research approach, we adopted the qualitative one because such an approach enables us to make the kind of analysis and evaluation that we are looking for. Concerning data collection method, document analysis was used as it seemed convenient for the aim of this study. And, since there are different types of analysis in relation to qualitative data, such as grounded theory analysis and discourse analysis, Content analysis was chosen because it was seen as the most suitable form of analysis in accordance with the aim of this study. When it comes to the process of analysis, an agreement has not been established about the procedures to be used in analyzing qualitative data. However, some general steps have been already set up by methodologists, and based on that, and taking into consideration those steps, we have tried to adapt and adopt them in order to uh, obtain a suitable process of analysis. First, data was prepared by checking the accessibility of the written documents in addition to confirming the suitability of the documents to the focus of the current study. Second, all the obtained documents have been carefully read by a researcher. And since our study has shed light on the concept of phrasal verbs, the existing phrasal verbs in data or in the collected data were detected. In addition, and as a final stage, we were concerned with providing an overall representation of the selected material in relation to the questions of the study as well as the objectives. To select the documents that we can use, a purposive sampling technique was used. Accordingly, 40 test sheets of an achievement test were selected, and these test sheets contained written text of learners, notably EFL learners who have been under direct and explicit exposure to the area of phrasal verbs. After conducting constant analysis on the available data, the following results could be drawn. Many learners committed errors using phrasal verbs that hold a higher level of semantic opaqueness in their written texts. More precisely, these errors were both on the semantical and syntactical levels, as learners could not show disparity nor correctness in their texts. That is to say, phrasal verbs that hold idiomatic meaning were either used in a wrong way or learners have integrated them in a similar way to each other. Not only that, but they intended to avoid the integration of phrasal verbs while transmitting their ideas in a written form. In simple terms, learners failed to a certain extent in using phrasal verbs that hold an idiomatic meaning, and that could be the answer of the first questions of this study. 
The second main result that can be the answer to the second question says that the characteristic of semantic non-transparency of phrasal verbs or semantic opacity of phrasal verbs regardless to the level of opacity has negatively affected the written productions of EFL learners because the written productions or the written text could not reflect a good level of their language proficiency and that could be clear not only to the researcher or the analyst but also to any other reader. Here, by the end of the results, I should mention that the researcher has tried her best to be objective. For the implications of this study, we believe that minimizing the difficulties of using phrasal verbs in writing requires training learners carefully through effective approaches in academic contexts. We also recommend to extend their practice on the use of phrasal verbs so that they, they can overcome the sort of difficulties that we have mentioned previously. To conclude with, the importance of phrasal verbs in writing has urged us to conduct this study, or let me say, this evaluative study, in order to reveal whether phrasal verbs, along with their non-transparent meaning, can be a source of errors to their users when transforming their ideas into written texts or productions. Now, we came to the end of this presentation. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rehana Farrar, for this presentation. So, I go back to the questions um, asked by the participants. So. Normally, I have asked uh, Dr. Sari or Dr. Sari has been asked a question. So, where is the... Okay, uh, Dr. Sari, if you are here, uh, the question is, are the three viewpoints of this course, namely formalist, functional, and social, mutually exclusive or complementary? Dr. Sayri? Uh, Dr. Sayri, if you are here, just raise your hand, please. Not here. Since uh, Dr. Seri is not uh, present. Okay. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Emina. Thank you. If anyone has a question, you, you can raise your hands or yes. Uh, okay, so uh, I should thank the, the, the participants and um, uh, I have to close this uh, session. Thank you for your uh, contributions.
بابا ليه ما كملتش بابا خليني نقول لك نقول لك اي
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, Mr. Ben Musa Yasser. I will be sharing this session. So this session is about miscellaneous issues. Okay, so uh, we are going to start. So uh, we are. We have. Uh, first of all, we would like to remind you we will have uh, six speakers on this uh, uh, panel. I invite them virtually to attend the session while the video recorded recorded presentations are uh, played. After the presentation, we will have a debate. Okay. So, so uh, we invite the first presenter. Okay, to present. What is this one? Okay. One of the current debates among language researchers and educators is whether you use um, learners' mother tongue in foreign language classrooms. Some think that mother tongue negatively affects student learning, whereas others believe that occasional exposure to mother tongue can be useful for effective learning. So here we have two approaches. We have the monolingual approach and the, the bilingual approach. Researchers who support the monolingual approach see that the use of mother tongue in language class is not acceptable and target language should be the only medium of instruction and communication and the best way to teach and learn a language through the language itself. Later, many researchers and educators criticized the monolingual approach saying that the learners uh, first language can play a significant role in language teaching and learning. Ori Batch 1993 considers mother tongue as a powerful tool that could help learners improve their learning if used uh, correctly. So this study attempts to answer the following questions. Do Algerian EFL teachers and learners hold positive attitudes toward L1 use in EFL classrooms? What are the reasons behind using L1 in foreign language classroom? And what are the, the pros and cons of using L1 in the class? So to focus, uh, the focus of this study will be, will be to explore and identify the reasons behind using mother tongue in a foreign language classroom. And to explore the issue of mother tongue use, uh, the present study has relied on two research tools, observation during the teaching period of nine years, and two questionnaires directed to some teachers from different secondary schools in Khenshla, and a number of third-year pupils who study at Hashmi Bouzidi Secondary School. Uh, 20 uh, secondary school teachers uh, from uh, different schools in Khenshla and 25 pupils in philosophy stream received the questionnaires that contained both closed-ended and open-ended investigative questions. Now, with regards to teachers' perceptions of mother tongue use in Algerian secondary schools, this table shows that the teachers do not agree with the idea of using mother tongue in their teaching. However, almost all of them tend to use mother tongue in their classrooms. These two answers were contradictory. Based on my experience, it's obvious that all of these teachers were obliged to use mother tongue maybe due to the learner's uh, level of proficiency, thinking that the use of mother tongue will help a lot for any type of student. Moreover, most of the teachers questioning that using mother tongue in teaching won't increase students' confidence and won't help in achieving language objectives. Finally, the majority of the informants do not believe that mother tongue use will motivate learners to learn the language. So according to the findings, most of the informants have negative attitudes towards the use of mother tongue in EFL classrooms, though they find it useful in explaining new ideas, words, or rules, they are forced to use it in their classrooms because the, their classes were full of low, low proficient learners. So the use of mother tongue here is inevitable when all other effort, efforts fail to make slow learners understand the teaching item. Teachers' reasons behind the use of mother tongue in EFL teaching. 
So this figure below presents details about the different reasons given for using AWO in EFL classrooms. The participants say that they use mother tongue mainly because their learners always struggle with understanding what the teacher says in the target language and they become unable to follow along with the lesson. So when the teacher have, have uh, the teachers have slow learning students in their classrooms, they become forced to come down to the level of those low proficient learners and switch to the mother tongue to motivate them towards the lesson and encourage class inter is the target language and it might not be harmful to tech learners understanding as well so respondents see that mother tongue can be used to provide a quick and accurate translation of an english word that might take minutes for the teacher to explain a difficult language pattern and make sure the explanation has been understood correctly uh, teachers reasons for avoiding uh, l1 use in the classroom uh, this figure displays the results of the reasons that might may teachers avoid using mother tongue in their language classrooms. Foreign language educators feel that they should be committed to the language they teach and make use maximize its usage in the classroom. Then teachers say that when using and favoring the use of L1, learners will become dependent and will think that the only way they would understand anything uh, their teacher says is uh, when using L1, which will slow down the learning process eventually. In addition, using L1 kills learners' opportunities to practice ta target language as well as, uh, as we all know that the classroom is the only place where learners actually use the target language. Finally, the informants add that students may resort to using L1 because of a disinterest in the lesson. These cases can be cumbersome because of their, if there are many students doing this, it might cause others to speak in their L1s, leading to chaos and loss of classroom management. For the learner's questionnaire, per first part, learner's perceptions toward the use of L1 in the language classroom. This table shows that the majority of the informants agree that using L1 makes them feel confident and reduces anxiety and nervousness. And almost all of them uh, develop a better understanding if their teacher switches to the mother tongue. They also prefer to use L1 during class interactions and communications with their teacher. Surprisingly, for 40% of the learners say that they feel bored when their teacher uses L1 excessively. These are mostly high achieving students who prefer to practice the target language and the same respondents say that they find um, no difficulty in understanding the teacher's explanation using the target language. This finding indicates that the lower the student's English mastery, the higher their preference in the employment of the mother tongue in English classrooms. So students at higher levels of study have a negative attitude towards the use of L1 in the classroom, but, but lower students show more tendency to accept the use of their uh, mother tongue. The purpose of this study was to investigate the use of mother tongue in Algerian secondary schools and explore teachers and learners' perceptions to see the reasons behind using L1 in teaching and learning. Teachers' attitudes were negative along with this. It's clearly articulated that teachers are obliged to use mother tongue in their classrooms. On the other hand, uh, learners' attitudes are positive only for those high-achieving students who want to practice mother tongue during the language class. Uh, using mother tongue is not a sin in an English class, but the students should neither be allowed to speak in mother tongue nor be allowed to write in mother tongue since, the, uh, since the, op the output given by the teacher may be in mother tongue, but the output must always be in English whether it's speaking or writing. Anyhow, though, the optimal use of mother tongue is progressive to the teaching and learning process in English. Um, its overuse blocks the acquisition process of second language like English. So teachers must be very balanced in their methodology of teaching. Finally, I would say that teachers want to help students enjoy learning English and allowing them some flexibility with utilizing the L1 under uh, relatively controlled circumstances will help them not only acquire the language more easily, but also cultivate a love for um, the language. 
uh, thank you so much Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Asma Bilmaki from Khanshla University for your fruitful presentation. So now we are going to move to the second presenter, Mrs. Uh, Naiji Busaha, Busibha, sorry, Busibha Farhi from the University Center of Nama. She will give a talk about uh, broadening EFL learners' vision of the world through fostering their intercultural competence using authentic literary texts, the case of L3 students of Anama University Center. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am Najia Busbha, lecturer at Ahmed Salih University Center of Nama. First of all, let me express my gratitude to the organization committee for accepting my contribution to this scientific event. My presentation deals with broadening EFL learners' vision of the world through intercultural competence using authentic literary texts. It includes introduction, problem statement, research objectives, research problems, literature review, methodology, findings, implications, conclusion, and recommendation for further research. The phenomenal progression of technology and the globalization have caused changes all over the world like population mobility and cross-cultural contact among diverse linguistic and cultural groups. In this context, the 21st century education demands a shift to an education that develops the skills required to avoid alienation and make sense of the, of the world all around. The use of literary texts being relevant to cultural issues by definition create a way to connect EFL learners to different cultures, improve their language skills, develop their intercultural competence, and promote inclusivity and mutual respect. Our EFL students at the University Center of Nama are still committed to traditional teaching methodologies. The content knowledge of the course is over-focused at the expense of language proficiency and 21st century education skills. To get our students beyond inclusiveness, there's a need to an effective and appropriate incorporation of intercultural competence. And since the specific characteristic of literature is a reflection of origins and cultures, it has become a needed material for students to learn about and further understand another culture, broaden the vision of the world and develop their linguistic abilities. The aim of this study is to investigate the potential of authentic literary texts in providing a plethora of strategies adapted in response to the EFL learners' need for developing their intercultural competence and language proficiency to investigate the teachers' opinions about the use of literature to promote the learners' intercultural competence, to examine students' attitudes towards learning and culture, cultures via literary texts. In this context, the main question is how do authentic literary texts as teaching materials contribute to increase the students' intercultural competence to gain diverse perspectives of the world? To what extent are the teachers ready to promote their learners' intercultural competence? And what are the students' attitudes towards reading literary texts as a means to broaden their intercultural competence? One of the most influential approaches for the teaching of a culture is the one developed by Biram and his European colleagues. Biram poses that language students must develop intercultural communicative competence ICC in addition to linguistic skills. According to Biram, the components of ICC are knowledge, savoir, intercultural attitudes, savoir être, skills of interpreting and relating, savoir comprendre, Skills of discovery and interaction, savoir comprendre ou faire. Critical cultural awareness, savoir s'engager. In any given context, at least one of the five components is required for communicating effectively and appropriately across cultures in foreign language. Previous studies have already shown that reading literary texts in gender skills aligned with Biram's theory of ICC. For example, Razi and Nagibin 
in explaining that literature engenders ICC because of because it is realistic and promote critical thinking through use of the four language skills. By reading literary texts, foreign language learners become able to understand other languages at a deeper level. They develop empathy and understanding towards them and become able to see similarities between foreign cultures and their own, which helps them value the differences. Therefore, it is claimed that literature provides a means of building bridges of understanding across countries and cultures. It leads to intercultural understanding, which helps foreign language learners to decenter and take up the perspectives of the other, to see the world from another place. Skills to be developed according to Biron, ability to and our ability to and to understand cultural content, the target culture, the learners' culture, concepts of culture and personal experiences, ability to compare cultures and awareness of one's own feelings, perceptions, beliefs, values and attitudes. The study this study is an exploratory case study which aims at investigating the teacher's opinion about teaching culture using literature as material and scrutinizes the learners' attitudes towards reading literary texts to develop their intercultural competence. Only three components of Biram's model of teaching culture to enhance the intercultural competence are taken into consideration in the study, knowledge, intercultural attitudes, and intercultural awareness. Data among, uh, attainment follow three steps. First stage, observation of the teacher's approaches in teaching the different modules in the Department of English in Amma University Center. Second stage, research data was collected by means of learners' questionnaire and semi-structured EFL teachers' interview. Third stage, the, the researcher taught the target sample lessons of all expression then administered the designed questionnaire to students. The results and the results uh, of the interview. In general, the research findings reveal that EFL teachers do not possess adequate intercultural awareness in order to be able to adopt appropriate pedagogy, literary materials, and tasks to develop intercultural communicative competence in EFL uh, classrooms. All teachers emphasize that culture is seldom the objective of their courses. Four teachers out of five claim that intercultural knowledge is not appropriate to their subject of teaching while two teachers used to deal with cultural issues in the oral uh, discussions. Three teachers out of five recognized, recognized having a superficial view of intercultural competence since they focus on the communicative approach. Also one teacher thought that teaching literature uh, subject concerns its features rather than its culture issues. Two teachers confirmed that they are well informed about the importance of intercultural competence in this era of globalization and its utility for the learners' inclusiveness, tolerance, and mutual respect. All teachers expressed their readiness to use literary texts as authentic materials in EFL learners. These results may answer the second question, what are the teachers' opinions about using literary texts to enhance learners' intercultural competence? When it comes to students' questionnaire, students showed an increased interest in reading and interpreting the literary works they were exposed to. Furthermore, they developed positive attitudes towards the intercultural knowledge through literature in oral expression session during four sessions. In general, the percentages show that 86% of students found that literary texts meet their needs in developing their intercultural competence. 91 percent of them agree that the content-based lessons are frustrating since their comprehension necessitates memorization and 78 percent confirm that intercultural knowledge developed pride of their own culture broaden the vision of the world and meet the modern context of technology and globalization these results may answer the question what are the learners attitudes towards using literary texts to develop their intercultural knowledge Implications in EFL if EFL teachers uh, teachers at Nama University Center want to prepare students for success in this interconnected world, intercultural competence must form an integral part of the curriculum. They should introduce cultural cultural content into their teaching practice by using authentic material as literature in their classrooms. EFL learners intercultural competence competence initiate their teachers' awareness and po positive attitudes
Uh, okay, thank you so much, Mrs. Najia, Bus Najia Bus Busibha, for your uh, interesting and informative presentation. Thank you so much. So the next presenter is uh, Mrs. Hind Badesh from the University of Biskra, who will discuss the following topic entitled Highlighting Data Collection Methods and Analysis procedures in interlanguage pragmatics research, revisiting a selected literature review. University. Very happy to be with you today. Well, and welcome to my presentation, which was prepared by uh, Dr. Ahmed Shawqi Hwajli and me. So let's start. This presentation is entitled Highlighting Data Collection Methods and Analysis Procedures in Interlanguage Pragmatics Research, Revisiting a Selected Literature Review. Introduction. In today's global village created by this mass of technology, people face a diversity of languages and cultures. Hence, a linguistic fraternity and intercomprehension between different human groups and races are needed and calls for new political and linguistic considerations. As a multilingual country, Algeria stimulates a set of races with different languages, dialects, and their traditions. Its people familiarized with French as a first foreign language are now challenging English and its culture as a global language, and that, and that calls for some pragmatic intervention. Interlanguage pragmatics. Interlanguage pragmatics examines in fact and to learners' knowledge, use, and development in performing such cultural functions. Its primary concern is exploring non-native speakers' comprehension, production of speech acts, and how their L2 related speech act knowledge is acquired. Research in interlanguage pragmatics. L2 pragmatics research is concerned with how learners develop the knowledge and ability to use various aspects of the target language pragmatics. Speech acts are the most commonly researched aspect in interlanguage pragmatics. Depending on the research goals, researchers in fact use different methods to gather and analyze and to pragmatics data. In what follows, we try to shed light on the most prevalent data collection and analysis methods. Data collecting tools. Acknowledging the study realized by TT in, two, in 2019, 88% of 246 empirical studies conducted in pragmatics between 1979 and 2017 examined pragmatic production of meaning in social context. The data to be collected in these cases have to represent a real life interaction. And hence, the methods most commonly used are recording authentic discourse or naturally occurring data, discourse completion tests, and role playing. Let's start with naturally occurring data or authentic data, which include everyday conversations, institutional talk, that is teacher talk, classroom interaction, and CMC email exchanges and interactions in a virtual environment. One way to collect naturalistic spoken data is field observations, that is, taking notes of what people say in real life interactions. Focus on naturally occurring data focuses on what people say, how they say it, tone of voice, gestures, eye contact, physical settings, ages, genders of the speakers, and relative. That is more importantly relative social status and social distance, which are to be considered in naturally occurring data. Field notes 
involve researchers reconstructing conversations from memory they might not be as accurate as audio or video recorded and thus are often supplemented by recordings. Recently, computer technology CMC expanded the options for gathering authentic interaction data, technology-based data collection, can be conducted via synchronous and asynchronous CMC. CMC provides a convenient source of data because the data are digitally recorded and immediately available for analysis. So researchers don't need to take notes. Now, in terms of analysis, traditionally, focus was on the occurrence of particular speech strategies. So, data analysis involves coding and the classification of speech strategies according to predetermined categories. Two, recently, focus uh, is on what learners actually do in interaction, as opposed to what they know about interaction. So, contrasting our conversation analysis, sorry, is used to analyze naturalistic, naturalistic data. CA is a microanalytic data driven approach that helps examine the speech act in social interaction. Now we move to discourse completion tests, which is most, most used in pragmatic studies or the DCT, we call it Discourse Completion Test or DCT. So DCTs are widely and successfully used in the study of speech acts and speech events. DCT is a set of scenarios that vary in contextual parameters of power, social distance, and degree of imposition. DCT presents a situational description followed by a gap for the participants to insert their responses. Boxer and Cohen in 2004 note that DCTs are used when gathering examples of rarely occurring speech acts, speech events, or distance responses. Second, researching speech acts when researching speech acts readily occur but are difficult to capture on recorded data as requests, complaints, and so on. They are also used when looking at speech acts comparatively, it may be difficult to find corresponding acts that readily occur data from two languages. DCTs are highly controlled. They can be administered to larger groups of participants in one setting and allow collecting a large amount of comparable data across participants' groups in one setting. Discourse completion test in terms of analysis here, DCT responses are typically co coded for speech act strategies and counted for frequencies of occurrences and are compared across groups of participants. Now we move to role plays. Role plays are simulations of social encounters and they can be designed to investigate interaction in a range of contexts with varying parameters of speakers, power differences, social distance, and degrees of imposition, as explained by Tagishi and Trover in 2017. Role plays are useful for gathering data about the types of discourse that is difficult to access in real life situations because of its sensitivity. Role play task presents a situational scenario that participants act out as they would in a real life situation. There are two types of role plays closed role plays and open role plays. As for closed role plays, they involve participants acting out a scenario alone without an interlocutor and producing one turn responses. So they are played only one by one part. As for open role plays involve interactions played out by two or more participants. Each participant has his or her own role described on a card, which is not shared with the other participant. The card can also indicate who is supposed to speak first. Now in terms of analysis, as closed role play is non-interactive, 
Data is commonly analyzed using three determined categories of speech act strategies as imperative requests, a preparatory requests, and so on. Interaction data elicited via open row can be submitted to either categorical speech act analysis or CA based analysis depending on research goals. Conclusion now, in a natural role plays and DCTs are most Uh, well, thank you so much, Mrs. Hindbadesh, for your presentation. It was uh, really nice. Now we are going to move to the next presentation by Dr. Sabrina Barzou from Khanshla University, who will discuss the following topic entitled Teaching English in the Algerian Primary Schools, Benefits and Challenges. Hello everybody, I am Dr. Sabrina Barzou from Khanshla University. First, I would like to thank the organizers of this international conference for giving us the opportunity to participate and share knowledge with other researchers. My paper is entitled Teaching English in the Algerian Primary Schools Benefits and Challenges. English has become the language of the world due its use in science, technology and communication and almost in all fields. For this reason, Algeria today is rethinking its language policy by introducing English in the primary school. However, Teaching English in primary schools has both benefits and challenges. This paper identifies the benefits and challenges based on theories and research findings and then proposes several solutions to the difficulties which can be met. Teaching English in primary schools means teaching learners aged between 6 and 12 years, regarded as young learners. As they are still young, they will come to the class with different levels of English knowledge. Some may come with Eng excellent English, others may know nothing about English at all. This causes a difference among learners' motivation in learning English. Some of them feel that English is easy and enjoyable, and others think that English is difficult and tedious. Students who are very interested in English need to be helped to experience an appropriate English lesson, while who are not interested in learning English need to be motivated and supported more by showing that English is exciting and funny. Consequently, if the schools have appropriate facilities such as textbooks, teaching aids and competent teachers, they can facilitate and support the learners well to learn English. Teaching English in primary schools has many challenges. English can be profitable and destructive for young learners. It might be beneficial if the activities are exciting and related to young learners' life. It will also make them willing to learn English. In contrast, it can be destructive if the activities are not funny and related to young learners' life. Hence, it will make them dislike learning English. Here, we will answer three questions. 
What are the benefits of teaching English in primary schools? What are the challenges in teaching English in primary schools? And what are the solutions of the problems which can be faced in teaching English in primary schools? The younger, the better. Several theories and studies support that learning a foreign language at an early age is better. Children between 3 and 6 years of age are at the optimal age of learning foreign languages because when children learn their first language, they can use the same method to learn foreign languages, according to Cameron. Critical period hypothesis or the CPH claims that there is a biological period between the age of 2 and 14 years in which children can acquire many foreign languages easily. Age is not the only factor that facilitates young learners to learn a language quickly. Other factors can also determine the success of English integration in primary schools, such as motivation, language aptitude, teachers' proficiency, learning strategies, socioeconomic background, learning materials, social interaction, and family background. Benefits of teaching English in primary schools Teaching English in primary schools make pupils more aware of their first language since they refer to it to learn English. Pupils will possess global awareness and international competence it means that by learning English, the pupils can have more opportunities to understand that there are many countries with their cultural differences. It is also beneficial for pupils to acquire better pronunciation and fluency, improve their self-confidence. Children are better learners because learning in their age is going natural, exciting and enjoyable, relevant, social, multisensory, active experiential and memorable. Challenges of teaching English in primary schools. Teaching English in primary schools is not easy since the way we teach children differs from the way we teach adult learners. Several new learning strategies such as the communicative language teaching CLT, task-based learning and teaching CBLT and the like exist in language teaching and learning. However, the teachers may find it challenging to introduce those strategies for several re reasons. For example, it may be inappropriate for teaching large groups of learners where resources are limited. Therefore, the teachers need to try harder to implement those learning strategies effectively. To motivate children to learn the language is not an easy task. Some of them may struggle to understand English, while others may not. Here parents' support plays a great role. Another challenge relates to identity. To make the pupils proud of their national identity when they are learning English is not easy to do. In terms of sources, children need concrete explanation through demonstrations and realia. They need means that can help them understand the lesson. However, most of the schools do not have sufficient teaching aids. Size of the class is believed to be a common challenge. The larger the class, the more difficulties the teacher finds and it is harder to adopt learner-centered learning. Suggested solutions Authorities should provide appropriate textbooks which suit learners' age and capacities, needs and interests. Provide adequate training for teachers of English in primary schools. Teachers need to understand pupils' characteristics because they are young and they need special treatment from the te teachers. Therefore, if the teachers understand their pupils, they can encourage them to, in, to be interested in learning English. Teachers should provide activities which are interesting, enjoyable, belong to the child, active and experiential and memorable. 
Teachers of English are required to be creative in class. Several recommended funny learning activities in teaching English to young learners are storytelling, games, songs, mini role play, and so on. Teachers should be careful when selecting content and materials and when using textbooks to support their teaching activities. Everything should suit the learners' needs, levels, interests, and backgrounds. English teachers are required to manage the class as comfortable as possible because the pupils like to move around and the physical movements will dominate the activities. Sometimes teachers can also make outdoor activity to introduce the surrounding environment to the learners. Make the parents aware of the importance of learning English. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Sabrina Barzou, for your fruitful, interesting, and outstanding presentation. Now we are going to move to the next presenter, uh, Mr. Abdelhaq Zidan from Biskra University. Okay. linguistics to teaching the four skills and literature. Dr. Ramdan Mihiri and I have conducted the present research which is entitled Psycholinguistics and English Language Teaching in our classrooms. What skills do we need to develop in learners? Before starting, let me first thank the organizing committee for accepting our participation in this conference. Let's start with the introduction. Unquestionably, psycholinguistics provides English language class classrooms with a deep understanding of the way lessons should be delivered. Given the significance of such a field of study, the present research aims at considering its contribution to the teaching of the four skills and literature, that is to say, it attempts to shed light on the effect of psycholinguistic research on the teaching of the four skills to provide a richer understanding of this area for both teachers and students. Besides, it tries to combine between psycholinguistic theories and the teaching of literature to give more insight into the link between cognition and literary studies. Let's take a look at the contributions of the field of psycholinguistics to the speaking skill. The high complexity of the way people speak makes it very difficult for researchers to investigate the speaking process, which is the reason why they cannot agree on one single model explaining the human speech production process. In this paper, we stress one of the most influential psycholinguistic models of speech production that was put forward by Willem Lovelt in 1989. He sees it as a progression of four stages, namely conceptualization, formulation, articulation and self-monitoring. Hence, this part of the research is an attempt to explain each stage of Lovelt's model. Simply speaking, conceptualization is deciding what to say. In a more psycholinguistic terminology, it is willingness to execute a speech plan. In other words, it is a process whereby messages are generated and conceptual representations are to be orally expressed. In this stage, the speaker retrieves all the accessible data to form a mental pattern of the intended message. Moreover, formulation covers grammatical, lexical and phonological encoding of the message. To put it differently, this process deals with the message to be delivered, and for that, it accesses proper words such as nouns, verbs, adjectives, etc. for the lexical concepts and constructs a meaningful syntactic and morphophonological structure. Once thoughts have been organized into a linguistic plan, speech muscle system has to get ready to execute the required movements and produce the desired sounds. Articulation in speech production, hence, is about the execution of motor programs to pronounce the sounds of a word. Concerning self-monitoring, Interlocutors do not only produce speech and listen to one another when conversing, but they also seem to keep one ear open on what they themselves are saying, and if they cut something amiss, they are quick to correct it and continue to converse. Once in a while, we spontaneously interrupt our speech and correct ourselves. These corrections generally are called self-repairs. 
Now we move to psycholinguistics and the writing skill. Writing is a highly required skill. It is one of the four skills that has to be mastered due to its significance in language learning and acquisition. Thus, knowing about the processes involved in it is crucial for both teachers and students. Therefore, this part of the, t of the research devotes itself to explore one of the influential cognitive models of writing that explains how it occurs. That is to say, Flower and Hayes model. Their model of the writing process distinguishes between three different cognitive processes of writing, namely planning, translating and revising, or sometimes called reviewing. Planning concerns itself with generating a content. In other words, it is at this level that goals are put forward, and ideas are produced and organized into a coherent structure. For Flower and Hayes 1981, the planning process is divided into three sub-processes, generating ideas, organizing them, and goal setting. For the Hayes and Flower writing model, the second part of the writing process is the act of composing known as translating. Particularly, it is when the writer actually puts his planning process into visibly structured language. By way of explanation, translating is an activity whereby writers convert their ideas into sentences and paragraphs. After composing what is thought of, it has to be revised and evaluated, and this process is called reviewing in Hayes and Flower's model of writing. By definition, it is the act of evaluating both what has been planned and what has been written. Reading and editing are strategies used in reviewing. In this process, writers examine the content with the aim of correcting anything that would prevent the text from meeting the objectives. This encompasses correcting grammatical errors and modifying the contents of the writing. All the writing process is said to be controlled by a monitor. Flower and Hayes 1981 claim that monitoring comprises metacognitive processes that connect and regulate planning, translating and reviewing. In accordance with this model, the monitor functions as a writing strategist, which determines when the writer moves from one process to the, to the next one. Now let's move to see the contributions of psycholinguistics to the reading skill. In the word of Davies 1995, a reading model is theory of what is going on in the reader's eyes and mind during reading and comprehending or miscomprehending a text. There is a claim that reading has to be dealt with from a psycholinguistic perspective since it is a pure cognitive process. Furthermore, the reading behavior is usually explained by the models of the reading process. Thus, here we focus on exploring two main models of reading, namely top-down and bottom-up processes or approaches. The top-down approach stands for the idea that comprehension begins from the top, which is the reader, to the down, that is the text. It states that readers make sense of the text based on their experience and background, and interpret it based on their prior knowledge about language. For Goodman 1967, this top-down model pays particular attention to what readers bring to the process of reading. Thus. The reader observes the text and compares it with his world knowledge in order to make sense of what is written. Straightforwardly, the point of interest here is on the reader as he interacts with the text and not the other way around. In the realm of the bottom-up reading processes, the reader tends to get the meaning from a text in a step-by-step -step process, that is, starting from letters to sounds to words then to meaning. To put it differently, this means that the reader, before grasping the meaning, he deciphers separate linguistic units, phonemes, graphemes, and words. Alderson 2000 suggests that bottom-up approaches are serial models, where the reader begins with the printed word, recognizes graphic stimuli, decodes them to sound, recognizes words, and decodes meanings. By way of explanation, here, the reader concentrates on words and phrases in isolation, then understanding is reached by relating these detailed elements to reconstruct a whole. And here we have psycholinguistics and the listening skill. Listening is no less important than the other skills of language. While learning a foreign language, listening plays a very important role. From a cognitive perspective, this skill is highly complex due to the difficulty of its investigation. This part of the research, therefore, pays special attention to the cognitive processes involved in listening. In 1995, Anderson G.R. put forward a cognitive framework of language comprehension. For him, language comprehension occurs in three phases. This three-phase model suggests that comprehension incorporates perception, parsing, and utilization. 
As far as the listening skill is concerned, perception stands for encoding the acoustic message. It includes detecting phonemes from the ongoing speech. In the course of this phase, meticulous attention is put to the input and the sounds are kept in the echoic memory to be analyzed in the coming steps. And by echoic memory, I mean the memory which is responsible for sounds. In other words, this phase is about a process whereby the listener contrasts the speech sounds he is listening to with semantic units in his lexicon. After the perceptual processing comes the parsing phase. Here, words or phrases are converted to mental representations of their meanings. By definition, the second phase, which is parsing, is the process by which words in the message are transformed into a mental representation of the combined meaning of the words. Simply put, parsing means segmenting a linguistic unit, a word, a phrase, or, or a sentence, into its parts and describing their syntactic roles. In addition, the size of the linguistic unit process depends on the linguistic knowledge and general knowledge the listener possesses. Furthermore, the third stage is the utilization stage, in which comprehenders usually use the mental representation of the sentence's meaning. During the utilization phase, the listener is more likely to derive various types of inferences using the mental representation to fulfill the interpretation and make it more personally meaningful. Pursuing this further, the utilization process incorporates relating mental representations of the heard meaning to existing knowledge. Differently stated, the long-term memory includes existing knowledge as propositions or schemata and connecting the new input meaning to that existing knowledge occurs when knowledge in the long-term memory is activated so that it is connected with the new meanings in short-term memory and thus understanding happens. Now, let's see how the field of psycholinguistics contributes to the field of literature. In recent years, interdisciplinary frameworks and methodologies have been increasingly undertaken by literary scholars. Seemingly, Psycholinguistics is one field from which literature adopts many insights and theories. Thus, cognitive literary research started to manifest itself in the 1980s when cognitive linguists found that various basic processes of human thinking could be studied within the field of literature. This part of the research seeks to highlight the usefulness of applying the findings of psycholinguistics to literature. To explain, literature might be a text so it always includes processes in the reader and in the author who both establish perceptions and thinking, processes of creativity and imagination, and of understanding and interpreting. Hence, psychological processes are the core of appreciating literature. Therefore, a psycholinguistic approach to literary studies concentrates on the actual processes readers undertake to perceive and understand a literary text. Needless to say, this shall take us back to the psycholinguistic perspectives of the reading process, but relying more on literary grounds and terminologies. In literature, cognitive criticism focalizes on the reader's involvement in a text through the reactions that occur in his brain while reading. That is to say, cognitive scientists see reading as an active concourse between the mind and the text, where neurological observations permit us to more specifically discuss the reading process. In this context, the cognitive scientist Stanislas Dehin categorizes four different parts of reading. The first one is synchronic reading, which depicts the neural equipment shared by all humans, regardless of their culture. The second one is about how children acquire language and reading skills as they move through stages. The third one categorizes what happens physiologically during an act of reading, which parts of the brain are activated and how our eyes move. And finally, how our ability to read might fit within broader context of our evolutionary history. To clarify, these processes create distinct forms of reading that make it possible for critics to further discuss the influence of literature as the reader neurologically understands it. Through the ability to discuss such specific forms of reading, critics can comprehend the efficiency of an author's artistic method. To this end, we always stress the idea that teachers and students' awareness of the scientific grounds explaining how language learning takes place is significant to a tremendous extent. Hence, this research was a review of the contributions of the field of psycholinguistics to the four skills of language and the area of literature. More specifically, it dealt with leveled speech production model, flower and haze model of writing, top-down and bottom-up reading processes, a psycholinguistic framework of listening, and a psycholinguistic approach to literary studies. 
And here are some important references on which we relied during our research. And thank you so much. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Abdul Haq Zidan, for your presentation. It was very fruitful, informative. Thank you so much. Now we move to the last presentation in this session by Dr. Bashar Ahmed from Biskra University, who will talk about what assessment models for 21st century tertiary education in Algeria. I'd like to thank every single person who has made this conference a reality. I'll be crossing my fingers for its success. I'd be better get started right now. My uh, presentation um, title is What Assessment Models for 21st Century Tertiary Education Nigeria. Uh, the second slide quotes brown and uh, fellow researchers if you want to change student learning then change the methods of assessment this quotation this brief quotation shows the symbiotic relationship between student learning or learning curve then uh, the change in the methods of assessment definition of assessment synonyms there are at least 11 uh, synonyms to assessment. Let's start with assessment, battery, valuation, examination, instrument, inventory, measure, quiz, scale, schedule, test. Assessment is a procedure thanks to which information is collected about the extent to which students have assimilated contents of the courses, enabling thus to make predictions about their future achievement progress. Assessment is a procedure and this procedure helps gathering information about students and how much they have learned and what can be done to overcome their weaknesses and to uh, boost up their strengths. Uses of assessment. Woolsey and his fellow researchers outline four major assessment uses. Instructional, which deals with the diagnosis of students' potential, communicative but gives information to stakeholders parents teachers researchers administrative uses uh, decision makers guidance assist students categories of assessment there's formative assessment then blurcom defines formative assessment as follows formative assessment is any type of assessment device that we use while an instruction unit is in progress and is used primarily to give the teacher feedback on how the unit is progressing. Formative assessment is frequently called continuous assessment. Students are attributed different marks for different activities on different occasions. Summative assessment. Summative assessment is intended to check students uptake and quantify it numerically or gradually. Summative assessments are performed at the end of chapters or units to determine the student's level competency with the material and to assign grades. The term summative derives from summa, Latin for sum, or total, thus referring to how much students have learned at the end of a period of time. Pillars of assessment. Reliability. A reliable assessment is, dependent, is dependable in that it inspires trustworthiness because different assessors on different occasions attribute the same or close scores. Validity. Validity is attained when the assessment measures what it purports to measure. Klein corroborates. A test is valid if it measures what it claims to measure. If you measure grammar, there's no need to assess spelling unless spelling is part of grammar. Practicality. An assessment is said to be practical when it is cost-effective. Fairness. Assessment looks fair 
Assessment fair when it offers an equal opportunity to students in terms of time, assessment scales, and degree of difficulty, and so on. Fairness stands at the opposite end of favoritism or bias. Impacts of assessment on students. It directs attention to what is important, acts as an incentive for study, has a powerful effect on what students do and how they do it, communicates what they can or cannot succeed in doing. For some, it builds confidence for their future work. For others, it shows how inadequate they are at learning and undermines their confidence about what they can do in the future. Assessment literacy. For Popham, assessment literacy consists of an individual's understanding of the fundamental concepts and procedures deemed likely to influence educational decisions. As far as students are concerned, they need to be made aware of and trained to prepare for an assessment, read instructions, realize which tasks receive more marks and why, manage time effectively, use draft, submit the final draft, count marks, plan feedback, assessment in 21st century higher education. Traditional education based on memorization and parroting does no longer reflect the demands of a new millennium, which is characterized by competition in complex and volatile geopolitical situation. Assessing memorization, which is an outdated and daunting task, does not really mirror learners' actual potential intellectual skills. A paradigm shift has taken place and could be expanded as follows. The bet is not on how much amount of memorized information what learners can do with what they know. Learning has gained a new dimension, which is that of a lifelong meaningful learning experience that extends well beyond the school years. Effective teaching uses information from ongoing assessments to inform instruction. This means that effective teachers informally and formally assess their students' current level of st st skill development and analyze the performance to identify what to teach, al and other fellow researchers. Assessment in 21st century education needs to target three skills, three types of skills, learning skills, literacy skills, life skills. Now let's see them one by one. Learning skills. Uh, the first skill, critical thinking. Critical thinking is the research for the truth by evaluating arguments. Two, creativity. Creativity is initiated when familiar issues are challenged, targets a specific goal, and is beneficial. Three, communication and collaboration. Teaming together to share in tasks and join their efforts toward a common goal may lead to better products and share findings with the community. Literacy skills. Information. Students who mishandle information often fall prey to misinf misinformation. Higher education students need to be able to read, analyze, and interpret data, tables, figures. They need also to differentiate between facts and truth, evidence and proofs, reality and fiction. 2. Media. Information is disseminated through publishing and media outlets. Publishers and media have their own agenda and therefore they need to realize that to realize that and make most of what they make what is made available. Technology what they make available, sorry. Technology now. Technology made information travel faster and to larger masses. Understanding how these spread information, how to download it, save it for future use and erase it when it not needed, are a skill that higher education students need to have a firm hold of. Life skills. Initiative. Students should be encouraged to take decisions to solve problems and not wait for the teachers to prompt them. Flexibility. Students may need to tolerate others' approaches to solve problems other, other than their own. Social skills. Either personal skill to deal with other members of the community or society. Suggest assessment tasks. Written tasks. Multiple choice questions. Or they are also known as selected responses, constructive responses, short answers, constructive responses, essays, problem-based problems and scenarios, performance tasks, hands-on tasks, tabulating, gathering information, analyzing data, designing products, and so on, cumulative tasks, research papers, such as research papers, reports, moderates, moderate debates, portfolios, and presentations. 
and so on. All subjects here, this is a recommendation, all subjects and classes it carry both formative and summative assessments wherein students try all the types of assessment and demonstrate their learning, literacy, and life skills. Thank you for your attention. I have just one last more, um, note. I feel sorry I could not manage to complete my longitudinal study in which it was planned to analyze the data collected. The last month was pretty hectic for that particular reason. It was not possible for me to include the findings and analysis of the questionnaire. Thank you for your attention and hope all the success to this conference. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed Bashar from University of Biskra for this informative, outstanding and interesting topic. It was really important. Now we are going to move to the debate sessions. So we are going, uh, we have two questions. The first question is uh, addressed to Mr. Abdul Haq Zidan from Biskra University. Abdul Haq, are you here? Abdul Haq. So the question is, in precise terms, how do you infer from the models you presented to consider learners' cognitive uh, mechanisms when it comes to teaching, speaking, and reading? Uh, okay. Hello, Abhak. I think it's not here. Would you please activate your uh, sound, please? Hello. Hello. Yes. Shall I repeat the question? I'm happy. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Shall I repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay. So, in precise terms, how do you infer uh, from the models you presented to consider learners' cognitive mechanisms when it comes to teaching, speaking, and reading? Yes. Uh, as far as the, our research is concerned, we have highlighted the contributions of the field of psycholinguistics to, to, to the, the teaching of the four skills. So uh, precisely uh, concerning speaking and uh, reading, we have uh, tried to uh, to see the role of the the, the, the of the the model of level uh, model of speaking, which which uh, uh, incorporates uh, conceptualization, formulation, and uh, articulation and self monitoring. I, I mean that the field of psycholinguistics has to do with. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I said that the four stages are. Uh, are seen or observed in the uh, speaking process. Yes. This is how we uh, rela related the, 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 the field actually. And concerning uh, uh, reading, we, we, we have dealt with top-down reading processes and bottom-up reading pro processes. Hello? Yes, I'm with you, yes. Yes, yes. okay. Yes, that's it. So we, we related the field of psycholinguistics to the teaching of the four skills. Yes. Okay. That's all, Abdul Haq? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Abdul Haq. Uh, now we are Thank going you. to move to the second question to Dr. Uh, Bagzo from Khanshla University. Dr. Bagzo, are you here? Please. Okay. Dr. Bagzo? Hello? Okay, hello, Dr. Bagzo. Would you please activate your sound, please? Would you activate your microphone? Hmm. Yes. Hello, Dr. Bagzo. 
So, uh, if any if anyone wants to answer uh, this question, it's okay. Or is there any question or any okay? Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Doctor Lamar. Hello, Doctor Lamar. Can you hear me? I think yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Laban. Uh, uh, I'm Dr. Bugab Sadia. Okay, sorry, Dr. Bugab. Okay. Yes, well, uh, I'll try to uh, uh, discuss yes. the question, uh, ask it for uh, Dr. Bogzou. Concerning, considering the critical age of Lono and uh, talking about second language acquisition. Well, I think that, yes, uh, it is very important uh, uh, to consider the age of the uh, second language learner or a foreign language learner. However, uh, I'm talking about uh, my own experience in teaching uh, English for kids. Do you hear me, sir? Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so here, uh, I think that teaching English at primary school was a successful experience as I was, or I participated there at that time. Uh, and I think that uh, we considering uh, Introducing this language at primary school will be a successful uh, experience for we Algerian. Knowing that the failure of French at primary school uh, is recognized by almost all of us. I think okay. that uh, no matter to say that it is for uh, the, 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 the critical age is uh, for uh, uh, first language uh, learner or a second language learner, whatever the reason behind, I think that uh, we should consider results and focus on the success we could get from teaching English at primary school. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, doctor. Now, uh, okay. So, yes. So, uh, question to everyone from Dr. Bashar Ahmed. How can your research contribute practically to EFL students? I repeat again. How can your research contribute practically to EFL students? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. 
Yes, I would like to thank Dr. Bashad, my dear friend, for this uh, very pertinent question. As usual, not surprising from his, from his uh, part. Um, well, if you mean the contribution, the research you're, you're referring to is the research that we have presented today. That's it? Hmm? Yes. You mean, yes, the research that everybody has presented today, how can it contribute to yes. uh, EFL yes. students? Yes, okay. Well, as far as my topic or the topic that I presented this morning is concerned, and which was about uh, critical, of, uh, it's, uh, it's about the um, how to make out of our students, uh, not just the graduates, but uh, you know effective members of the society, okay? I have talked about, a, hi, Ahmed, I can see you. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, yes, it's, it's a new, it's a policy, as we have said, discussed this morning, that is not new, but there was a kind of call to reintegrate it in our universities, because we are somehow fed up with just, uh, uh, let's say, forming or training our students just to be teachers of English, okay? That's not the point. That has never been the point of teaching at the university. The university is a place of knowledge. It's a place of effective contribution to, to contributions to the society. It's a place of, uh, you know, being, uh, um, how to say, uh, culturally and, uh, um, you know, uh, socially and uh, even um, politically in engaged learners. So as far as my research is concerned, I think that it was a kind of wake-up call to revisit and to rethink the reason why universities are there in the first place. Voila, thank you. That's just uh, about my own uh, research. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, yes. So is there anyone who wants to answer this question? Or, so I repeat once again, is there anyone who wants to answer this question or to add something? Yes. So, a question to Dr. Bashar Ahmed. Yes. Okay, Dr. Bashar Ahmed. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Do you hear okay. me, Mr. Chair? Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, Dr. Bashar. I so the question is... I had trouble communicating with you. Okay, yes. Okay. Well, what was the question the... already? Yes. What was the question already? Yes. Is the data that you have collected and analyzed related to assessment of a specific area of language? Oh, no. That, that was... Uh, I think that the question is out of place because I was... Uh, talking about the assessment models. Yes. So, so this is the question for you, sir. It has no connection with my uh, my, my topic. Uh, it's, it has no relation to your topic? Yeah. I don't see uh, any, uh, I mean, it does not um, express anything about my presentation. I mean, um, what does it mean? Do ask would... the, uh, the inquirer to... Re to re, uh, rephrase his or her question, please. Shall I repeat the question, sir? Uh, okay, go ahead, please, go ahead. Uh, is the data that you have collected and analyzed related to assessment of a specific area of language? Oh yeah, yes, definitely so. My yes. assessment is discipline related. I'm, I'm uh, referring to research methodology, yes. social studies, and uh, civilization. These are the three disciplines I taught at the university. Okay, yes. Okay, so I have these in mind when I planned and designed and wrote my paper. All right, okay. But, but my thoughts could yes. be applied everywhere. It does not uh, target one specific discipline. It could be, they could be used everywhere. Okay. 
So that's it, Dr. Bashar. Yes, that's a, uh, that's my answer. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we it's really right. appreciate you. And, and right. say hello to uh, to uh, Iman Labal. She is okay. a sister from me. Okay, yes. and to Dr. Okay. Barzou. These are yes. uh, sisters, not 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 colleagues or um, or teacher. These yes. are sister, these are my sisters. Say uh, hello sir, Dr. on my behalf. Okay, sir, sir, uh, Dr. Halimi and uh, Dr. Uh, Reed, uh, congratulate you, sir. Th uh, um, tell them thank you so much for everything. Okay, thank, okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, now I declare the session closed, okay, and uh, I invite Dr. Hakum Khawla. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Here we are again meeting, but meeting, unfortunately, to part. We have reached the closing session of this conference. Sorry. It's okay, it's okay. So we have reached the closing session of this international conference. And I don't know whether I should feel happy or sad, but I think it's a combination of both. Happiness because of accomplishment and sad because we need to part and end this very specific event. So here, on behalf of all the organizing committee and the scientific committee of this conference, I thank you all dear participants and dear audience for contributing so greatly to the success of this conference. And on behalf of you all, if you allow me, of course, I thank the conference chair, my dear teacher, Dr. Mohamed Sagir Halimi, for providing such a chance for teachers, students, and researchers from uh, different places in the world to meet, to exchange experiences, both theoretical and empirical, on issues related to English language, in different countries of the world and mainly related to English language in countries where it is spoken as a foreign or a second language. So please help me welcome Dr. Mohamed Sagir Halimi for, to share with us the recommendations of this conference. Well, assalamu alaikum. Welcome again. Good afternoon. Well, uh, as my colleague, Dr. Hakum Khawla said, it's rather a combination of sadness and happiness. But to say, it is rather sadness, not happiness. Yeah, because starting a conference, such conference, which was initiated by my friend and my, my, my dear sister, Dr. Reed, in the previous conference and gave me, uh, boasted me forward to think in terms of rekindling, yeah, researchers' emotions and rekindling researchers' intention of contributing scientifically to the success of the University of Wurgla. Thank you again, thank you again, thank you again, Dr. Griffith Thorian. Well, as I have to thank the Dean of the Faculty, Professor Ajaluli, 
for helping us and for uh, encouraging us. As I have to thank Dr. Kavi Mohammed Radwan, you see, and his staff. As I have to think, to thank, sorry, all my colleagues, all my students, and all who have contributed and endeavored to make this conference successful. Thank you all. Now, I have to move forward to provide you with the recommendations, which I hope won't be a closure, but just a point whereby I will start other research. Well, for the first international conference and reality of linguistic policy, we have the following recommendations. I have to change my eyeglasses. Yes, I'm getting old, Ahmed, just like you. You are still young, Lebal. Jinnan, you are here old, just like me, right? So the public, first of all, we have to talk about the publications of the, uh, of the conference proceedings in the journal Paradigms, as I've told you before. And now I have to talk about the very important thing that all the participants have to, must, should send their full papers by the 15th of June so that we can proceed to the review wall. Two, preparing for a second edition of the conference, which would be obviously chaired by one of my colleagues, not me, forcibly. Three, concerning the conference access, the recommendations are as follows. The teaching of academic writing has to be adapted to the demands of the current situation and the professional educational needs of the learners. Teaching, writing has to adopt innovative methodologies and teaching academic writing has to be shifted towards disciplinarity. As far as teaching literature for EFL learners, is concerned, teaching approaches should be reconsidered to include other ones such as constructivists and critical approaches. Literature classes need to be looked at as a ter terrain to foster students' critical thinking and raise their awareness of themselves. One means we have to be aware of our ourselves and it is sort of raise of self-consciousness their identities vis-a-vis -vis the other means no difference. And I've been always talking about the destruction of this schemata based or transcended vertically. So, and we have to think in terms of what is horizontality in this universe. So teachers of letter need to engage students in social enacting with the other and aim at horizontal reading of different literatures. That's why we are praising a globalized or uh, working towards the globalization of the teaching process and the globalization of the syllabus in general, as we have a very globalized campus and therefore, and that's globalized university. And the proof that we are here in Wurgla and we have many participants from all over the world, from Spain, as I've told you, from France, from Ireland, from Burundi, from Nigeria, and from, 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 from. And there are others who could not participate because of some commitments. Like, for example, a friend of mine, Sikinia from Cebu University from, in Philippines. The other point, on the theme of critical thinking and its relation to language teaching, methodologies such as flipped classrooms, task-based learning, Socratic seminars, pedagogy of skills and critical discourse analysis have to be encouraged. As for translation and knowledge, we have not forgotten about you, Dr. Kudet, obviously. Knowledge production, the process of translation can be better enhanced, improved, if translators resort to approaches and strategies such as discourse analysis. It is also advised that academic excellence can be achieved if the process of translation is considered within a native language perspective. Linguistic policy in a variety of national and international contexts can be objectively approached if the insights of macro sociolinguistic research are exploited by both policy makers and language users. On ESP teaching learning, we have not forgotten anything, obviously. 
the tendency now is to focus on the professional educational contacts, which are of direct relevance to people as practitioners. Example, petroleum engineering contacts, private schools, etc. Also, it is important to revisit it the sources and policies, of course, design in the Algerian context in order to enhance the learning of specialized languages. Concerning teachers training now, many strategies are required and needed to be implemented by teachers for a better language performance. These include soft skills, cooperative learning, and motivational strategies. In addition, the professional development of teachers should be highlighted through pre-service and in-service programs. The role of culture and intercultural competence should be highlighted in a multiculturally, multiculturally growing world. On the subject of the 21st century skills, the use of electronic networks, social media, and all the new modes of content delivery have to be re, re it's very difficult to pronounce this word, please pronounce it, re-energized, yes. Thank you, Dr. Khawla. Okay, I like her so much, this lady. In such a way that they meet the needs of both language learners and teachers. Blended learning must be implemented effectively, i.e. teachers and learners should be prepared for this new type of learning. ICT must be a part and parcel of the curriculum at all levels in order to solve the problem of teaching and to make an innovative learning to blend it, learning to cope with all circumstances. So the, these recommendations are the fruit of all teachers' endeavors. And it is the result, you see, of uh, teachers' conceptions and understanding analysis, obviously, of these different, let's say, mosaic, or let's say also, I, I want to use another word, uh, uh, eclectical panels and eclectical sessions. And so, and we have to thank the president of the session of the recommendations, Dr. Dwi Thoria, for collecting all this data. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have to thank all my friends, my colleagues, those who are in Algeria and abroad, particularly you, Janan, um, I do miss so much. And I'm gonna meet, we're gonna meet the next time, so sure. Thank you, thank you. And I give you the floor, Dr. Khawla Hakum, please. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Mohamed Sagheer Halimi, for defying all the circumstances and the difficulties and allowing us to meet such brilliant minds. I invite you now to stay with us while we deliver the certificates for the members who are present here in, uh, in Wardla University. So please don't leave. We still have the closing or uh, the concluding speech by the Dean of the Faculty.
So uh, here we start distributing uh, the certificates. And the first certificate goes for uh, Dr. Mohammed Kafi, Dr. Mohammed Ridwan Kafi, uh, the uh, head of the organizing committee. And I invite Dr. Drif Turaya to deliver the certificate for him. The second certificate goes for Mr. Yusuf bin Sheikh from the University of Qasli Malbah, and he's not here, so I invite uh, Mr. Mohammed Saleh Halimi to, uh, to have it instead. <laughs> and the third certificate goes for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is her husband. <laughs> Uh, the fourth certificate goes for Dr. Malika Kuti, and I invite uh, Ms. Uziya Bahri to deliver the certificate for her. The next one goes for Mr. Abdeslam Shamka, and I invite his supervisor again, Dr. Dimitra <laughs> to deliver the certificate for us. <laughs> I invite Dr. Uh, Mohammed Kudad to deliver the certificate for Mr. Lohar Sadoki. <laughs> so, uh, next, Ms. Afaf Azizi, please, I invite you to receive your certificate. <laughs> She's my friend. <laughs> so the, I don't know whether I should keep it for the last one or I just oh. proceed with the order. Okay, so I invite Mr. The Dean, Professor Eid Danuli, to, uh, to uh, hand this certificate for the conference chair, Dr. Mohammed Sayyid Halim. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> 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 I invite Dr. Mohammed Ridwan Kafi to deliver the second certificate for Dr. Mohammed Sareh <laughs> I invite Miss Lina Romesa Fregna to receive her certificate and I invite Dr. Chelbirin to hand it. <laughs> oh, 
time to pay back. I invite Mr. Lazar Sadduqi to deliver the certificate for Dr. Muhammad Kudan. Next, Ms. Haifab Buffy, please, I invite you, and I invite again Dr. Melika Kuti to uh, hand it, to hand the certificate. I invite uh, Mr. Yasin to hand the certificate to Ms. Uh, Rehana Fora, please. <laughs> so, uh, yes, please, I call you back to, uh, to take the certificate of Dr. Ahmed Bashar as you are his supervising, and it will be delivered to you by Dr. Mohamed Farahil. <laughs> it's saying in English which uh, says the best for the last or last for the best. So I call Dr. Dritz Raya and allow me please to uh, hand her the certificate myself. Uh, so, just as a reminder for everyone, the rest of the certificates are still to be printed. They are ready, but they are just not printed. We come now to the very last speech delivered by the Dean of the Faculty of Languages and Letters. Professor Mohamed Jalouli بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إلى كل المشاركين في هذا الملتقى الدولي الأول حول واقع السياسات اللغوية في العالم إليهم جميعا أتقدم بالشكر الجزيل أساتذة من القسم مشاركين من خارج الوطن ومن داخله لا شك أن هذا الموضوع الذي تناولتموه اليوم 
يعد من الموضوعات المهمة التي تطرح في العالم وفي كل الجامعات واقع السياسة اللغوية في العالم ودارت أشغال هذا الملتقى الدولي اليوم حول نقاط كثيرة تابعناها عبر ما قدم من مداخلات مثل التحليل النقدي للخطاب وتعليم اللغات الأجنبية والثقافة وعلاقتها بالأدب والتكوين المستمر لمدرسي اللغات الأجنبية وأيضا المهارات القرن الواحد والعشرين في التعليم والتعلم ولا شك أن هذه النقاط التي تناولتموها عبر هذه المداخلات أثرت هذا الموضوع وتدفعنا في المستقبل إلى أن نتناول مثل هذه الموضوعات التي تعد من قضايا الساعة لا شك أن هذا الملتقى كان من الملتقيات الناجحة بقسم اللغة والأدب الإنجليزي بكلية الآداب واللغات بجامعة ورقلة ومن دلائل نجاح هذا الملتقى هو هذه المشاركة الكبيرة للمتدخلين حوالي 62 مداخلة قدمت خلال اليومين وأيضا مشاركة أكثر من 19 جامعة وطنية وست جامعات من خارج الوطن وهذا يدل على أهمية هذا الموضوع وعلى نجاح هذا الملتقى مرة أخرى أشكر أساتذة قسم اللغة الإنجليزية بكلية الأدب واللغات على اختيارهم لهذا الموضوع وعلى هذا النشاط الذي أصبح من العادات الجيدة في هذا القسم نحن اليوم تقريبا في الملتقى الدولي الثاني كنا في الأشهر الماضية أقمنا الملتقى دولي كبير أيضا تناول قضايا لغوية وفي صلة بهذا الموضوع أشكر كل أساتذة قسم اللغة الإنجليزية وأشكر أيضا الجامعة وعلى رأسها الدكتور رضوان كافي الذي ما فتئ يقدم لهذا لهذا القسم ويساهم من الناحيه التقنيه ومن الناحيه الموضوعاتيه في اثراء هذا الموضوع واشكر ايضا الدكتور محمد صغير حليمي الذي يعد وقود هذا الملتقى وايضا الدكتوره دريد ثوريه والدكتور محمد كوداد والدكتوره الكوتي وكل الذين شاركوا وساهموا في إثراء هذا الموضوع ونجاح هذا الملتقى إليكم جميعا دون استثناء كل المحبة والتقدير أتمنى لكم التوفيق وأعلن رسميا نهاية أشغال هذا الملتقى والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته لكل بداية النهاية السي عبوة الطهر عليها خوية شناك ورحت You see? Well, uh, for Arkad, I know that you have understood nothing But since you were in Wirkla, normally you should have understood What the dean of the faculty have been saying Right? First of all, I would like to apologize for my friends You see? My colleagues For not being delivered the certificate Simply because they are being printed You see? There are those who are present, but they have not yet received their certificate. And I, have to, I, I owe, owe them a lot. I owe them a lot. And in case they need me anytime, anywhere, I'm present. I'm here. It's not for those who are present here, but I'm talking even to those who are in other universities, obviously. Yes, Tufik, I see. And they are coming by the next week, sure. Right? And I have to thank all my friends. All my students, former students, my colleagues, here and Dida. And I have just, I'm translating what the Dean of the Faculty have been saying to Arkad and for those who do not understand Arabic, obviously, that the Dean of the Faculty is thanking, thanking you for participating and is declaring the conference closed. This is the, the end of the conference. I hope we'll meet next, inshallah. We'll have another international conference by the next year. 
not only one, but two international conferences and a national conference for doctoral students. So it, it would become a tradition, right? Not for simply me or Dr. Dreed, who's gonna preside the, the conference, but others, because we have many, many, many active participants. Allah alaikum. Thank you very much. And see you the next time, inshallah. Sorry? كل داخل الجنه ان شاء الله كل اللي ما بغاش بعد توفيق ما تدخلش توالو رفيق والو انت ما تدخل حاضر حاضر ها ها حاضر حلي لي روح روح اقعد معنا توفيق اقعد حلي الميكرو توفيق جنة هذا